say welcome to day two of Proclaim 2024. Spread some warmth. Remember to bonga or give an elbow and sanitize. If you haven't sanitized, I would encourage you to, you know, at, some, at a certain point, dash to the back, sanitize. But we can still smile even as we are sanitizing our hands. You're very welcome. This is a good day. This is an incredible gathering. Destinies are being established. Have you greeted at least five people? Have you smiled to at least five people? Pastor Passes, <laughs> I send you greetings. If you're still sitting, I'll encourage you to please stand. It's good for your blood flow to stand and walk around. It's good to smile in the morning. Wonderful. Wonderful. Great. This is a spiritual meeting. I'm going to invite us now to plug in and begin to pray in tongues. If you haven't been able to pray in tongues yet, I know you're going to start praying in tongues sometime during this proclaimed conference. So let's open our mouths right now and begin to pray. Father, we thank you for a wonderful morning. We thank you for a great day. We thank you for day two of Proclaim. We are expectant. Our hearts are ready. Our minds are receptive. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's open our mouths right now and start to pray in the spirit for a few minutes. And then I'll be inviting us to pray through some scriptures together. Thank you, Lord. Mashike tereke zimanda la basi kataraba. Saka taraba reke zimande le basi kataraba reke zimanda la basi kataraba. Manda la basi ketere bo reke zimande le basi kataraba zimande le le le. Raka ba 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 kazi ketere bo roko zi kataraba. Manda la basi ketere bo reke zimanda la basi katere bo zimande le Shika taraba reke zimanda laba Mase terebo zimanda laba Sika terebo roko zimanda laba Zike tererebo Zamanda laba Sika terebo roko zimanda laba Sika taraba zimanda rebo Sika taraba Thank you Holy Spirit You are welcome in this place Thank you Lord we acknowledge your presence We acknowledge that you are here We acknowledge that this is a spiritual meeting Mashike tereke zimanda la basi kataraba reke zimando lo bosi kataraba raka ba 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 kandere boroko zimande re bo reke zimande re bosi kataraba raka ba 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 zimande re bosi kataraba reke zimande re bosi keterere raka ba 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 zimande re bosi kataraba reke zimande re 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 jeke tereke zimande re bosi kataraba zimanda la ba. Sekete reke zimande re bosi kataraba raka ba 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 kande re bosi kataraba reke zimande le bosi kataraba raka mama mama nde re boroko zimande re boroko zimande re 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 bosi kataraba raka ba 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 kande re boroko zimande re boroko zika ba 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 manda ra ba si kataraba reke zika kataraba reke zimande re bosi kataraba. Zamanda la bazika tere bo roko zita la bareke zima dere dere. Raka mande ro bo zika tara bareke zima dere bo zika tara ba. Masa tara bareke zima dere 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 bo. Jike tere ke zima dere bo zika tara bareke zika tara ba ra ba 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 ba. Manda la bareke zika tara bareke zika tere bo roko zika tara ba. Raka ba 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 kandere bo roko zika tara bareke zima dere bo zika tara ba. Manda la basika tere bo roko zi mandele bo sika tere re 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 bo. Manda la basika tere bo roko zi katara ba. Thank you God. Reke zi mandele bo sike tere ke zi mandele bo sika tara ba. Mashike tere ke zi mandala ba sika tara ba reko zi mandala ba. Thank you God. 
Father, we thank you that this is a good day. We thank you that this is a spiritual meeting. We thank you that you are already here. We thank you that you have enabled us to be in the room at this time. We thank you for everyone who is making their way to this place. God, we speak life. We speak protection. We speak that they will get here in good time. We thank you because this is a life-defining gathering, a destiny-defining gathering. We thank you that hearts are being set on course. We thank you that churches are being set on course. We thank you that disciples are being set on course. We thank you that movements are being set on course. We thank you that what was crooked is being made straight right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you that where there have been gaps in our ministries, God, you are filling those gaps. You are closing those gaps in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that where there has been gaps in our personal lives as leaders, God, you are closing those gaps by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone says, everyone says, amen, amen. Now, I would like us to pray through scripture because it's the best way to pray, to return God's word to him. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. Could we read it together? Together. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now, I'm going to ask that we actually read the scripture together. Can we do that? Can we do that? Can we do that? Please turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Tell the neighbor, neighbor. I know you are anointed. I know you are fire spitting. I know you chase demons. I know that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now you're going to open your mouth. Tell your neighbor, neighbor. Now we are going to read the word of God together. Okay, okay. You know, there is a joke in Worship Harvest Ministries how uh, in the earlier days when we were learning how to do reports, one of the leaders of a small group was asked for a, a, a report. And then he said, I am an apostle. I don't write reports. Tell the neighbor, what a shock. How many of you know you can't, uh, you can't build a ministry like this without learning how to write reports <laughs> and even submit them? So we're going to read the scriptures together. Are we ready? Okay. On top of your voice. On top of your voice. Together. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. I'd like us this morning to thank God that he found us faithful and he put us into the ministry. Because you're in the ministry, it means God looked around and said, faithful, 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 faithful. Put him into the ministry. Put her into the ministry. Isn't that a blessing? Isn't that a blessing? All right, let's open our mouths right now together and thank God for putting us into the ministry. It is a privilege. It is an honor. It's the greatest honor to be put into the ministry. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for putting us into the ministry. Thank you, Lord, for putting us into the ministry. Thank you that you counted us faithful. Thank you for every mission of community shepherd, every zonal pastor, every location pastor, every small group leader, every network leader, every movement leader, every pastor of churches in this room, movement leaders, 
in this room thank you that you counted us faithful and put us into the ministry Reke zika taraba, zamandala ba zika taraba, manzaka tererere, raka manderererebo, masike tererere, raka zamanderere, shuka taraba zimanderere, shike tererererebo zika taraba. Thank you, Lord. Maraka zimanderebo zika taraba. Thank you, Jesus. Masike tererererebo zika tererere. Masika taraba reke zimandelelelebo zika taraba raka mandelelelebo zika tererebo mandala ba reke zimandelebo zike terere raka mandelelelebo zika taraba reke zimandelelebo masaka taraba reke zimandelelebo zika taraba raka mandala ba zike tererebo zika taraba raka mandelebo zika terebo roko zimandelelebo zika taraba that you counted us faithful and put us into the ministry. Maraka zimanderebo zika terebo roko zimanderebo. Mazaka taraba reke ziba baba. Manderebo zika taraba. Thank you for the different ministries represented in the room. Mazika taraba. Thank you for the different ministries represented at this conference. Mazike tereke zika taraba. Thank you for the different ministries, the different leaders represented at this gathering. Thank you for every minister at every level in all the ministries. May there be an awareness Manzike terebo of what kind of privilege it is. Manzaka terebo zike terebo Masaka taraba of what kind of honor it is. Masike terebo roko zika taraba. Manderebo zika taraba. Raka ziba baba to be put into the ministry of God. Reke zika taraba that you will not grow dull. That you will not grow dull in that awareness. That you will be keenly aware of it every day of our lives. Makoshike terebo roko zika terebo. That you will not drift from that truth. That you will not drift from that truth. Truth in the name of Jesus, make seke tererebo, masike tererebo, zika taraba reke zike tererebo, zima mama, manderebo zike tereke si manderebo zima baba baba, masterebo rike si manderebo zike tererebo. Thank you, Jesus. Mareke si mandolo bo zike te. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of Proclaim Conference. We thank you, Lord, because you have prepared mightily, immensely. We thank you, Jesus, for calling us into ministry. We thank you for every good thing that you have prepared for us these three days. We thank you, Lord. May you open up our hearts to receive every spiritual food, Lord. Because your word is food to our souls. Your word is health to our is, is health to our bones and strength, O oh Lord. Father, we thank you because we move and live by your word. We thank you, Lord, because all hearts are set, all minds are alert, all flesh is healed. Everything is working together for our good today, Jesus. Because we love you and because we are the called according to your purpose. We thank you, Lord, because you who has called us. You are faithful, who also will do it. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for everything. We thank you for your mighty move these three days. We thank you for your heavy presence of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Jesus, because none of the words that you're sharing through the mighty men and women, Lord, is going to fall to the ground, but it's going to fall on fertile souls. So we thank you, Lord, because this time next year, we shall have greatness. We shall have results. We shall have fruit that lasts. We thank you, Holy Spirit. You're worthy, you're holy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Clap your hands to God and thank him for putting you into the ministry. 
if it was according to your background, if it was according to how much of the scriptures you know by now, if it is according to how much money you have, if it's according to your height or to your skin color, many of us wouldn't qualify. Tell your neighbor, you wouldn't qualify. But God put you into the ministry. What a blessing. What an honor. Thank you, Lord. So the same verse says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me. Because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. I'd like us to thank God for his enablement. Yes, he has enabled you. It is divine enablement. You know, recently, not so long ago, a couple of weeks ago, I was driving to the church where my husband and I lead. It's in Mukono on the road to Jinja. For those of you who may not come from Uganda. And I started to realize that even the fact that I am able to drive to the location, to the church I lead, is divine enablement. Is enablement for the ministry. Ability to be able to use the computer and write a report is enablement for the ministry. Ability to sing, ability to make disciples, ability to build buildings like this. All that is enablement for the ministry. So I want us to take time oh, and give thanks to God for his divine enablement for the ministry. I've given you some of the examples that God brought to my mind. You know where you lead, you know your context, you know your personal story, you know the stories of the people around you, you know the story of your church, you know the story of your ministry. You are going to be able to see as we pray in the spirit, God is going to open your eyes to the kinds of enablements he has given you for the ministry. Why don't you open your mouth right now and give thanks to God for enabling you to do the work of ministry. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for divine enablement. Thank you for divine graces. Thank you for the ability to do very many things that are required for the ministry. Thank you, Lord, even for the ability to pray right now. Thank you for enablement. You have enabled us, so God. You have given us tools for the ministry. You you have given us grace for the ministry. It is you who works in us both to do and to will and to do accord for your good pleasure. Lift up your voice. Give thanks to God. Yes, Lord, divine enablement. Unmerited favors. Thank you for grace mandara basika terebo roko zimandele bosika ta thank you lord masike tereke zimandolo bosika taraba sheke terebo zimandelelele raka mandala basika taraba you are good and your mercy endures forever we thank you god thank you for the tools thank you for equipment thank you for means of transport for resources money and money derivatives thank you lord for people that you have surrounded us with that will be able to fulfill the work of ministry the ability to think, the ability to make decisions. The ability to raise those that we didn't give back to biologically. The ability to love. The ability to persist. The ability to forgive. The ability to lift up other 
Jesus. Makore ke zimanderaba. The ability to give people opportunities. Ori ke zimanderaba zikata. Thank you, Jesus. Makata raba zimanderaba ziketerere. Raka mandala ba zikata raba. Reke ziba baba. Mandala ba ziketerere. Raka mandaraba zikata raba. You counted us faithful. You put us into the ministry. God, thank you. Masike tereke zimandere bosi kataraba. Mandere bosi keterere. Raka mandala basi keterere. Jikataraba. Raka mandele bosi kataraba. Reke zimandere bosi kata. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You are good, Lord. You riki zimandere bosi kataraba. You're a good God. Mandala basi kataraba. Mandeke si kataraba. Raka baba baba baka terere. Reke zimandere bosi keterere. Raka baba baba baba. Mandele bosi keterere. Masi keterere terere bosi keterere. Raka baba baba. Mandele bosi keterere bo. Zika terebo roko ba 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 kandere bo roko zika taraba reke zika taraba raka ba 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 kiri di 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 bo zika taraba raka mandele le 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 bo zika taraba reke zima mandele bo zika taraba thank you God reke zika terebo zika terere le ba makasi kataraba masuri bo zima mandele bo zika ta makiri bo zima mandele bo zika terere mak adu Rubuzi mandere bosi kata zidi di di buzi mandere bosi kata raba reke zi mandere bosi mama 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 mandala bazi kata raba siki tiri ba 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 zi mandere bosi kata raba mandere bosi kata raba mazi ketere bosi mandere bosi ba 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 thank you Jesus Hallelujah. Father in heaven, we are truly grateful for this day. We thank you that having called us into ministry, you are enabling us. Thank you for divine enablement. Thank you, Father, for the different things that you have facilitated us with to be able to carry out ministry. I thank you for the giftings that we have. Thank you, Father, for the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, teachers, evangelists, Lord. I also thank you, Father, for the uh, human resource that you have enabled us to have, oh God, the different people that serve day in and day out, oh God. We thank you, Father, for the non-human resource that we have, Lord. Thank you for the buildings. Yes, that every church represented here today will have buildings in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the vehicles that are coming. Thank you, my Jesus, Lord, for the people that you are sending us that are going to stand and support the ministry, Lord. Thank you for the finances that are coming, that we shall build the kingdom of God and expand it to the ends of the earth. Lord, I thank you for equipping us, for it's not by power, it's not by might, but by your spirit. Thank you for the best gift given, the best resource we ever have the Holy Spirit, that he abides with us, in us, and upon us, Lord. May he continue to strengthen us, Lord, to do ministry. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you mean to clap, please go ahead and clap. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. God is, God is amazing. If you could give me Philippians 2 13 can we read it together together for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure can you imagine he he first of all looks for you finds you faithful he puts you into the ministry and putting you into the ministry means that he makes you willing it is God who works in you both to will and then after he makes you willing he helps you to do the work. Isn't he a good God? Isn't he a good God? God is not a cruel God. I, I believe that God is ministering to someone here. You're a pastor. And he's telling you, look, I am not a cruel God. I did not send you to embarrass you or to embarrass you. Something like that, wherever you come from. I didn't send you to embarrass you. 
I will make you willing. I will help you to be willing. And I will help you to do the work of ministry. He will equip you. He will send you people. I'm prophesying now. He will send you people who will support you, who will love you, who will stand with you and your wife and your children or your husband and your family. He will send you people who will pray for you when you are very, very weak, when you're not able to pray for yourself. He will send people to pray for you. He will send people to lift you up. He will send you your Aaron and your heart. Somebody, I am prophesying to you right now. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive the strength of the Lord right now for his encouragement and for his divine enablement. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Wow. I want you in a minute, if you could reduce the, 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 the music just a bit. I want you to turn to your neighbor. Even as you are praying, God was bringing to mind different kinds of enablements he has given you. Can you please share with them five? Five things that you realize, thank you, Lord, that you have enabled me. Don't cut out the music. I said just reduce it. Just five things. As you prayed, those things came to mind. Share with someone. Even as you're, you're speaking, you are testifying. You are giving thanks to God. Praise the Lord with each other. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Thank you for people. Thank you for resources. Thank you for gifts, graces. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for the grace to visit people. <laughs> for the willingness to even go visit them. The second person should be talking by now and almost finishing. Some people want to share a hundred graces. Just five for now. Just five. Thank you, Lord. Awesome. Awesome. Can we give thanks to God with a clap offering for all the divine graces in the room? Let's read together 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Are we ready? We'll read it in two versions, New King James Version, and then we'll also read it in ESV. Because there's something very interesting there. Together, therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and of the work of faith with power. Verse 12, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read it in ESV. Yeah. Together. Huh? To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus uh -huh, in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Take me to verse 11 in ESV. Verse 11 in ESV. So it says to this end we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling. We've just read from 1 Timothy 1.12 that God counted us faithful and he put us into the ministry. He already has counted you faithful. He has already counted you worthy by putting you into the ministry. And now, I want us to pray into the second part of that verse. And may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. This is the thing. God puts us into the ministry. We say yes. We come to a gathering like this. We hear all these teachings and we live the three days with great resolves. Yes, Pastor David, great resolves. You're saying, I'm going to go and pray into the territory. 
Hey! Yes? Didn't you feel yesterday like, let them leave us alone and we go back to our territories and pray and take them? Hey! So you leave this room saying, I'm going to go and have breakfast with my children every week. Tell your neighbor some of the resolves you left yesterday with. The teachers were teaching and you're like, I'm going to do this thing. Tell your neighbor, what are some of the resolves that you came out with from yesterday? Territorial prayer. Yeah. <laughs> some of us are going to go and plant churches. It's a resolve. When apostle said we're going to plant a church in the next one year, you stood up. You are wondering why isn't he asking those who want to plant 20 churches in one year? Ah, it's a resolve. I'm telling you. <laughs> okay, let me have the room back. To this end, we always pray for you that God may make you worthy of his calling. Are we listening? People are very excited to talk about their resolves. We are praying this morning that God will fulfill every resolve for good. There are so many decisions, desires, people in the room who have said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make disciples. I'm going to go and multiply the culture at my church. I am going to go and, um, you know, pray, territorial taking prayers. But we are going to pray that God will help us to, res to, to, to fulfill, that God will fulfill every resolve for good. And every work of faith. How many of you know that making disciples is a work of faith? Hey, someone is, is making disciples is a work of faith. Planting churches is a work of faith. 18 years ago when Apostle planted this church, it was a work of faith. But you see, God fulfills every resolve for good and every work of power, rather every work of faith, listen, by his power. Please put up the scripture. They need to see it. You see that? That to this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and, and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. By whose power? By God's power. That's what I want us to pray for. But I don't want you to pray for yourself alone. I want you to pray for yourself and for your disciples. Because your disciples many, many times struggle. They want to do good. They want to start the mission of communities. They want to go and plant the church. But something is not working. And so we are praying that God will help us and our disciples. That he will fulfill this desire, this resolves, the work of faith by his power. Are you ready to pray? For yourself and for your disciples. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray that you will fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by your power. God, that you will fulfill every resolve for good, every work of faith by your power. Masike tereke zimandere bo si kataraba, mandere bo si katere bo roko zi kataraba, mandere bo zi kataraba. That will multiply disciples, that we will multiply church plants, that we will multiply churches, that we will multiply movements. Makereke zi kataraba. Every resolve for good, every work of faith. Mandeke zika taraba, Lord, only by your power. Masike tereke zimandere bo zika taraba. Zimandere bo zika taraba. Maketere bo reke zimandere bo zika taraba. Raka mandere bo zike tere bo zika taraba. Raka mandere bo zika taraba. Maseke reke zimandere bo zika taraba. Raka ba 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 ba. Every resolve for good and every work of faith that we are engaging in, that we have already been engaged in, that we are going to start after this gathering. 
Makote reke zika taraba. Mandele bosi kataraba. Works of faith where it looks impossible. Makataraba reke zika ta. Stepping out knowing that the God who knows no impossibility is with us. Makataraba zika taraba. Lord fulfill it by your power. Makete reke ziba baba. Mast erebo reke zima nde kuzima nda kaziara. Maketi kiri hizima nde kuziba baba. Makote kere ke zira baba. Makete reke ziba baba. Mast erebo reke zima nde kuziara baba. Jekete reke. Thank you, Jesus. Makataraba reke zika taraba. Fulfill raka zika. Fulfill by your power. Masike te reke zika terebo. The deposits of results in our hearts. Makataraba. As we listen to the different teachers of the word. Makatarabo zika taraba. Makataraba. Masike te reke zika. You are putting in us ideas. Makataraba zika taraba. Your reke zika. Your Stirring us up in certain desires. Makiti kiri kazi mandala bazika baba baba. Faith is rising in our hearts. Makatara to go and engage, to go and engage deeper, to go and engage wider, to go and engage more frequently. Makatara ba. We pray for fulfillment of these results. We pray for fulfillment of these works of faith. Makatara ba zika ta. That the word will not fall to the ground. That will not only be hearers of the word, but will be doers of the word. In the name of Jesus, Makataraba, we pray for our disciples, O oh God. Riki zima ndera mo zike terera ba, zika taraba. Lord, that you will fulfill the results in their hearts for the work of ministry, O oh God. Riki zima ndera mo zika taraba. Everyone who said they will start a mission or community, Makata or a small group, Makataraba, zika taraba. Makataraba, reke zika taraba. Masika taraba. Those who are starting churches, those who are leading churches, makuri kizi mandela masika taraba. That that will be a redabu kuzika, a fulfillment. Makata taraba, mama mandere bo zika taraba. Of the work of ministry, zira masika ta. In our lives, oh God, masika taraba. In the different ministries, make shike taraba zima mandere bo zike te. Makule ba ba ba, maseke te reke zika ta. Glory to your name, oh God. Mareke ziba ba ba, mast elabo rike zima ndo kozi ba ba ba. Jikata makata lava reke zima ndelelebo manda ba 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 makese kete iti reke zima nda oze ba 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 ba. I pray arakazika for an open heaven makete lebo zika taraba makata lava zika taraba manda lebo zika taraba makata lava reke zima ndelele oze ke manda lava zika taraba. Thank you, Jesus. Mahori kizi. Mande la bosi kataraba, mande la bosi kete la bosi mande, masata la ba, makata la ba si ya la bosi mande, bushi kete la bosi manda ka, holy kesi ba mama, mande la bosi kete, manda la ba si kete la bo. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you, for it is in you who works in us both to will and to do according to your pleasure. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask all think according to the power that works in us Thank you Lord that your power is actually present to work through us So from this place oh Lord we are willing vessels saying do it Lord through us do it in our generation don't wait for another generation we are here let your power walk through us to execute everything, every instruction that you're giving us today, yesterday, and tomorrow. To the glory and honor of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead and clap. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Verse 12 in ESV. So that... The fulfillment of the resolve for good and the faith, the work of faith by the power of God. There's a reason for it. 
the fulfillment of this work of worship harvest ministries in the last 18 years and the more that we are going to see the fulfillment of the, the work of ministry wherever you come from where you come from there's a purpose for it there's a reason for it and it is in verse 12 it says together so that the name of our Lord Jesus, I can't hear you, we will start again. So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. Tell your neighbor that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. Praise the Lord that the name of the Lord is going to be glorified in us. That the name of the Lord is going to be glorified in our disciples. That the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be glorified in the nations. Did you hear Apostle Mangalisa yesterday saying that the sons of God are nations? That the firstborn is Israel. Then he said he doesn't know who the secondborn is. I think Uganda is the secondborn. Some people are not happy about who the second born is. You can take it for yourself. You decide. You decide. I was thinking, are we the second born or the last born? Ah, I couldn't decide, you know. Nations. That the nations, that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified in the nations. That it will be true that we'll be able to say for God and my country. That it will not just be a tagline. That it will not just be printed somewhere on money and different documents. But it will be true that God will be glorified in Uganda. Don't you want that? Don't you want that? So we are going to pray that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in us and in our nations. Represent your nation. Are you going to do that? Are you going to do that, Pastor Isaac? Great. Let's open our mouths and pray and thank God for his glory. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified in us and in our nations. Lift up your voice right now. We are praying, not a devotional prayer. Right now, this is a territory taking prayer. That the Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified in us and in the nations where we come from. In Uganda, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Sudan, in South Africa, in Algeria. In Zambia, in Zimbabwe, in Botswana. In Ethiopia, Masikata, in Congo. Open your mouth. Lift up your voice. Lord, that your name, Jesus Christ, will be glorified in me, will be glorified in us. Mande Kezikata will be glorified in our nations in Rwanda, in Burundi. Mahuri Kizimanda Kare Kezibaba, Mast Erebo Kizimando Koziri Buzima, Mande Kuziri Robababa, Mande Kozi Araba Zika Teraba, Mak Erik Zimando Kozia, Manda Koziri Buzimandaraba. Zeke terebo raka mandala basika taraba raka mama mama ndela ba raka baba ba mandala basika taraba raka baba baba mandala ba rika zika taraba raba baba ba kandela ba zika taraba raka baba ba kandela ba zika taraba mandala ba zika taraba reke zimandela ba zika taraba zimandela ba zika taraba raka mandela ba zika taraba manda la basika taraba rika zimande la basika taraba manda la basika taraba raka manda la basika taraba raka baba baba kande la basika taraba manda la basika taraba manda la basika taraba ria baba baba masuke taraba maku 
Kundelo Bozi Baba Baba Mandala Bazika Telaba Zumande Kuzima Mama Mandala Basika Telaba Mandala Basika Telebo Rika Zika Telaba Mandala Bazika Telebo Zuma Mamandala Basika Ta Thank you Lord Mandala Bozika Telebo Baba Baba Manda Kazi Erebo Zika Telaba Rika Zimande Kozi Baba Baba Zimande Kozi Mama Masiketeleba, mashiri buzi mama mama mama, mandele buzi ketereba, zima mama mama mandele buzi kateleba rika zima ngoro baba baba. Thank you Jesus, mando kori ka baba baba, mazuke tere buzi ketereba, mazuka baba baba baba, makote reke zima mandele buzi kateleba, raka baba baba kandele buzi kezi baba baba. Mandala bazika talaba riki zimandela bosika talaba mandala bazika talaba Lord Jesus Christ that you will be glorified in us you will be glorified in us you will be glorified in the nations mandela bosika tere zuba baba katalaba zimande kuziri riri ujia shiketere kezi baba baba makatalaba thank you Jesus Mandela bosi ketere bore kezi mandela bosi kataraba mandala basi kataraba raka baba 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 basi mandela lele bosi ketere re jimande kezi baba 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 nanda la basi ketere bore kozi manda thank you Jesus Hallelujah we give you praise God we give you glory our prayer this morning Lord is that you would be glorified in our lives. And that you would be glorified across the nations in the name of Jesus. You have taught us in your word that our inheritance is all the nations. You are concerned and personally, personally at so in every nation in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray that Lord you would be glorified in Africa. You would be glorified in Uganda. You would be glorified in Kenya, Zimbabwe, Swaziland, Nigeria, the Seychelles, Egypt and all across in the name of Jesus. We pray that you would be glorified in all continents, in Europe, in Asia. We pray that you would be glorified in the Americas. We pray that you would be glorified. We pray that you would be glorified in Australia. We pray that you would be glorified all across board in the name of Jesus. Because you, you, the, 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 the nations are your sons for the glory and for the honor of your holy name. We pray that you would send out laborers in those places so that your name is glorified for the glory and for the honor of your holy name. We pray that you would stir our hearts this morning for us to be able to go send out disciples into the various parts of this world in the name of Jesus Christ. That's our prayer this morning, Lord. And we pray that as you are glorified in all the nations, disciples will be multiplied across board for the glory and for the honor of your holy name in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We count it such a great honor and a privilege for us to partner with you, Lord, for you have invited us into a journey of significance. We pray that, Lord, we would be obedient to the great commission in the name of our Lord Jesus. So once again, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified first and foremost in our lives and in all the nations. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Isaac. Please clap for him. Yes. He planted the church in Uganda. He comes from Kenya. Ah, what a son of God. What a son of God. I'd like us to spend the next 10 minutes praying for every speaker who is going to be speaking on this stage. Do you think that's a brilliant idea? Oh, yes. So I want us to be in groups of threes. Of course, I know we love to hold hands and that kind of thing, but we are not going to do that today. We'll just, you know, elbow each other. But let's just, you know, be in groups of three. Can we, can we do that very quickly, pastors? Pastors, please, let's move quickly. Let's make sure you're in a group of three people. Why three? Just because it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Spirit, Soul, and Body. <laughs> Ice, liquid, and solids. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, that is wrong. Ice, liquids, and gases. 
solids, liquid, and gases. All right. We're going to pray. We're going to pray for every speaker going to come onto this stage today that their words will come out like a double-edged sword, that their words will carry fire, yes, that their words will carry the spirit of the living God, that their words will come and enter us, Ezekiel 2.2. Can you give me that scripture? Give me that scripture, Ezekiel 2.2. Ezekiel 2.2. Oh, yes, it's coming. It's coming. Ezekiel 2, 2, right there. Then the Spirit entered me when he spoke and set me on my feet. And I heard him who spoke to me that as the speakers are speaking, two things will happen. That the Spirit will enter us. You're going to see that that's a capital S. So that is the Holy Spirit entering us. And how many of us know that when the Holy Spirit is coming to us, he makes us become another man and another woman. And the scripture says, please keep the scripture up, that the Spirit entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet. It means that either you're lying down or you're sitting or you're in a position that says you're not standing up straight. You're not ready for the battle. You're not ready for the work. You're weary, maybe you're tired, you're sitting, you're lying down, you're sleeping. I don't know what position you're in. But I'm going to ask that we pray that as the speakers are speaking, the Holy Spirit will enter us and that we'll be set on our feet. That their words will carry the fire of the Holy Spirit. That their words will be like a double-edged sword. That every one of us will be feeling like, Oh, Munta, go in, I have heard, I have understood. Are you ready to pray? Are you ready to pray? All right, let's open our mouths and begin to pray for every speaker that will be coming onto this stage. Lift up your voice and let's pray fervently. That there will be no hindrance to the word of God. No spiritual hindrance, no spiritual distractions, no physical hindrances, no physical distractions to the word of God coming to us this day. This morning, this afternoon. Makiri kizima nde kuzima nganda mazika ta makeri buzima mama nde la bosi kete mahuri buzima nde kasi kata mande la bosi kata la ba maketeri buzima nde kesi kata manda kazi kata maketeri kesi manda mahanda la bosi kata maketeri kesi kata makasi kata la ba masiketeri bosi kata masikata la ba zima nde la bosi kata mak Lift up your voice. We are praying. We are praying. We are praying for every speaker. The plenary speakers, the interviews, the breakout sessions. That the word of God will be clear. That the word of God will come through to our hearts. That there will be strength. That there will be strength released to us. Makata, strength and weakness. Makata, feeble arms will be strengthened. Weak knees will be strengthened in the name of Jesus. Makata, Zukataraba, that those who were on the verge of giving up will receive a new lease of life. Makataraba, Rika Zika, like Elijah who ate and he was able to run for another 40 days. Makataraba, Zika, without growing weary. Makataraba, Fakusi Ketelaba, Zikata, Mandaraba, Zikataraba, Makataraba, strength is going to be released. Makataraba, ministries are going to run for the next 40 years because of the word taught on this stage. Makwazi Kata, lift up your voice. Makata, pray fervently. Makataraba, the effective prayer over 
effective, righteous, Father, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Effective, fervent prayer of righteous men and women. Erika Zika is availing much. Makata Rika, lift up your voice. Don't be silent. Makata Rabazima Don't be pretty about it. Makata Rabazika Te. Manda Kuzia Baba. Shake it Araba. Manda Laba Sika Taraba. Glory to God. Lee Zima Mama. Makata Raba. Reke Zima de Kasikata. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Strength is being released. Makaraba Zika Taraba. Mandala Basika Taraba. Strength in the legs. Strength in the feet. Makata Raba. Strength in fever arms. Makata Raba Kara Basika Taraba. Strength into the ministries, strength into the pastors, strength into the leaders, strength for the movement leaders. Hallelujah. We worship you, God. Hallelujah. Lift up the voice. Makete la barika ziba baba, makote la barika zika. Like a double-edged sword, your word is coming to us. What like fire? Makete la barika zika ba, makori kizika ta. The zeal of the Lord, mazika ta ba, makete la barika zika ta. An activation of the zeal of the Lord, makuri kiziba baba, masteri ha baba, makute la barika ta ba. Yes, Lord, we worship you. Makuri kizika, leading, leading, leading. Makora kama baba, masika tala ba, leading. One more masika, two more minutes, two more minutes, leading, leading. Makuri kiziba baba, manduke la ba, masika tala ba, masika tala ba. No interruptions, no destructions. Makuri kizima mama to the word of the Lord. Masika tala ba. Shika Telaba Zimanda Kuzi Araba Riki Zimanda Kazi Baba Holy Holy La Rika Zia Baba Mas Erebu Riki Zimanda Kuzi Mama Masika Telaba Rihi Ziba Baba Maka Telaba Zimanda Kuzi Mazi Araba Sika Tele Ureka Baba Maka Telaba Zika Telaba Zuba Baba Manda Kuzi Baba Jiri Haba Baba Manda Kazi Baba Yes, God, Makuri Kizi Baba, Masika Telaba, Manda Kazika Telaba, Masika Telaba, Rika Ziba Baba, Makore Kazika Telaba, Yes, Lord, Kuri Kizika, Manda Masika Telaba, forty more seconds of praying, Manda Kazika Telaba, don't be silent, Makaziba Baba, Makuziki Telaba, Rika Zika, Manda. We set a hedge of fire around this building, around this property, around this premises. In the name of Jesus, Makaraba Ziba Baba, Shika Telaba, Mako Telaba, Makuri Baba, Zeke Telaba, Zimande Kuziba, Manda Kazi Araba, Makora Kazika, Mondi Kizika Telaba, Amandu Kore Kazika Telaba. Right now, I want everyone to start clapping to Jesus. Clap your hands, all your people. Clap your hands, all your people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Clap your hands. Clap your hands, all your people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I can't hear you. Let everything that has breath. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Clap your hands. Clap your hands. Clap your hands. All you people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. The Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. Thank you, Jesus. Woohoo!
Good morning, everybody. Are you excited about Proclaim Day 2? Are you ready to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? I think only this person is ready. I don't know about the rest of us. I said, are you ready to worship Jesus? Church with this old school jam. Shout to the Lord in here. You know that it's good that it must endure forever. And the people of God say the same. What now? And the people of God say yeah. Now we serve notice to depression, confusion, all manner of evil, and every sickness. You came in a bond, but you cannot say because the people of God. Hey, it's the good day. Even though I cried. Hey, and now I said. Listen, no matter what comes next, I'm going to stand up and give him the praise. Because this is the day. Here we go. Now. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day. Is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. The Lord has made. I will rejoice. Hey. I will rejoice. Jesus! 
One, two, three, hey. Are you ready? One, two, three. One, two, three, hey. Hey, oh my. And a little dance now. Like that. Like that. And a little dance. Like that. Like that. Like that.
for living with you and made my decision. Like living with you, it's like you created. I choose see the sun now bursting through the clouds, black and white, turn to color all around. All is new in the Savior I am found. This is living now. This is living now. living is, hey. is it love if it was, I'm living it, hey. do I living it, so much sounding, hey. love is an ocean you can drown, hey. the sweet embrace, the lovely taste, the taste to see, a man the grace, the place to be, hey. it means I will never need an umbrella, I'm cool and I'm cold in the hot weather, weather never ever, understand that my man in the hand, the great plans to send me faith in the love, I've never known no touch, it's just I swap my touch, but I'm like what's to dream for, what's to hope for, what's to die for, I live to know, this is living, the life I've been given is a gift, if I'm a living, I'm a living today, What's to dream of? What's to hope for? What's to die for? And if to know, this is living. The life I've been given is a gift. If I'm a living, this is living Why? Why 
Yebunisa, wali yo amani. Planted in the house of the Lord. To bless those who are planted in the house of the Lord. Hey, 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 You will run Crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. 
give you glory we give you praises we say that you are worthy you are mighty you are king you are lord we worship you and we adore you because there is none like you. Indeed, as we say that you great thou art, it's not something you are doing to prop you up. It's the reality of our lives. It's the convictions of our hearts. It's the, it's, the, it's the thing that you want the world to know so that as many as possible can be able to join us singing that song as a conviction of their lives, as a, as a reality that they enter into every day. And so we give you glory, we give you praises, we give you honor and adoration. And all of us said... Amen. All of us shouted. Amen. Amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Woohoo! Come on, come on, come on. Let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Yay! Wow. wow. Welcome everybody to proclaim 2024 day two. Yes, you can do better than that. Now, what? before you have your seats, just turn to your neighbor and tell them you look dashing today. Give them that fist bump. Yep. Turn to the other neighbor that you didn't choose first and tell them, even you look amazing. Yeah. Tell them, even that though you're second my second choice. choice, you still look amazing. And then you can go ahead and have our seats. You can go ahead and have our seats. Can we just appreciate the music team, the worship team for that amazing time of music and dance? What? That was amazing. Thank you so much, worship team. We appreciate every time you get to lead us in worshiping our King. Amen. So just as a reminder about what Proclaim really is about. Proclaim is the minister's gathering. And we come here to get equipped to go out and multiply disciples, multiply small groups, multiply churches, mm -hmm. multiply networks, multiply mm -hmm. movements, mm -hmm. and the theme of this year is? Oh, yes. Multiply is the theme yes. of the year. Can, I also want to appreciate all the senior pastors, all the senior leaders who've allowed their pastors and lay leaders to come here for a time of training on how to be multipliers. Can Amen. we just appreciate all our senior pastors, all our lead pastors, all our lead visionaries from the different churches that we come here from. In fact, yes. let me do this. Can you shout out your church? Worship harvest! I don't know about you, but I only had Mavuno Church. <laughs> ah, worship Harvest, let's show them. Worship Harvest! Now what did you hear? I, I had Worship I, Harvest, it's true. <laughs> I'd also like to really appreciate Apostle Mose and Revma, Come on. the lead visionaries of Proclaim. Yes, we wouldn't be here if they hadn't thought to just do this for us. True. Yeah. And part of what they've done is that they've opened up their own network so that you can be able to learn from. If you're can you imagine? And clapping, you're doing the come right on, thing. come on. Yes. Let me ask you guys can you imagine if Apmo had kept uh, uh, Dave Ferguson to himself? Can you imagine? Can you imagine if he had kept Apostle Mangaliso to himself? Ah! Can you imagine? Can you, when I say can you imagine, you say we cannot imagine. Can you imagine? Oh, yeah. So, really, thank you so much, Apmo. Thank you so much, Revma, for opening up your network so that you can be able to learn from them. You can have your seats as well. So, yesterday was epic. Come and on. we had a whole lineup of great speakers who managed to just equip us and re-envision us and inspire us. And I hope we're all taking something away. Yep. Right? Yes. And today you must have a great expectation. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There are still there's... some great speakers to yes. come. Sorry for that. There are still some great speakers to come. There are still some great conversations for you to have. There's still networking for you to do, especially if you're single. There's stuff for us to do. We must be international in our experience. So great things are coming up ahead of us today. And we have a recap video for you to watch. Just in case you missed anything or you want to see the highlights of yesterday. Everyone, eyes to the screen. Are you a free radical? I'm not a free radical. Are you a free radical? I'm not a free radical. Are you a free radical? I hope there are no free radicals in this place. Are there any? Are there any free radicals in this place? A free radical is somebody who is not in a MC or a small group 
or a cell, whatever you call it. Anything else that is not part of a cell, a molecule, an organ, a system, is a free radical. And that free radical is a cancerous cell. So let's say this is kept the rave is moving at a certain pace. And then he hooks himself on to... <laughs> That's the art of following. Sometimes you feel like you're about to collapse because the people you're following are at a pace that is insane. But that's what some of you need to do. Your thing is too slow, too small, too annoying. Find someone who is moving at a pace that gives you a headache and hang on. Our core goal is to have investor-ready and scalable businesses. Sure. And we are working towards that through the School of Practical Business and other the spaces where we are coaching. At the moment we get ready, we will definitely scale this thing. Don't we are ready. waiting for you. <laughs> what is up, Proclaim 2024? How does it happen that our churches plateau? How does it happen that we stop planting new churches? How, how is it as, as people that we somehow end up physically someplace we never intended to be? How do is it that we end up relationally in our marriages, in our families, in places we never intended to be. The only reason you'd come here, right, to worship Harvest, to a multiply conference, is because you're somebody who wants to have a big dream. Do I get an amen? You want to have big dreams. You come here with big dreams. And my hunch is you also, you want the John 10, 10 flourishing life that Jesus promises. Do you want the flourishing life? Yes, we do. We want both of those things. And so we start out our leadership marked with, with church multiplication. He does not say pray for the harvest. He does not say pray for the sinners. There is no way in this scripture where, he's, where we are interceding for the lost. No, we are supposed to pray for the workers. God's biggest problems is the workers. There are no laborers. Everybody on the team is actually a disciple. They're either part of a missional community or they're leading a missional community. Uh, some of them are even Zono pastors. You had Uncle Yo and his wife, they're Zono pastors here at Worship Harvest Nalia. So do the Apostle Mangaliso Free Radical Dance. Those who are not in MC, Free Radicals, we shall chase you. Come on now, put your hands together for the media team. Proclaim 2024. Are you ready for day two? The people in this corner are not ready. What? One day, I walked up to the person I'm about to introduce to you and told him that I was in a relationship. What's a relationship, right? Yeah. And what he did is he got out his wallet and gave us two golden knots. Or golden colored. Okay, they're not golden because they're not colored. Any point of the story, yeah. He gave us <laughs> that money. And since then, he's been investing in us. We got married close to 10 months ago. Hallelujah. <laughs> it shows, eh? Yeah, it, it shows. Pastor Matt has clearly been telling me how the evidence is all around. And, um, <laughs> you people, my time. And ever since then, ever since then, he's been investing not just in us, but in hundreds of young people. Now, the man I'm about to introduce to you prays for young people. He teaches young people. He plays with them. He watches movies with them. He invites them to his home to empty his fridge. He drives them around, takes them to their homes. He disciples young people. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to invite I would like to invite you to get up on your feet with Jesus joy. Welcome Pastor Isaac Wakwaika. Thank you. Thank you. As uh... As a wise man once said, hello, that, that wise man is Apostle Mangaliso, hello. <laughs> Father, we thank you for such a wonderful time we are going to have together.
thank you that the word is going to go forth powerfully and unhindered and that it's going to bring forth fruit a hundredfold in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Please ever so kindly have your seats. Are you hearing the English? Yeah, we're on an international stage. Yeah, we're using words like forth, thou, thee. Ever so kindly. <laughs> On Monday at about 10 p.m., my wife and I received a baby boy. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. So I bring you greetings from my wife and uh, our son. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah, I'm working hard. I'm working really hard. Yeah, so I currently have an only begotten um, son. Yeah. <laughs> now, when, when, when uh, the next day after we gave birth, someone came to visit and, and brought a gift. Now, the gift was um, a shaker. Yeah, not gold frankincense and margin. <laughs> it was a shaker. Which, you, know, you know shakers. Not like movers and shakers, but sh shaker. And I asked them, by any chance, is it a spear? Because if it is, we would have to change the baby's name to William. Because, you know, William Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah, those jokes come with being a dad. <laughs> See, because they are apparent. <laughs> Anywho, <laughs> as I conclude, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, anyway, as I conclude, so one of my pastors sent me a message and said, congratulations on your dear son. And then he said, mom should have been around to see this. And it's a thought I had had actually when he came. I was like, oh, she should have been around to see this because she was quite a big, well, not quite really a big part of my Christianity. I remember when we were younger, she used to carry me and take me to church, very young, with a Gideon's International Bible in the back of my pocket, uh, New Testament with the uh, Psalms and Proverbs. And I started loving church because she introduced me to church. Sometimes she would come back home. There's a day she returned from uh, either it was Winner's Chapel or a church called Back to God, one of those two. And I, I don't think I had gone to church. The day she came back and said, let me tell you something. Jesus came down on that stage. I, I've been waiting all my life to experience that. It hasn't yet happened. I guess it's only mothers who can, who can, see, who can see Jesus descend. But over the, the years, she kept investing in me. And at some point, uh, uh, I, I discovered this, uh, like, maybe a year or so after she had passed. At some point because I was consistently in church. Sometimes you would even quarrel with me for being at church. There's a time I went to church early morning and I was there till late night. I was about 13. And then I came back home and she said, where have you been? I said, I've been at church. What? Yeah. I will not. Yeah. Do you not know that as about, about my father's? No, I didn't say that. I'm quite. <laughs> So anyway, she observed that pattern, and one of those times she, intro, uh, she, she was a teacher, and uh, one of those times she tells uh, the head teacher of the school where she was, who doubled as a pastor, said, I see something in this young man, and I would like you to be in charge of him, teach him, grow him, and, you know, those different things. And over time, you know, I began to grow even more prayer, reading the word, and different things because she had given someone to teach me. It reminds me of Deuteronomy chapter 11, is it? Verse 19. See, I said verse because, you know. Yeah, verse 19. It says, you shall teach them to your children. He spoke, speaking of the things that he had written in the law. It says, you shall teach them to your children. Speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, uh, when you lie down and when you rise up. And I thought that's, that's something she did quite well, just getting the word and teaching me, much as most of the time it wasn't sitting down and opening the scriptures. It was mostly, you know, through people, conversation. 
um, most of the, the TV that I watched when I was younger was Lighthouse Television. It's a Christian um, station. So I used to watch VeggieTales and Superbook and other such things. Meanwhile, you're growing your children on Coco Melon, so I jebale you. It's so funny, though, because you, you, you want someone to grow up to be a certain kind of person, but you're growing them on, on something that's going to just introduce them to just alphabet and uh, social activism and other such things, and then you're wondering why your child is not a preacher. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but anyway, he says you shall teach them to your children. The expectation of God is that children ought to be taught when you sit down, when you walk by the way, when you lie down. I could add when you wake up, it's right there. It's that all the time you are teaching them. I think God has such a keen interest in those that are younger. Um, in Genesis chapter 18, verse 17 to 19. Yeah, I said verse. That's how we young people talk, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is what he says. He says, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? And then he says, seeing, uh, since Abraham shall surely become, you see, he said, surely or surely. Since Abraham or surely Abraham, I'm a, I'm a, the next girl will be called Shari, Shirley. Sorry. Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. This is not guessing. He's not saying it might happen. He's saying it's definitely going to happen that Abraham is going to become a mighty nation. And the nations of the earth are going to be blessed in him. It's going to happen. And then he gives us the why. He says, because of her, I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him. He is surely going to become a great nation because he's going to command his children and his household after him. That means that if you're building a ministry, but there are no children in the ministry, there is no surely becoming a great nation for you. You understand? That God has tied that destiny of nations in children. He said, they sh he shall command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham. This is the reason God is bringing to Abraham what he has promised, because Abraham is going to command his children and his household. Hello. <laughs> and so that's the stuff that my mom was doing, just commanding and teaching. And thank you, Pastor Arthur. <laughs> that's my pastor. You know, anyway, I'm saying. <laughs> you get what I'm saying. So that's what she was doing. Um, oh, I was still telling you, well, I now have an only begotten son, and I'm planning to do the same. I have some books planned out <laughs> and a few pranks and a few pranks but books speaking of begotten sons John 3.16 the Bible says <laughs> yes the Bible says for apostles so loved to proclaim that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall surely become a strong nation look at me i'm the begotten son <laughs> if you're arguing that's your problem me i'm the begotten son oh sorry international conference I will talk about a little later on fathers but in Deuteronomy he says you shall teach them to your children now like I said God's, God seems to have an interest in this generation he's saying I'm, no, I'm going to reveal my secrets to Abraham because he's going to become a great nation because he's going to command his children so it seems that he, he somehow has tied destiny in these young people where he says out of the mouth of babes shall proceed praise 
like he has tight destiny there. But you see, the narrative, on the other hand, seems to suggest that anointing rests on the older, not on the younger. Uh, bringing back the remote, dancing, carrying speakers, uh, and, and other such. They cannot preach. They might mess the thing up. You, you can't entrust them with such heavy uh, mysteries of the kingdom. Yeah. Those, those are for the older generation. You know, you know what's funny though? That I was thinking about Jesus and I thought at the time at the time when they brought the, the woman who was caught in adultery and he said, those who have never sinned be the first ones to cast the stone. The Bible says they left one by one beginning with the oldest. <laughs> no wait, I've not yet said what I want to say. Here is the point. The point is... <laughs> Guys, my time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here is the point. When it came to loyalty to the cause, the young people stayed longer. <laughs> They maintained the aim. Like we must stone this person. After all the older people had left, they said, okay, I guess we can, we can also now. <laughs> we can also now go. It happened to Jesus as well, but before I get there. <laughs> I'm saying the narrative seems to suggest that it's older people. For example, give me a picture of Samuel, the prophet. That's not the one. That's me. Uh -huh. Look at him looking like he's looking. Ain't that amazing? Yeah. So most of the animations we watch and the whatever shows very old men. But when you start to search the scriptures though, uh, if you would take me to First Samuel chapter 1 verse number, the one I gave you. <laughs> They are quite like a number of verses. Uh, chapter 1. Let me, actually it's chapter 2, but let me just get you the verses. Two, uh, let's start at 2.18, sorry. Let's start at 2.18. It says, but Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as, this is while he's still in that temple. Yeah, even as a child he was in the temple ministering, right? Now give me the next one, that's 2.18. 2.21 says, And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and both three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the Samuel grew before the Lord. Now, let me ask. Did he suddenly grow and become old in that moment? I bet not. Because give me another verse. That's after that one. It says, And the child, Samuel, grew in stature and in favor both with the Lord and men. Huh? Give me that. Is there a next one? Aha. Uh -huh. Now we are in verse chapter 3. This, this all has been in chapter 2. He's still in the temple. Now when he's starting his ministry, when God comes and speaks to him and gives him prophecies and he begins his ministry, the Bible says, now the boy, Samuel, ministered to the Lord before Eli, the boy. Not the man. Not the older man, the boy. Now the historian Josephus... <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to bring Greek and Hebrew words. Just stick with me. <laughs> he seems to suggest that Samuel was around the area of 12 years old at this point. That's when you start being called a boy. He starts his ministry at 12. He is prophesying. Give me the next verse. And it says, So Samuel grew and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. This is in the same chapter. That means much of Samuel's prophetic ministry was in the areas of 12 and let's say 30. So you read through chapter 3 all the way to chapter 8, and then finally in chapter 8 verse 1, this is what the scripture says, now it came to pass when Samuel was old, 
but we somehow get the acts of Samuel between chapter 3 and chapter 8 and decide it's just an old man. But we don't realize that the part where his words were not falling to the ground were not in old age. That means you have prophets and apostles sitting in your church who you're waiting to unleash when they're in their older age. And yet right now they carry the capacity to prophesy to nations without their words falling to the ground. Does it make sense? Yeah. That means we are hiding depth in the machines. Because that was Saul's issue. Someone looked for him, he was hiding in the equipment. He's like, I cannot be king. And yet we can place depth front and center. Sit down. I, I like saying sit down. It's so cool. It's so cool. So that is Samuel. He wasn't an old man. I just picked out that example. But if you go and just search out the scriptures, you realize that many of the people that God was using were not old people. At older age, they are now supposed to be fathers, grandfathers, what, what, and the ministering ones are the young ones. For the Bible says that it is good for the youth to bear, for, for one to bear the yoke in his youth. Yeah, the work of ministry is supposed to be done in your youth, not in your old age. At that time, you're just translating and giving things to other people. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? At 12, Jesus had learned scripture. He was in the temple discussing with the, you know, the priests and the high priests and all that stuff. And the Bible then reveals to us that he begins his ministry at 30. But at 30, when he begins his ministry, he's being called rabbi. You see what I'm saying? He's being called rabbi. That means he is training others for ministry by 30. At 30, you ought to be teachers, not eating milk. <laughs> Which means if you are not a teacher yet, you are going too slow. <laughs> Sorry. But I mean, the Bible says it renews your youth as egos, but you know what I'm saying. Because that's, <laughs> that's the idea of the ministry. At 30, he's rabbi. He's not trying to figure out if this is what he wants to do with his life. No, he takes only three years and 33, he's concluded his ministry. How old are you and are you concluding your ministry or you're just starting? <laughs> Okay, okay, please go see it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so Jesus goes ahead and begins to choose disciples because he's now a rabbi. He is training others for ministry. Now give me a picture of the disciples of Jesus. Aha, uh -huh. this is the narrative that most of us grew with. There's one in the middle with real gray hair. Okay, give us another picture. Mama, 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 mama. Ma, ma. Woo, give us another picture. Woo. It's no wonder that your teenagers don't want to serve. It's for, it's for older people with big stomachs. I mean, I don't know what you need. <laughs> okay, that's too much. That was too much. That was... I'm, I'm sorry, Apostle. Please. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> please, 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 please sit down. Don't, don't attack me. <laughs> But here is the thing, the real narrative of the scripture is not what you see in the pictures. When you go to Matthew chapter 17, verse 24, 20, no, start with 24. 
The Bible says that when they had come to Capernaum or Capernaum or Capernaum, Capernaum, maybe get it up with you guys. Eh? My calling is not English, it's the word. <laughs> it says when they came, when they had come to Capernaum, those or Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And Peter responds, and she said, Yes. And when it's so funny, so they said, Does your teacher not pay temple tax? And he said, Yes. <laughs> anyway. And, <laughs> And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs and taxes? And says, From their sons or from strangers? Then Peter responds to him. Then in verse 27, Jesus says, Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. Now, when you go to the book of Exodus, chapter Exodus, chapter number 30 verse 11 this is what god tells moses about the temple tax he says then the lord spoke to moses saying blah 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 when you take the census of the children of israel for their number then every man shall give a ransom for himself to the lord when you number them that there may be no plague among them when you number them continues and says that is this is what everyone among those who are numbered shall give half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary is temple he says half a shekel, that is uh, 20 geras. The half shekel shall be an offering to the Lord. Then he says now the age group and says everyone included among those who are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering to the Lord. Peter comes to Jesus talking about the tax and Jesus says go get one piece and pay half for me and half for you. I thought Jesus had 12 disciples. So where are the 11? At least based on Exodus chapter 30. <laughs> Exodus chapter 30 shows us that it had to be 20 and above. In this case, only Jesus and Peter are 20 and above. Everyone else is 19 and under. Right? Now, Matthew chapter 17 verse 22, as I keep building my case. Now, these are the disciples that Jesus is walking with. It says, now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about, 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 underline capital letters, red, yellow, and other such colors, neon, is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. That gives you the timing of this scripture, that it is happening just before he dies. And, and then in verse 24, that's when he continues with all the temple tax story. So just before he dies, he is paying taxes for only himself and Peter. That means when he resurrects and ascends into the heavens and the Holy Spirit comes down, the Holy Spirit settles on 19 year olds and under. So the first few chapters of the book of Acts that you're reading are not old men working miracles. Those are teenagers working miracles. When the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2, and the Bible says Peter stood and preached, and the 12 stood with him, it was still just standing with Peter, preaching, and 3,000 are coming to the Lord. Meanwhile, yours are in the toilet cleaning. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Hmm? now go back and read the book of acts and then you will realize the pattern you understand even paul who came in a bit later was just about 28 to 30 years old and he came in as a father Isn't it amazing? Wow. Okay, now that I have maybe made a case for who God tends to use, allow me to segue Gwe. into the practicals. 
<laughs> wow. Okay. The time has already run fast, but I like it. Wow. <laughs> Let me say <save> way. <laughs> Now, in Worship Harvest, we have been taught a good model by our model and father, <laughs> which he learned from his model, <laughs> which is the triangle, the, the three relationships that Jesus had, up, in, out, right? Up being the relationship with his father, in being the relationship with his disciples, out being the relationship with the world. So the next practical things I'm going to share are within that triangle. And I must start with the up, and I have called it faith. So then now that you know that God uses teenagers and younger people, how then do you treat them? First, you go back to Genesis 18, where God is giving Abraham that promise. He says, he will command them in the way of the Lord. And Deuteronomy 11, 19, which we just read, where he says, these things you shall teach to your children. You cannot get your teenagers and dilute the word for them. Because they are too young to understand the concepts of scripture. No. No. Having understood that three years later, I feel like when, when Peter came in, he wasn't even 20, he was a teenager. But three years later, he was finally 20, now paying taxes. That three years later, Jesus was working with teenagers. Then you'll understand that Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8 is him preaching to teenagers. If your eyes causes you to sin, pluck it out. Cut your hand off, overdo it. When they slap you one cheek, turn the other. Those are the kinds of things he's telling them hectic stuff in fact one of those times he said um he, he called people to himself and come i think it's in john 8 come and eat my flesh and drink my blood the bible says everyone left the teenagers stayed <laughs> because he had taught them the word let me give you a case in point. In the scripture, Jesus multiplies bread and fish and dis distributes to the people. And the count shows that there were 5,000 men in that audience. Now, if you add women and children, one of the statisticians has said, statisticians, wow, has said that it's about 40,000 people that were in that place, right? And every time Jesus was teaching, he had multitudes following him, thousands of people thousands but after he left there were only 120 in the upper room why because you see that would be point number two i'm going to come back to it <laughs> so the first thing in the app is to teach them the word you give them the whole counsel you understand you don't think you don't think to yourself this might be too difficult for them you teach them to plant churches you teach them to grow ministries to disciple people to do all these different things oh yeah 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 you give them the word because now at that you want them to be the ones to plant your church but they don't have word quotient in them because they have grown up not reading the word, they have grown up watching Coco Melon and other such movies, and now they are thought they need to get the word and go plant a church, but they are not able to go plant a church. When they are younger is when you get them to memorize the word. When they are younger is when you get them to start dissecting. We started a group earlier this year with some younger people, which right now is not very active because they are all in school, what, what. And we were reading the scriptures from Genesis, and it's amazing the questions people ask. One asked at some point, why is the genealogy in the Bible? It doesn't seem to make sense. And I thought to myself, why actually? Then we came up with a good conclusion. Oh my God, it was so good. Apostle would have to invite me again for me to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the time that they should be getting the word into their system. Vera, first give me that video that I sent you.
First John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, the life is manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have heard and seen, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That was First John chapter 1. Now that girl traveled and at some point she texted me and said, I'm reading the book of First John, I'm enjoying it. When she finished it, she said, now I'm memorizing the whole book. I only could play chapter one because we don't have time for the rest of the chapters. What are you memorizing? Word. Because the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And verse 17, that, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You want them to do good works without equipping them. It's the word that equips for good works. That's why Jesus had it at 12. To have a witness. I have one witness. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. I have two witnesses. Amen. The second thing in that triangle up is faith. The second, which is in, is family. We are family. Okay. Guys, people will start thinking we are not anointed singing. <laughs> Family. Now, yesterday, let me see if I can find it in my notes. Either it was uh, uh, Bishop, Pope, Dev, something. <laughs> or it was Apostle. Angaliso. I'm trying to find that quote. I wrote it, but has refused to open. But they said something about relationship is the environment for spiritual growth. That's how they said it. The idea of teaching them the word is meant to happen in family. That's why God tells, says to Abraham, he will command his children, says you will teach your children. If they are not family, you cannot teach them. Or at least you might try, but they will not listen to you. So you have to create a family. You see, that's why Jesus was, of his disciples, he would say, my little children. Because they had become children to him. You understand what I'm saying? That's why I was saying that when you're 30, at that point, you should be a father. Because you're creating a family of people that you are discipling, spiritual or physical. Does that make sense? Because outside of that environment, it's a bit difficult for you to disciple efficiently. You get that it's meant to happen in a space of family. Now, when you think of young people, let me, let me just explain, just, just maybe hint a bit on how to create family. Because I may be there. When you think of young people, if you ever just stand in a room full of young people, you'll begin to notice that there are cliques. 
this was intentional. I just thought I discovered it yesterday. That is actually what happened. But uh, I'm saying it for the young people in the room so they don't think I had an agenda. You think you begin to notice that there are people have clicks. They 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 gravitate towards some things. Now, most of the time, how we go about our ministry is you want to go one on one and then gather those one on ones and bring them. But I feel like Jesus' model is you go for the click. You find them hanging, doing nothing, and you introduce yourself as their father. <laughs> when Apostle gave me the opportunity to lead the youth experience here at Washi Pavesnalia two years ago, about two years ago. Is it two years yet? Okay, almost two years ago. One of the things I did unintentionally is uh, after service, I walked to the cafe and found a group of young people that were sitting together. And then I went to the person at the cafe and said, go get their orders and give them whatever they want. And then I went home. I didn't tell him to tell them anything about who gave them, but he went ahead and told them who did. And then they sent me a video. Thank you, Pastor Quaker. As they're like, yeah, I'm a man of God. <laughs> After that, that became our pattern. But I don't even know how it happened, but at some point, I also entered the clique. <laughs> now if you see me with them, uh, it's like we've been together since they were born, like I changed their diapers or something. Maybe I did in the spirit. <laughs> no, seriously, because if I'm the only begotten, if Apostle was changing diapers, I was inside him. <laughs> but if you think about it that's how god chose i mean how jesus chose his disciples i'll show you a scripture let's go to john 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 chapter 1 verse 35 it says again the next day stood uh, john stood with two of his disciples and looking at, at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. That two disciples, he mentions two disciples, keep that number in your head, heard him speak, and they followed. Then Jesus turned and seeing, da 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 verse 39, he said to them, Come, and so they come, verse 40, because these people are pastors, they will go and read. Then he says, One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now we have three people who are connected. So Andrew goes ahead and divides Simon. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? So we have three people that are connected. They are in the same clique. Where are we? Aha. Uh -huh. Now let's go to 43. It says, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Eh? Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and who? Now we have four who are connected. Philip found Nathaniel. Now we have five. And he invites Nathaniel. They seem like he's just picking and choosing, but they are, they are, they are one clique. They are one gang. Hmm? Now, take me to Mark. Chapter 1, verse 16. It says, And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew. Remember the connection, we already finished it. His brother casting. Now, Mark is a very summarized fellow. He doesn't go through the details of John, of how this came up and all that. So he, he tells us about Simon and Andrew. Uh -huh. Then Jesus tells them, Follow me, I'll make you become. Blah, blah, blah. Then he makes the next. When he had gone a little further from there, a little, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother the gang that fishes together. Now we have John and, and James in the, in the group. So we have like at least seven of Jesus' disciples who are not strangers to each other. They are one gang from the same area. Do you understand? Do you see now what you should be doing with those kids who be, be playing football next to your home? That's when you go in, say, hello, I'm your father. 
Luke. No, never mind. <laughs> So you create family. Now, one aspect of family that is very necessary, I know most of you take the word to say, you might go and start telling people, I'm your father. Who are you? I'm your father. One of the aspects of family, I have a feeling, the Bible doesn't say that, but I have a feeling, it's the reason the disciples like stuck with Jesus, is just general happiness. I know, right? It doesn't seem like the real thing. But when you go to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9, C-E-V, the Bible says, you love justice and hated evil. So I, your God, this is he speaking of Jesus, have chosen you, I appointed you, and made you happier than any of your friends. When you found Jesus with his disciples, he was the happiest in that group. <laughs> <laughs> he was the happiest in that group you cannot disciple them except when you have joy because in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures evermore he says that the kingdom of god is righteousness and peace and joy in the holy ghost so now if you want them to stay around what you create family by just deciding to become happy and then you start infecting them with your happiness. I don't think that's why I do this intentionally, but I have so many dad jokes. And they love them, even if they don't love the jokes. They love the jokes! <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? So what's the first thing? Faith. Teach them the word. The second thing is create family. We are... Let me never, let me never mind. First, give me some of those nice videos that I showed you of us playing around, doing. First, wait, first pause, first pause, first pause, first pause. I need to explain this before you play it because it might annoy some people. So what happened is they were at my home. We had just finished watching a movie and then we went outside and we decided to play a game. And the game was, let's sing one song, but everyone sing your own key. And we hear how it's, it was so much fun. Now you can't play. First pause, first pause. You can tell from there who is musical by the stress on their face. <laughs> the next video, we were there in the lounge after, after finishing service. Instead of team time, uh, we, this, this, the, this video I took after a number of people had left. We decided to play Simon Says. It so, it so happens to us also musical. This time I told them to everyone sing their own song. Okay, play. It's fun. <laughs> God bless and Never mind that first beat. Someone says, Everyone sing your own song. <laughs> Stop. I, I don't think you can tell any songs in there, but it's just fun. And most of the times we're just seated at the cafe just playing cards. I win most of them. Yes, Lord. Glory! Woo! <laughs> if they win, I tell them as your father, I instruct you to let me win. <laughs> But what's amazing is even if like you have those who are a clique, 
But if you wanted to bring someone in who doesn't seem to fit in, a game is a good connector. Yeah. If they come in and they beat you, you want to know them. If they come in and they have no idea what they are doing, you want to know them. <laughs> so then you start talking to each other. It's so amazing, this family thing, that one time at Easter this year, um, <laughs> we finished the, the, the youth experience service, and we had a, usually we pre prepare snacks for the young people, and then we go and talk about the service and other such things. So this time we didn't prepare because it's Easter, you've got to go home and hang with your you know, family. And, and then we, my, my wife and I go to the lounge because I'd been preaching, I needed to rest. Um, <laughs> and let the anointing settle a bit. <laughs> <laughs> then if a few of them walk in, and I'm like, we, we, we don't have team time, go home, because I know them, they have families, and the families are not badly off. They can cook chicken and, and everything. I said, no, go home, and they're like, no, we ain't going nowhere, we're going to do our easter here so i got them from there we went to the cafe ordered and spent that time up to like 6 p.m eating pork and chips and everything as you can see from those 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 nice photos if you look at them they don't look like they came off the streets <laughs> but they chose to stay i don't go around telling them i'm your father even if i've just been telling you that kind of thing but somehow i feel like there is a connection that god creates that makes them value this relationship higher than even that of their parents because Jesus said, if you, if you want to come after me, if you don't hate your mother and father and your what and your what, you cannot be my disciple. He was telling teenagers <laughs> who stay under their parents' roofs, <laughs> who have to get permission to go with him. But he's like, if you can't hate them, you won't come after me. <laughs> it's so bad. Reminds me of a story of a young lady on fatherhood she ah, she got pregnant one of the teenagers and then she called me oh this one I asked for permission to tell it so don't go reporting me I asked I said can I tell you oh please please go ahead and and so I have permission so she called me after maybe a month or so because after she got pregnant um, the family said, you're going to be hated. Pastor Quaker will hate you. Apostle will hate you. You have disappointed them. What, 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 what? So she called me and, and, and told me what was happening. And I said, no, I don't hate you. I still love you. And I love you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Now, over that time, she started to get under the pressure of, because there was a lot of what would people think, under the pressure of aborting the child. It was so much so that a ticket was paid for, for her to come, abort, and go back. And she called me and said, I don't know what to do. I said, do not leave the country. Stay there. Your parents will come around said they might not they have already paid they said they will refund you stay put you're not removing that child she gave birth in jan the parents are excited ah they have a grandfather i'm a grandfather <laughs> when we went to visit and the mother came out she introduced us and said this is my father and that is my mother to her parents and they were not like how dare you still our children they were like thank you i'm telling that story because sometimes when you're dealing with young people such things are going to happen but they have to be able to trust you enough as a parent to them to come and tell you and you must have created a, re a discipleship relationship strong enough to make them start sometimes do things that their parents have said don't do. Because you're a person of the word. That's why I started with the app. I mean, so if you're not a person of the word, you're going to make them do the wrong stuff. Stay at church till midnight, even, your parents, even if your parents say, no, 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 some of those things you say, go home. I don't want you here, go. But there are certain things that go against values where you're going to say, no, do not do that. 
and God being on your side, he will defend you. But in that moment, you make that decision. Another one came to me. Well, I went to her. She had even this one asked for permission. This, was, this is not like as hectic as. They, we, her results came, up, came out. Uh, Pastor Vera, did you do that thing with the time that I had asked you to do? Just give me a thumbs up if that's what you did. Okay, they did. <laughs> I just want to say I'm not out of time. <clears throat> so I, she, her results came out. And then when they came out, she was, she was anxious the time when they were supposed to check. So she went home and checked and she had failed miserably. Meanwhile, in her mocks, she had done so well. So the next day, I see her around. She's not looking herself. It's like her eyes are heavy, red, what? I took her to the side and we started chatting. And I said, uh huh? So she tells me her results. And, oh my God, I don't know what I'm going to do. And this is what I wanted to do. But now I can't do the thing I wanted to do. So we started having a conversation. I said, what exactly did you say you wanted to do at campus? She tells me. Then I offer some options of how she can actually get to do what she wanted to do. By the, she had actually even told me, I'm not even going to serve this Sunday on the worship team. I'm just ah, I'm feeling somewhere. I said, you will serve, and you're going to jump the highest. Gave her options. She came back and told me. I talked with my parents. They agreed with the things that you said. This is the direction that I am taking. It's so good, I, and she's happy. That Sunday, I have a photo that I sent her. I, it's no, I'm not going to show you. She was jumping the highest on stage. If you see her, you wouldn't even think that that's what happened to her. Now, those are the only two stories I asked for permission for. If I tell any others, the people will deny me and leave the church, starting from the oldest. <laughs> but that's the benefit of creating family. Yeah. It's not just for the good stuff. It's not just for them to memorize scripture. It's that where they are down in the gutters, you're able to go down there with them and help them come out and remind them that you are not the thing you're experiencing. How do you do that, minus family? Finally, I had one more point, but finally, let me just skip the point and go to the finally. The okay let's let's do the out let's do the out okay the out is function because i was trying i was really looking for a synonym for mission and i'm like function that's so good not like a wedding function or anything the thing that you do is while you create the word and give them family they ought to get mission jesus said follow me and i will make you become when he tells yeah fishers he gives them purpose. He gives them mission. Do you understand what I'm saying? It means that if you just have your up and your family, at some point they are going to get tired. They are going to be like, I don't want to, I don't want to go there. So never mind. <laughs> they are, it's the young people who teach me these things. So the one who is memorizing scriptures, I was already telling her, you have only four years there. You better come back when there are churches. You can't, you, you come back without churches, I'll deny. No, I didn't say that. I won't deny. She's now grappling with the notion of starting a mission or community and starting to plant churches. I, let me tell you, in four years, yeah, we shall have some churches in Cyprus. Yeah. We shall. We shall. Oh, yeah. Because they have to have some sort of, get them out on the mission field while they are still here. Get them to start MCs. Some of them are still being stubborn, but to, by force, by fire. Ah, ah. <laughs> but you give them purpose, you give them function. So it's faith, family, function. Amen. And now the finally, because I think I have like five more minutes. The finally is this in Second Corinthians, is it Second Corinthians or First Corinthians? First Corinthians three six. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Then the other verse, 7. No, 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 the other, I think it's um, 
First go to 10, we see. Are you finding it? Okay, let me, let me find it for you. Okay. The verse before. Then, uh, so he says, for we are God's fellow workers and you are God's field, you are God's building. The thing of discipling young people or discipleship of any part is not a one-man job. Paul planted, Apollos watered. God gave the increase. That much as I'm telling you some stories that I'm like, oh my God, you have to understand. Like the way Apostle has, uh, has organized uh, this ministry around young people is we have about three categories. We have um, the, the, the Christ generation, which is the teenagers that are led by the very efficient Pastor TJ. And then we have the movers and shakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That are led by, as you can hear them, they always want to make sure people know they are there. <laughs> that are efficiently led by Pastor Ruth. Uh, you saw her yesterday on the screens. And then we have the catalysts who are the university students that are efficiently led by Pastor Esther Folk who was singing here. Now, I just happened to lead the service that gathers all those. Now, the things, the parts where I would have failed, there are other people who are actually making the work happen. Do you understand? That if we are two fathers, TJ and I, and someone wanted to say something and they were scared to approach me, they can go to him. If they were scared to approach him, they can come to me. If they are scared to approach a apostle, they can, like there's people, because the Bible says all are yours. Whether Cephas, whether Peter, whether Apollos, whether who, 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 all are yours. That's why we exist. So it's that you have to understand that you are co-laboring with multitudes of people to make the work happen. Does that make sense? Because if you try to do it on your own and you're like me, I'm the pastor, you're going to fail very terribly. At some point, you have to realize that the thing has failed me. Let me take it to another authority that can handle. That is why that mother brought her two teenagers and said, Jesus, this one, I want him on the right hand. This one, I want him on the left hand. Take them, Chabagara. No wonder Jesus called them sons of thunder. They were very crazy. Let's call fire so that we burn down the city. It's such a crazy people. The mother was like, no. Mm. Mm. The way prophet Angela handed me to apostle. <laughs> Amen. Have you learned something? Now, in the last minutes of the time that I have, I would like to bring you some of the younger people to just, you know, for you to see um, what they are doing. As I do that, I would like to take the podium away because there might be some falling and getting slain. Someone bring me anointing oil. Oh, no, I'm just, I'm just, just joking. Yeah. <laughs> um, they're going to do for you a song. And, uh, and that will be it. I will not be coming back. Okay, thank you.
Is it back? Oh, well. We shall not be moved. We shall not be shaken. We shall not be shaken. Hey. What was that from Pastor Quaker? Wow. Pastor Quaker, who knew? Where are you? Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> that you could deliver such deep revelation with so much playfulness. Wow. We are truly blessed. So thank you so much, Pastor Quaker for that amazing and powerful delivery. And now we have a story from another young person. Wow. Oh, yes. Let me hear some noise. You've been seeing him here heckling. Now he's going to, you know, preach to us. You're going to tell us your testimony. Pastor Bonnie Bahati, by the way, is his name. Yes. Thank you so much. For... From the Greater Love Church in Kenya. Mm-hmm. Yes, and he's here to share his personal multiplication story. Sure. Yeah, that's what we're calling it. He's going to tell you a little bit about what has happened in his ministry since the last proclaimed gathering. Over to you, Pastor Bonnie. Good morning. Good morning. I think it's still morning. Good morning. As you've heard, my name is Pastor Bonnie Bahati. One more time, my name is Pastor Bonnie Bahati. Can I say Pastor hey. Bonnie? I for Bonnie. <laughs> I for Bonnie. So my name is Pastor Bonnie, as you've heard. I'm from Kenya. And I'm part of the Harvest Family Ministries. Yes. That is led by our founder, Pastor Jimmy Masharia. Give it up for my founder. Give it up for Pastor Jimmy. I think wow. you can do better than that for my founder. Oh, really, guys. Thank you. So I'll go straight to the point. I lead a movement that is part of Harvest Family. It's called the Greater Love Church. Our focus is young adults, people in the universities, and uh, people who are newly married. 
now that we are also newly married. So Pastor Jimmy introduced us to Proclaim. I think, they, yeah, last year. So when we came, we had some things going for us. We knew shepherding. Shepherding is discipleship. But we realized that when we came from Proclaim, we got the language that would help us multiply. So it happened that while we were here, we realized that what we need to do is to get the language for multiplication. Because multiplication happens if there's language. And that is what Proclaim gave us. Wow. So last year while we were here, we had roughly around 120 cells. And by this time, this year, we have 327 wow. cells. Wow! More than double. That's more than 100%. More than 100. Wow. So we also had roughly around uh, 120 shepherds. Now we have 668 shepherds. That includes the she assistant shepherds and wow. the shepherds in training. Yes. Then we also got to learn on how to plant churches in a more easier way where you start through the cells or what we call the missional communities, then the church eventually grows to become a church. And we did that, and so far we have around, I think now, 10 churches. Yes. Uh, we added four more from last year. From six to 10. From six to 10. If I were you guys, eh, I would be standing by now. Really, I would. Because what he's sharing is not normal. Go sure. ahead, Pastor Bonnie. The number two, my pastor, also after they met with Apmo, introduced us to some books from Apmo. So he gave, he, my pastor gave me Apmo's number and told me, told me, maybe ask him if you can get the books. So one of the books, then Apmo connected me to Pastor Aji from Come Nairobi. Come Pastor Agi. Give it up for Pastor Agi. <laughs> pastor Agi delivered the books to me. And one of the books that caught my attention was the church finances book. And I'll tell you in a minute why I'm, I'm going into that particular story. You know, when you're leading young people, our pastor likes to say, the Bible says that the gospel is to the poor. One of the poor people whom the gospel is for is young people. Young people don't have money. <laughs> their, their offering cannot, cannot do much per se, in yeah. quote. But now, in Apostles' book, the church finances book, he explains the separation principle. You know the separation principles? Oh, yes. Where 20% goes to saving, 10% tithe, and all, all the other quadrants. So we started applying that. So it happened that even though these people were poor, they were still giving. Yeah. They were giving in little quantities, but they were giving. So we started applying the 20% quotient of everything that comes in, we have to save 20%. And then my pastor said that the church that I lead must buy land. And land in Kenya is expensive. It's like $170,000. And, uh, $170,000. $170, so it happened that after starting to apply the 20% quotient, by the time we were paying for the first installment, we had close to $100,000. Wow. Oh, my goodness. After a set of from young people, from young people, from students, from students. Wow, so, amazing! So we've been in the process of purchasing that land, but I can attribute it to that that book helping me know how to separate the finances of the church, and then my pastor in, insisting that even if they are young, they must buy land. Yes, because that's giving them purpose. That's giving them a, a place to call home. So basically, that has been our, our multiplication story. We've seen God help us. We've seen us move from close to uh, just, a hand, just a slightly above 100 shepherds to 668 shepherds, and now to 10 locations. And we are believing God. We have a vision right now. We are moving towards, we call it the 5,000 children of God. We Yay. are trying to move to 5,000 children of God. Right now, we are at around 1,500 children of God. Wow. So we are believing God to move to... 5,000. 5,000. Amen. And then we also have another one for shepherds. We are believing God to have 1,000 shepherds. So far, we are at 668 shepherds. Wow. Let's give it up for Pastor Bonnie. What a testimony. What a testimony. Thank you so much, Pastor Bonnie, for sharing that story. I'm sure we're all going to take something away from this proclaimed conference. Don't leave without some action points so that you can be on this stage testifying 
in 2025. Let's give it up again for Pastor Bonnie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, what a yeah. story. What, a, what story. a story. And because I know Pastor Bonnie's story is just a bit, uh, one of the things that I know is that uh, our good bishop, uh, Pastor Jimmy, actually started with him at the level that Pastor Waikweka was actually speaking about. I believe it was about 22, if you don't mind. So he was about 16 years old and he's been working with him for how many years now? 13 years. Wow. So, uh, anyone from Makerere University tell us how many years Pastor Bonnie is now. <laughs> but anyway, he actually started at that age. And so, by now, uh, you know, 13 years later, you can be able to see the fruit that is coming out of this. And as the network is expanding, you know how I've been told, it's not just Pastor Jimmy now speaking, but Pastor Jimmy has opened up his network so that now Apmo is yours. You know, the Ferguson is yours. All these people are yours. Yep. And you're able to be built up by fathers like that. That's a good wow, thing. Can we just yes. appreciate the work that is being done here. Amen. Amen. And now it's time for a break. Who's ready for that break? Yes. <laughs> the hands have gone up very quickly. Before we have the break. Yes. Yeah. So if, oh, during the break, again, remember, yeah. uh, keep sanitizing your hands. This uh, red eye uh, stuff is, you know, like red alert. It's serious. So kindly keep uh, sanitizing your hands. We have the different washrooms uh, that are at, at the back. Uh, on that side, there are washrooms there on all levels, three levels up there. The stories uh, are there, uh, behind the stage as well. On this side, there are stories, uh, of washrooms on each of the floors as well. But during the break, one of the things I want to invite you to do is to go out and meet some of our, our sponsors of this uh, experience. There are people who have been able to partner, not just by attending or sending people, but by giving financially towards this as well. And we have different levels yes. uh, of people who have been able to give towards this. Yes, we have some platinum sponsors. I said them yesterday, but we're going to go over them again. We have Old Mutual Investment Group Uganda Limited, commonly known as UAP. Yes, why don't we clap for them? They have sponsored us very heavily, hence the name Platinum. We also have the multi-trillion dollar harvest multi-purpose cooperative. Yes. <laughs> And we, of course, have Goldmine Finance. Those are our platinum sponsors. We really should clap for them because they have made the Proclaim Gathering what it is, what you're experiencing. Yes, we have some gold sponsors as well. We have Harvest Institute. I believe uh, most of the people here uh, who have been uh, at Worship Harvest have been able to go through that. We have Harvest International School as well. And we have sweetly defined as some of our gold sponsors uh, for this year's gathering uh, at Proclaim. Amen. And now, I just want to make one more announcement before we go out to the break. We have, oh, okay. We have a medical desk at the back of the auditorium. In case anyone needs medical attention, just go to the back of the auditorium to, you, to my right, um, next to the guest experience command table. There's a desk where you can get any medical attention that you might need, yes. And now I'd like to invite Apostle Mose to make an announcement. Please, please have your seats. Yeah, uh, as they were talking about the sponsors, I was reminded that you have an opportunity to be a sponsor. Amen. Ah. What a shock. Shock or what? So you have an opportunity to be a sponsor. A major sponsor. Plat they say they are platinum sponsors. You can be beyond platinum. And here is how we are going to do it. Before lunch, before lunch, we will give you an opportunity to give an offering. Amen. Yeah, I can tell you on good authority that your ticket that you paid for the conference only covers a small percentage of the cost. So we'll give you an opportunity to give an offering, but I'm just preparing you so that you prepare it uh, between now and 
that time around two o'clock. So you have about four hours to call your attorney in case you need to transfer large amounts of money. Uh, so just before lunchtime, we are going to take an offering. We'll take cash, mobile, and other available options. And so in case you need to prepare for that, I just thought I would let you know ahead of time. Amen. Is, is that a good thing? Wow, thank you so much, Apostle, for the opportunity for us to come, not just to receive, but to be givers as well. That's a good thing, right? Very good thing. Yes, so now we'd like to be able to send you off so that you can be able to partake of that uh, refreshment. So let me invite all our delegates with the black lanyards kindly. Uh, be up on your feet. Let's follow uh, Pastor Cindy, uh, who will be able to take us to the place to enjoy refreshments. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for allowing us to learn from you. Uh, as leaders of different communities and uh, uh, networks and movements. You've done well and we celebrate you guys for that. Yes. And as we leave the room, I'd like to remind us that we are on social media. Yes. Proclaim is trending on social media. Be part of that trend by posting your experiences posting your selfies the hashtags are hashtag proclaim 2024 and hashtag worship harvest so keep doing that keep doing that through the break and uh keep the social media handles alive with proclaim all right yeah now i'll request the delegates with the red lanyards to be up on the feet as well we can use this other door on this side
Good morning, everyone. It's time to come back to the room. The break is ending, so I'd like all of us to start moving back into the room. Let's make our way back into the room, guests on the slab and in the overflow. Let's make our way back into the room. I'm sure the break has been great, but it's now time to come back in. Thank you. Guest experience team, we need your help to call everyone back into the room. It's time. Guest experience team. Good morning. Welcome back from the break. Good morning. Please get up on your feet. Get up on your feet. And get ready to dance and worship the Lord. Amen. You have a new identity in Christ. Come on, get up on your feet. Hey. Tell your neighbor, I have a new identity in Christ.
Jesus, you are free. I'm loving you, I In the name of Jesus, you're redeemed. I'm loving you, I Then you say, you're done, you're saying, let's go. I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Each day
come on, let's celebrate them. Wow. What? Hey. Look at your neighbor. If they are not sweating, tell them you're doing something wrong. If you're not sweating, something is off with that picture. Something is completely, completely wrong. Wow. Turn to the person standing on the other side and ask them, can your youth church even? Can your youth even? <laughs> is it getting personal? <laughs> Look at the person behind you and tell them, can your adults worship him even? Can your adults worship him even? <laughs> what? Well, come on, let's celebrate those young people for that amazing time that they've given us today. That has been so good. Are you ready for the next session? Have you enjoyed your break? Are you ready to engage? Oh, come on, give it up for Pastor Ari on stage and the team on stage. They're going to be leading us on a session called The Other Seat. Welcome, Pastor Ari. Proclaim 2024! You're sounding as if you didn't have breakfast. Proclaim 2024! You may have your seats. Thank you so much for coming for Proclaim 2024. We have awesome men of God with me here. Please give them a hand clap. We are going to talk about the other seat. Now people were asking me in the break, what's the other seat? Is it some word that we missed in the scriptures? The other seat is the core lead, the support role, the person who is right besides the leader of the movement, the leader of the church, the assistant, the deputy, the person who does that role, they lead in their own right, but they are a core lead to the leader of the movement, the church. Does that make sense? So I have two awesome gentlemen here who are going to tell us what's it, what it's like to be in the other seat, what kind of attitude you need to have, what kind of, how do you need to manage the relationship with your leader, how do you lead upwards, all of that. And so please... Join me and welcome these awesome men of God with a hand clap and with a shout of praise. Gentlemen, please introduce yourselves to the people. Tell us who you are, where you serve, in what capacity you serve under, how long you've been there. Just a little bit about yourselves. Hello, Proclaim 2024! All right. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you, Apostle, for having us here to share today. My name is Femi Alade Somi. I'm from Global Harvest Church, Nigeria. Uh, hallelujah. I serve under my parents, Pastors Victor and Jumokadi Yemi, who are here also at this conference. Amen. All right. So, I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor of the headquarters church and I also have oversight of the network of churches that we have under my parents and the Lord. So I serve as the director of pastoral care is what we call it, but that's, that's where I serve. And by God's grace, I've had the privilege of serving in that role for about 20 years now. Wow. Uh, so, yes. Wow. Thank you, Pastor Femi. Pastor Boni. My name is Pastor Boni Bahati. Thank Woo! you. I am a pastor in the Harvest Family Nation or the Harvest Nation, but I lead a movement called the Greater Love Church or the Greater Love Nation. It's part of the Harvest Family Movement. And I also assist Pastor Jimmy in other various capacity. I assist him in the Jimmy Masharia Ministries and in the Harvest Family Nation as a whole. Yeah. Awesome. So tell us, what kind of attitude do you need to have to be in the other seat, to be the colleague, to be the support role. What kind, of, what, what, what kind of person do you need to be? What kind of attitude? What kind of calling is that? Yeah. Just break it down for us, for people here who are wondering, 
Am I doing the right thing the way I serve the lead pastor? Am I trying to overtake them? Am I trying to be the leader? Has God called me to be the leader? Break it down for us. So first of all, I would like to start by saying an assistant is not a lesser role. That's a mindset all of us need to have. An assistant is not less. An assistant is not lower. You are not less of a human being. You're not less of a leader. You're not less of a, of a disciple. You're not less of anything just because you assist. In fact, you are one of the most important people in the movement. And I'll give you an example in the scripture. The Bible says, I'll read it for you if you don't mind. Ezekiel. The Bible says in Exodus 31 that God appointed Belzalel to be an assistant to Moses. And the Bible says that God gave him all skill, craft, and integrity to be able to do everything that the Lord commanded Moses. So you see, God commanded Moses. But who was supposed to do it? Belzalel. Bezalel. So Belzalel was not any lesser in the order of God. However, God had decided to pick a head. And after picking the head, God decided he's going to appoint, quote, unquote, the hands for him. Yeah. So an assistant is basically more of the hands of the head. Yeah. And is there a body that can function without hands? No. no. So that's the kind of attitude an assistant must have. Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. Right? <laughs> Nobody can function without the hands. Thank you. Awesome. Pastor Femi. Yes, miss. So just to add to that, uh, Pastor Bonnie, we, we also remember that being an assistant is not you lying in wait to take over. Ah. Yeah. No. It's not a coup d'etat. Ah. It's not a coup d'etat. Yeah. You're not trying Man. to scheme the man of, or the woman of God out of the role so you can get there. No, Massive. That's, Massive. that's not the assignment. In fact, when you do your job well or you, you serve well, what you will find out is that you will be fulfilling God's call for your life yeah. in your obedience to the assignments that you've been That's given. True. Yeah, because as a matter of fact, if you, if you now become the head by force, you hijack something or you go to create something by force, what you discover now is that you're creating what God, you're building what God did not build, yeah. you're functioning out of purpose, and a lot of times some people have gotten into trouble yeah. by going to start something, just wanting to be the head, yeah. But that's not God's call for their lives. The, the neck can't say, no, I want to be the head now. Then there's going to be a problem. Just yeah. to say that, yeah. Wow. Pastor Bonnie, you mentioned something about humility when yeah. we were talking. What's the function and what's the, how does humility come in? What, what kind of posture of humility do you need to take to be, to function in the other seat? The best example of an assistant is a wife. A wife hey. is the best example of an assistant. And an, a wife who is not humble is different from a wife who is humble. Mm. Now, as an assistant, you need to know that you are taking the form of a wife. That means that you must learn to die so that your head can live. What does that mean? That means that you must learn to realize that even though God has called you, yeah. even though there's a calling of God over your life, yeah. that calling will only be expressed if you remain submitted to yeah. the head that God gave you. Yeah. That's the place of humility. Yeah. A lot of people think that you only get to fulfill your calling if you go on your own way. For example, in my case, God has called me to my generation. I'm fulfilling my calling. Yes. But I'm fulfilling my calling under another man's calling. calling oh, yeah. yes. That's why yes. I gave you the example of Belzelal. He was called to support Moses. But God had called him. The calling had come from who? From God. So Belzalel must realize that the calling has come from God. But this calling will only be expressed in the calling of Moses. So what is your responsibility? Your responsibility is to run to realize that you must go under. You must be submitted. Yeah. You must be humble. Yeah. And the Bible is about he that humbles himself will be exalted. And he that exalts himself will be humbled. So in other words, the kingdom of God is a kingdom of reverse. Mm. That if you want to be exalted, you right. have to go down. Hey. If you want to go up, you must go down. If you want to receive, you must give. Yeah. 
If you want to be forgiven, you must forgive. So that's how the kingdom of God operates. So an assistant who wants to be exalted must learn to be submitted. He must learn to go down. Yeah. Pastor Bonnie, you speak very well. And it sounds like you've always been that very good oh colleague. <laughs> you never gave Pastor Jimmy any headaches. <laughs> you've always been a very good, you know, support role. Is that the case? Have you always been? Tell us, you know, break it down because I see people's faces. They are wondering. <laughs> I think I'm the best. I, I, We're are you, yeah, break it down. Give <laughs> us a story. Tell us an example. But have you always been like this? I am not a good assistant. I am one of the most unqualified and very stubborn. It's not like I'm talking from a place of perfection. I'll give you an example. My pastor is a strong leader. Give it up for my pastor. Hey. And him being a strong leader, well, like you told us yesterday, strength is irritated by weakness. So him being a strong leader, he expects you to have a certain level of strength when he's leading you. So my pastor will come and rebuke you when you, my pastor does not know how to take prisoners. He will rebuke you <laughs> where the thing has happened. If the thing has happened in the auditorium, he will finish with you in the auditorium. So I remember one time he came to me. He doesn't call you for meetings. He doesn't, <laughs> he's personal, I know. He doesn't call you for private interviews and tell you, you, I would like to see you, or send you an email, in the, see me in the boardroom at this time. No, he deals with you where that thing has happened. So one time, I don't know what I had done, but I remember how the experience was, which I think is the most important. <laughs> so we were lingering outside. I think I was around 18, 19, uh, almost 20. Then I had, my pastor does not like people around him who have an attitude. And I had an attitude. I was not happy, I was not smiling. Hey. We were lingering, everybody is enjoying. I don't know how the thing turned on me. And I was told, you cannot be here and you're not happy. So he, he, he dealt with me. And of course, you know how if he deals with you, you'll be dealt with. <laughs> but nonetheless, I now see myself doing the same things he used to do. So the rebukes that you get are not supposed to kill you. Yeah. The rebukes are supposed to make you. In fact, there's even another re most recent one, just last year in the meeting. We were having a good meeting. Everything was going well. Then I think I answered what I shouldn't answer. Masi, but I answered masi. in a way to show like I'm not interested. Masi, masi, masi. And you can tell what happened. Oh my God. <laughs> tell us what happened. <laughs> I just remember him standing and the rest is my te tears were flowing. <laughs> and the next thing is, can everybody leave my sight? <laughs> but here I am, because I learned that my leader is not out to kill me. In fact, that's my wife who helped me learn that. I yeah. used to feel that my leader wants to finish me. Yeah. <laughs> I felt that my leader... <laughs> it's getting personal. <laughs> I used to feel that my leader is out to almost finish me. But my wife helped me put it into context because my pastor used to tell us, the Bible says the one that I love is the one that I chastise. Yes. So if your pastor is not chastising you, he's not loving you. Awesome. Pastor Bonnie, that's Amen. awesome. Thank you. Pastor Femi, you had told me so many stories about what it's like to be in the co-lead role and support the man of God. Just tell us what kind of attitude, how do you manage that relationship, What's it like practically? Just, just share from your heart. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, ma'am. The, the first thing is to get to understand what your leader wants from you. I think we, we have a gap sometimes between what is expected and what is being done. In fact, a lot of times people, especially if people come to you from working with somebody else, they could then come in and think, oh, this is the way it should be done, and that is that. No, because each person is different, and, and how they like things presented is different. In fact, if you have to, something as simple as email voice and content is different from person to person. You're replying in on someone's behalf, the particular way they like to get it done. So it's important you get to know what is expected from you, and, and I think you should clarify from time to time how well you're doing. And, and the, the problem with that is a lot of times people don't clarify or 
um, get to find out how they're doing, they wait for the leader to have to call them. I mean, you've done so many things and your leader says, oh my God. And then by the time you get it, you get the full brunt. But it's beautiful when I can walk up to my parents and say, Dad, how was that? How, how am I doing? And then that posture lets them know you're ready to hear it. Yeah, that's you yes. know, because, because sometimes as a parent, you also deal with children a bit differently. Okay, so you want to love upon them and all, but the one that lets you know that, let me know what's in your heart. Let me know. I want to know what you want to do. I want to know, mom, are we doing good? Is this okay? You don't hold back from that kind of person. You pour and you pour, and the more of their hearts that you know, the better your performance will be. So I think everyone should really seek to clarify their roles, find out what's going on in their heart. And just to pinch in, uh, pinch in with what uh, Pastor Bunny just said about this idea of correction and rebuke, the truth of the matter is God will put you on the leadership to make you better. Yes. Yeah, because there's an attitude, I'm here to make this organization better. In fact, I had the young guy who came into work with me once, and I needed help badly with getting things done. We were doing fine as a family. And I should say, you know how the church is both a family and an army? Yeah. So we were doing well on the love side and everything, but in terms of execution, I wanted a little more help to get the things done. So this guy comes in, and day one, is harassing this person, is harassing that person. I say, wait, 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 come, 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 come. Um, I said, love is the foundation of everything we do here. Yeah. So when you rebuke, rebuke in love, correct, and stay on it, but I want that done this way so that at the end of the day we can get the job done now that doesn't mean we can't correct that doesn't mean because some people now take that to the extreme they say i'm working in the church office um and i'm working with my pastor why is he rebuking me your pastor is not just your shepherd now he's your boss and i want to add that to you because it means that comes with instructions with rebuke with the entire package so yeah the entire package so that we don't mix things up now that we're even learning discipleship I'm not just a worker. I'm not just a member. It's more now, complicated. It's, it's, it, it's, it has to come that way. So just to broaden that scope of how to deal with it, when we hear people, our leaders, correctors, instructors, shaping us, insist that we do things right. Yeah, it's important. It's part of our development because some people have the attitude, I'm here to do this ministry good. So I am good already. I'm just here to make them better. You're also here to learn and to become a better human being and a person. Maybe one more thing, Rev Ma, if that would be okay. I just want to say, proximity brings a lot of familiarity. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. And everyone who is in the other seat need to watch out for that. Because you get to see everything that nobody else sees. It's like the boys who saw their father naked. You have to be in the room to see that. Yeah. So what do you do with that? There's yes. a generation that's quick to go on Twitter, on Facebook, yes. and all what not, TikTok. saying nonsense. I mean, the other day we were in the office with one of my guys, and I rebuked him for something. Next thing, I don't even check status normally, but the Holy Ghost hey. <laughs> the picked up his status, and I read something he wrote. I was so upset. And I called him the other day. I said, are you joking? Do you want to get fired? Because the next level is you, you have to go. Because I, we can't deal with stuff here. And you're, you're writing stuff on social media. Yeah. And you're the one leaking all the family secrets. It's, it's nonsense. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Mom. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Pastor Femi, thank you. What you're saying is that to be in the other seat, you have to have some level of discretion. Yeah. You have to have some level of of um, loyalty, loyalty. Yeah. you have to be a certain kind of person you yeah. can't just be that kind no, of person you can't just be like an pastor Bonnie, you look like you want to say something yeah, i wanted to add on to what he said concerning the church being several things at, at the same time the first thing a church is is a church is a family number two the church is an army and number three the church is an organization so it's very important to dance according to the rhythm if you're in the rhythm of family be a family. Behave like a son. Yes, sir. Behave like a child. In my case, when it is family time, I'm playing golf with my leader because he's a golfer. So he'll invite me in. What a golfer. Woo. Thank you very much. I'm very skilled. <laughs> so he'll invite me in to play golf with him. It will, be ve it will be one of the most useless things to do is to try and bring the organization's things in the family time. Because one, one role of an assistant is you must learn to be good company. 
Can you imagine we start discussing budgets at the golf course? Uh -uh. Why did he invite me? But in your mind, you think that you are being a good assistant. But you don't know to dance according to the rhythm. Yeah. Number two, the church is an army. In the army, you are dealing with a, gen a general. In this phase, the general is giving orders. Like in my case, when I was told you when I was being rebuked, I was dealing with a general. So at that time, it's for me to suck. I remember one time he told me, when I tell you something that is harsh, suck it in and do what you need to do. That's a general. I don't expect him to, to try and tell me the right thing or what I need to do with emotions. He will tell me that in the family area. And at the same time, we are an organization. That means there is order. Yeah. So I believe, and as an assistant, you must have a family-grade love, a military-grade discipline, wow. and an organizational-grade order that, that for the work to move. That is good. Hey. No, I will not repeat. Your man is finished. <laughs> Pastor Bonnie, that's very interesting. I was thinking about myself in those three different roles. In the family role, I'm a wife to Apostle Mose. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Woo! In the organization role, you are an employee. I'm an employee. Order. Order is order. Yes. I'm a network leader. I'm a, 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 I'm a pastor of a church. Yeah. What was the other thing? Ami. Ami. Yes. So for me, it's many things. Yes. And so I've had to learn to put on different hats yeah. in different spaces. Yeah. So when we come to work and we are in a meeting and we are network leaders and maybe something has gone wrong and they are blasting us, I can't pull out my wife's hat. I am your wife. Yeah. If I've done something wrong, I've done something wrong. <laughs> Don't take it home. I don't take it home. Don't yeah. starve the man of God. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I own the clothes. Yeah. <laughs> so, sometimes I may be rebuked in the meeting. What I cannot do is have a bad attitude. I have to suck it in, take it in, have a great attitude, accept discipline, move on. But then what that means for me is I have to be working extra hard because I know that if my husband has to rebuke me in public, it will be very difficult for him. That's yeah. true. So I have to make things easy for him yeah. by doing my job very, very well. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank High you. level of wisdom. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. And then when... <laughs> Woo! <laughs> and then... When I have to be rebuked, <laughs> when I have to be rebuked and I take it in, I can't take that atmosphere home. When we are at home, we are at home. Yes, we you left are those things, uh, Yes, we left those things at work. Yes. So for those of us who are married, you can't now start bringing those things into the bedroom because you rebuked me at home. Oh, oh, no, oh. No, no, no. Why is the salary no. late? Why is the salary delayed? <laughs> well, I hear why is the salary delayed. <laughs> There's no food tonight. <laughs> and I think for us ladies, because we are the more emotional between the guys and the ladies, we have the opportunity to take away that whole attitude thing. You can't pull your mouth. You can't have some winter around yourself. You can't uh, Make the house cool. give, one, give one word answers, yeah. yes, no, I don't know. Mm. Mm. Uh, mm. Mm. I'm tired. I'm tired. I have a headache. You know the kitchen where it yes. is. Suspension, yes. The food is in the kitchen. The food is yeah. in the kitchen. Hey. And while you are making tea, make some for me. Yeah. I have a backache. The man of God is on suspension for two weeks. Hey. You're shaking tables. <laughs> I'm shaking tables. Getting personal. <laughs> Please have your seats. Please have your seats. From the from the where the men are standing up, it seems you're shaking tables. The, the ladies, we have some work to tell do. Tell them some more. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're a pastor's wife, if you're a pastor's wife. By 
by default, you're in the other seat and you have the opportunity to be joyful, to have a great attitude, to bring all of that home and yet to work in the ministry and support the man of God. Wow, wow. And I believe, maybe you can say something. Pastor Mom was about to say something. Pastor Femi, I was going to say that you said something really good about honor. Because of familiarity yes. and being close and yes. proximity, yes. tell us about honor and how it comes into play in this relationship. Awesome. Thank you, Revma. I think we remember that we are working with God's servants in different capacities. And so even though we get familiar, we know more intimate things, that we have to, first of all, maintain the attitude of honor from our hearts. And, and I think it starts with knowing that you can take it for granted. I think if you don't even know that can happen, then you're already in trouble. If you don't know the closer you get to someone, you could start taking them for granted, that familiarity could be content, then you are already on the wrong side. So know in your heart. Number two, practice honor things, like sowing your seed regularly, praying for your man of God or your woman of God, speaking well of them. Uh, speaking well of them and I want to just on that speaking well sometimes because you're close to you know your, your leaders people try to draw things out of you sometimes they come and just it, it looks like it's not a big they say how is Reverend Victor today so how is he doing and the man is not is happy yeah you know and and they're, they're, they're trying to just pull things so you have to know that you must protect those things and maintain the right heart towards them, even in the face of rebuke, maintain the right heart. And I think I want to just speak with that also on sincerity, because a lot of times people don't work with sincere hearts. If somebody asks you, how are we doing? Now, your leader is giving you the opportunity for a feedback, um, and you should say it respectfully, because sometimes people also tell us, I don't, I, I, Paul, I've, don't let me even get into Paul rebuke Peter, but that, that just the idea that um, I, can, I can correct my leadership. No, you appeal to leadership. You cannot rebuke leadership. You, you, it matters. Thank you. Yeah, Pastor it matters. Femi, Pastor yes. Femi, just say that slowly and then give us an example because right. that's a very important point. Thank you. So I, thank you, Revma. I, I was working directly with Pastor Jimmy um, as an intern to take over the church from her. And one of the things she taught us was you must appeal to leadership. You cannot rebuke leadership. And that means if something is wrong and I have opportunity to say something about it, it matters how I present the point. Even when I have suggestions, Pastor Bonnie gave us a little example yesterday that somebody walked up to him and if somebody had walked up to him and said, that tree, we need to cut it, is disturbing the church. You're talking to your leader like that. He said he will tell them, plant more trees there just to make the point. You can't talk, you, you don't talk to leadership like that, you know. So, because, and, and sometimes, remember, a leader could be wrong. Um, sometimes we, a leader takes a decision and it doesn't work well. The fact that we were in a meeting and maybe you made, give a different opinion and now that other thing didn't work, we don't start going like, <laughs> you know, I told them, I, I told, I told them. them, you yeah. know, uh, they, they won't just listen and all. No, we, we, we don't do that. So, we, it's very important that we keep that honor keep guarding it keep protecting it keep praying for your leaders it will help your heart and revma i also want to talk about couples that lead because I, i'm i'm in that position yes okay um you cannot honor one without the other yeah i'll say that again you can't honor one without the other your 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 leaders if you're serving a man who is married or a woman who is married you can't say you honor the woman without honoring her husband because you're a fraud they're, they're, they're even born yeah. as a that's their choice yeah, that's their choice yeah. the person made the choice and they are one so it must be the two of them you can't have oh the woman of god is my person but that man uh, no you're, you're wrong it must go with them with the family and everything that goes with them i think i'd just like to say that wow 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 i was telling you while he was speaking i remembered something that pastor jimmy taught me many years ago that helps me remain sane, not to become familiar. Do you know what is the cardinal qualification of being a Judas? Closeness. The cardinal qualification of being a Judas is closeness. Mm. The closer you are, the more qualified you are 
to become a Judas. Mercy, Lord. Mercy, 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 mercy. That's why Judas was the one in charge of the finances. He was so close. But who took Jesus to the cross? Judas. So the closer you are, the more wiser and the more careful you should be not to become a Judas. Judas says are not people in the crowd. Judas says are people in the front seat. Massy, massy, massy. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not in any way. I was thinking of going to the back when we get down now, because this front seat. Do you, but you get my point. Yeah. So the closer you are, the more circumspective, and the more sincere, and the more genuine you should be. Because one way of killing familiarity is being genuine. I love him for who he is. I don't love him because of this ministry. Yes. Even if this ministry was not there, yeah. I would still be with him. Yes. And if I would be with him, what would I do to him? I would love him. Yes. That helps you kill familiarity. Amen. Because familiarity comes in when you start playing role plays. We are in church, so I should behave like this. We are at home, so I should behave like this. We are here, so I should behave. When you have those role plays, you will always fall into familiarity. But when you realize that I love him genuinely at yes. home, I love him at home the same way I love him in church, the same way I love him when we travel. You will, in a way, it has helped me overcome being familiar because I'm always dealing with the same person. I'm not putting different. I'm not putting him in different rooms. Yeah. yeah. Proclaim 2024. Can you give it up for these men of God who have been so kind to take us through the other seat? Wow, thank you so much, Pastor Ari, Pastor Bonnie, and Pastor Femi. Let's give it up for them one more time. Wow, such good information. And this is actually going to be, this discussion is going to be furthered in a breakout session. So if you'd like to join that breakout session, I think you're going to need more seats, actually, Pastor Ari. After this, you're definitely going to get a little more information about the other seat. So now I'd like to welcome a minister who has an amazing, amazing, amazing ministry in the ministry of voice, Pastor Talent. You may please have your seats. Lord, I hate to take your time Cause you've had before There are questions on my mind I can't find the answers for In spite of how it may appear You know that my heart is true And I find the truth I'm searching for in you everything you are is all i ever need there is not a path i take where you cannot lead how can i be less than what you ask of me when everything you is all I ever need In a world of compromise It's so hard to really know Is satisfaction truly lies In what you can call your own So Father help me separate between all my wants and needs Till I only see the things you'd have for me Cause everything you are Is all I ever need There is not a path I take Where you cannot lead How can I What you are for me when everything you are is all I ever need. Everything you are is all I ever need. Oh, there is no I 
what you want for me when everything you are is all I ever need when everything you are is all I ever Proclaim 2024! Awesome, so good to see you all. It's so good to have you here again today. I mean, have you picked or taken something here in the past two days? Right, but we are not done yet. We are not done yet. We are taking it further this uh, morning. Hallelujah. I'd like to introduce someone to you who is going to take us further in our discussions today. Um, I met this man before I met him. <laughs> because his work <laughs> went far ahead of him. I met his work, then I met him. Uh, a man sat down several years ago and had a dream with his brother and this dream was recorded on a Soviet paper tissue paper yes it was ridiculous but that dream today found me in Lagos Nigeria and that dream is why I am doing what I am doing today ladies and gentlemen Please, with Jesus' joy, would you rise this morning as I introduce the lead visioner of New Thing, Dave Ferguson. Please have a seat. Thank you, Binga. And... Uh... Yeah, I, I, if I can, just to speak on behalf of, of New Thing, if there's anything we can do to serve you, I know Bingo would love to talk to you. Um, it was a very, very good day when he apprenticed with Matt Millar and became our Sub-Saharan Regional Director for New Thing. And under his leadership, you need to know that uh, New Things helped catalyze 1,003 churches. So thank you very much, Bingo. And that was just in the last year, just in the last year. Um, I, this will be my last uh, opportunity to get to speak in front of you. Um, at least for right now. And um, I do, I want, I want to once again say thank you very much uh, to Apostle Moses and Sarah. Um, I feel as though we're becoming friends. Thank you for that. Uh, some of you may not be aware of this, but about a year ago, um, via video, we asked uh, Apostle Moses to, to speak on a Sunday morning at my church in Chicago. And um, we had him speak on uh, the prodigal son story. And he, it was a brilliant talk, a brilliant talk where he talked about the orphan spirit. And there was much conversation um, throughout our church and even in my small group that just really resonated um, with that. And so thank you for being a friend in that way and uh, discipling my people. But I also want to let you know that um, I've, I've extended an invitation. We would love to have Apostle Moses come and speak um, in 2025, and I'm hoping he'll say yes at uh, Exponential. Um, it was said yesterday, and 
I don't know if it's actually true, but we market it that way. We, we claim that Exponential is the largest church planning conference in the world. And um, we are delighted, and we really hope sincerely that, uh, that, he will, that, he will say, that he will say yes to that. So um, you can go ahead and have a seat. Thank you very much for your friendship. But even more than, uh, even than when your friend, in addition to your friendship, thank you very much for your hospitality. You've taken very good care of me, and, and I, I feel like, um, and we were just talking about it over, over breakfast, there are a number of things that have been very good for me as a leader as I continue to grow that I have learned both from you and from many of you. So thank you for your investment in me um, very, very much. I also want to, I also, before I get reps, kind of get into my talks, I also want to say thanks to uh, those leaders that gathered for two days earlier this week. Um, who are part of our, our, our new thing, Leadership Gathering. Um, it was so, so, so good to be with you. And thank you for your commitment to multiplication. And also, as we like to say a new thing, thank you for being friends on mission. And uh, through both Binga and through Matt, if there's any way that I can or we can serve you to help you also uh, continue to multiply brand new churches, continue to advance the Jesus mission, to continue to see movements happening through our churches. Um, we would love, love, love to help you. So again, could we just say thank you to those, those pastors? Thank you very, very much. I'll tell you, here's where I want to start. If you remember uh, yesterday, Apostle Moses did a, a, had a brilliant job talking about, remember the five levels of thinking? You remember that, the five levels of thinking? And we got to level four. We're gonna give you a little quiz here, so start thinking now or grab your notes. Okay, we got to level four. And he said, level four thinking was what? Help me out. Exactly, it was a multiplier. And so intentionally yesterday, or maybe it was actually an act of the Spirit, I went ahead and I talked about, here's what it takes to be a multiplier. And that the truth is, everyone in this room and every person in your church has the capacity to be a multiplier. They can be a healthy, disciple-making leader that champions reproduction. They, and in order to do that, they have to pay attention to their internal world, Right? The RPMs, the relational, the physical, the mental, the spiritual. But they then, as that flywheel turns, they understand that they're going to reproduce who you are. That's why that's so important, that inner transformation. So then when on the outer part, the multiplication begins to happen, and those four practices, when those begin to happen, you actually gain momentum, you gain movement, and you're multiplying the inner transformation that God's doing in your own life. Good things begin to happen. Good things actually get multiplied. And so yesterday we talked about that level four and how everyone could be a multiplier. But then if you remember, Apostle Moses talked about level five. Level five. Level five kind of thinking. And help me out, in one voice, level five thinking is what? Ridiculous. Exactly right, it's ridiculous. And for you to get to level five, that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about what, it, at least from my experience, what it takes to reach that level five kind of thinking. Now the term that I use, and I love ridiculous, and we'll come back to that a little bit, but I, I like to call it a hero maker. Say that after me, hero maker. A hero maker. Let me, let me back up a little bit. In my role at Exponential, we have the opportunity to do some research on the different capacities of a church. And we've come to the conclusion that churches can basically group, be grouped into five different levels. Five different levels. And we'll, we kind of like to explain it by using kind of this, this graphic that shows the five different levels of capacity in a church. Level one, if you want to go ahead and put that slide up there. Level one is what we call um, decline, a church that's in decline. That's level one. There are actually, you're actually seeing less people in church, less people on mission this year than last year. That's level one. Then you get to level two. Level two is what we call plateaued. You add a few folks, you lose a few folks. You have about the same number of people who are on mission this year, the same number of missional communities, same number of small groups this year as you did last year. You've kind of plateaued. Then you get to level three. Level three is actually a growing church. You're adding people who are on mission. You're actually adding more groups. You're adding more missional communities. And you're starting to see an upward trend. Level three is growth. Now here's been my experience, in my experience, and I, I, I love the fact that the theme this year is multiply at Proclaim. 
My experience is that most pastors, most church leaders only think in terms of those three categories. Is my church declining? Is my church plateauing? Is my church growing? They never think into level four or level five. But the truth is there are two other levels. Level four is what we call a reproducing church. Any church that's ever reproduced a brand new church, a brand new location, that's reproducing at that level. That's level four. But level five, level five churches are really those that are multiplying churches. Those churches that are actually fulfilling the Acts 1-8 vision from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, that they're seeing at least four levels, four generations of multiplication. Are you with me? That's what we're talking about when we talk about level five. Now in the United States, when we first did this research, what we found is about 35% of all churches were, plateau, were in decline. 35%. We also found out that about 35% were plateaued, level two, which meant that only 30% were growing. But even more discouraging at the time, when we began to look at, okay, how many of them are actually level four, level five, of that 100%, only 4% were in that level four, level five. And so part of, my, part of my passion for new things, part of my passion even with Exponential, is how do we move the needle on that? And in fact, at Exponential, we've even talked about how do we, if we can just get that number, okay, to 16% in the United States, because if, if you've ever seen the innovation curve, are you familiar with that? There's an innovation curve that says 16% is like a tipping point. If you can get 16% of anything to happen in a group, it'll actually influence the whole. 16% is that tipping point that influences the whole. So we came back, that was in 2015, we first did the research. And thanks, I believe, to efforts like New Thing, to efforts like Exponential, and many, 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 many others. We did the research in 2019, and we actually saw that in the United States, the needle had moved. It had gone from 4% to 5% to 6% to 7%. Which you're kind of going like, well, that's not a, that doesn't seem that great. <laughs> but actually, that'd be about 30,000 churches. Okay? that actually begin to reproduce. You should be a little more excited than that. Come on. What do I know? Uh, what is, is that a shock? How do I say it? There we go. What a shock. Yes. All right. Furthermore, though, we were really interested then. Okay, what kind of leaders, as we grabbed a hold of that, even that small percentage, what kind of leaders are leading a level five multiplying church? That's what we wanted to know. What kind of leaders are leading a level five multi multiplying church? We actually, on two different occasions, flew some of the best thought leaders that we could find down to Atlanta to spend a couple days together. We spent a couple days together just talking about the difference in a level five multiplying church. I said, okay, what's the difference? And I remember at one point, we actually had white sheets up on a board, and we were all kind of gathered in a semicircle. There's probably about 15 of us there. And we, had, we started making a long list of the different characteristics each of us had observed in this level five multiplying church. And we made this long list, and we had probably about 25, 30 different characteristics. Here's, here's what's a distinguishing factor. Here's practices, here's habits, here's things that are different about a level five multiplying church leader. Okay, we're talking about the leader in those churches. And I'll never forget this. It was a guy named Dave Rhodes. Dave was looking at a really bright guy. He was looking at the whole thing, and he stepped back, and he, he was just kind of scanning all these characteristics, practices of these leaders. And he said, you know what's different? What's different about the leader of a level five church than other churches, it's, it's kind of like it's like they're not really trying to be the hero. And then he said this, he said, it's almost like they're the hero maker. And he was actually the first person to coin that phrase. And it kind of stuck. And the more we began to process and think about this, we began to dig into Scripture, and as we looked at the life and leadership of Jesus, I think you see the same thing in the life and leadership of Jesus. That he was a hero maker with his disciples. In fact, if you, let's go to John chapter 14, verse 12. Imagine this, Jesus gathers, he's got his disciples around him there, okay, as we've now learned who are teenagers, amen? Wow, what a great talk. One, one more thing that I was really challenged by. Where's Isaac? Is Isaac in the house? Where is he? Seriously, 
That was, I had never heard that kind of stuff before. That was terrific. Thank you very, very, very much. So, so Jesus, okay, he's got these young people around him, and imagine him looking them in the eye, and imagine if Jesus looked you in the eye, and he says this, he says, truly I tell you, whoever believes in me, you're going to do the works that I've been doing. I mean, first of all, that would kind of blow you away, right? Hey, you get to do the stuff Jesus did. For real? Yeah, I'm Jesus, I get to say that. But then he goes up, he goes one more, look. And he says, no, 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 in fact, you're going to do even what? Help me out. Greater things. He looked, he said, you're going to do even greater things than these. And, it's, and I like to think what Jesus was really saying was, listen, I'm going to show you how to reach more people. I'm going to train you how to reach more people than I ever will reach. That's what Jesus was saying. I'm going to show you how you can take the gospel to more people than, and places than I ever will in my short three years here in ministry. And in fact, I'm going to make sure you 12, you're the ones that are going to catalyze this movement based on just the training and the discipling that I'm going to give you. And furthermore, you're going to be some of the ones that are going to write the best-selling book of all times, the Bible, not me. I think Jesus was looking and said, listen, by a lot of standards, some people are saying, you're going to make a far greater impact. And what Jesus was doing, I think he was being a hero maker. Kind of wrestle with that a little bit. Now, some people will push back and they'll say, hold on, hold on, hold on. I mean, isn't Jesus our hero? Absolutely. Jesus is our hero. He stretched out his arms, right, and died on the cross for every one of us. But I'm talking about leadership, his leadership style. In his leadership style, I think the closer we looked at it, you're going to go like, you know what? No. What he was doing with those 12 guys is he was a hero maker. He was a hero maker. Let, let me kind of, what, what does it mean to be a hero maker? What does a hero maker look like? One of my mentors is a guy named Bob Buford. Bob was a guy who made, a, he just made, he made a ton of money in the cable TV business. Um, but as when his only son tragically died, while in his early 20s, he went through something he called halftime. He called it halftime. And he actually wrote a best-selling book sold well more than a half million copies, called Halftime. And he defined it, he said, because when my son died, it was like my halftime, because I went from pursuing success to pursuing significance. It was like this wake-up call, what am I doing with my life? He made a shift from success to significance. I think another way you could say for Bob, he went from trying to be the hero to being a hero maker. From being a hero to being a hero maker. Here's, here's a couple things that Bob that Bob began to do. One of the things he began to do is he would keep in, in, in his back pocket or sometimes in his wallet a small card that had the names 10, 11, 12 young people that he was investing in, both relationally and financially. For a while, I was one of the names on his list. And Bob would always say this, and it was fun. I, I heard pa Apostle Moses use this phrase, and I would encourage all of you, this ought to be a part of our nomenclature. He, he would always say this, my fruit grows on other people's trees. My fruit, you hear me, grows on other people's trees. That's what it means to be a hero maker. If you're a hero maker, that's what it looks like. And I, I can't help but kind of, we've had this tremendous conversation. Th thank you, Sarah, for that interview about how we need to honor our leaders. So, but what I want to do is I want to kind of push in our leaders. Now, how do we invest in those people that are honoring us? How do we be not just the hero, but how do we be for them a hero maker? And a couple things he did. He started two organizations. One was called Halftime. And he did everything he could to make sure that business leaders made that shift from success to significance. The second organization he called was, started was Leadership Network. Leadership Network was about everything he could do to make sure that pastors... We're leaving significant lives. It was funny too, he was, he was a very calm, low-key guy, even though he's very, very successful, very, very wealthy. But he would also say this, he'd tell, he would tell all of us, I was on the board at Leadership Network, and he would say, our, our job is we're the platform, we're not the show. We're the platform, we're not the show. And it kind of made me think, you're talking about, you know, having young people teach how we give young people a chance to preach. 
And when you have, and sometimes we need to recognize that, at least for me as a senior, I'm the platform. I don't have to always be the show. And that's what he would say. Let me give you another example. A little different, little different example of what it means to uh, be a hero maker. Um, let me, this, is, this is just overtly in your face American. Sorry, I apologize in advance. Let me show you the picture. Here we go. There we go. I, don't, I, don't, I doubt anybody recognizes this person. Does anybody know Shalane Flanagan? Okay, Shalane Flanagan is probably, or has been in the last decade, probably the best distance runner in the United States. Okay, which, now, okay, we're gonna, I'll keep it real here. We don't have distance runners like you guys have distance runners. All right, this is, this is, this is as good as we can do. In fact, here's part of the story. In 2017, 2017, Shalane Flanagan won the New York City Marathon. It was a big deal in the U.S. You know why? Because for like 40 years, Africans would come over and they would win it every year. <laughs> Just the truth. So finally, finally, an American actually won it, right? First time in 40 years, Shalane Flanagan, she won the New York City Marathon. And, and she did it in an unbelievable time, too. It was fascinating, though. I want you to hear the New York Times wrote about Shalane. And here's what they had to say about Shalane Flanagan. They said, when Shalane won the New York City Marathon last week, her victory was about more than just an athletic achievement. Of course, it's remarkable. She, first American woman to win in 40 years. She did so in a blistering time of two hours and 26 minutes. Which, if any of you are, you know, are runners, I mean, that, is a, that is an unbelievable fast time. But it goes on and says this, but perhaps Flanagan's bigger accomplishment lies in how she promotes the rising talent around her. A rare quality in the cutthroat world of elite sports. Every single one of her training partners on Team Nike, all, there were 11 other women, 11 other women on Team Nike, all of them made it to the Olympics while training with her. An extraordinary feat. In fact, they actually called it, they call it the Shalane effect. The Shalane, if you just get close to Shalane, that's right, you go to the Olympics. That's right. I mean, imagine this. Imagine, imagine come here, Isaac. Come, I'm going to pick on you a little bit, okay? Imagine there was like the Isaac effect. How about that, right? <laughs> Woo! Right? Am I right? All you have to do, you, you just get close to Isaac and you get to go to the Olympics. Because Isaac, obviously, I mean, you can tell the guy's gifted. He's, he's up to great things. But he has a mindset of John 14, 12. Even though he's up to great things, everybody, all the young people around him, you know what? I want to see you do even what? Greater things. Greater things. I'm going there, but you're going with me. The Isaac effect. Would that be awesome? What if, thank you very much. What if, what if we begin to think about that? And they called it the Shalane effect. It was so fascinating. The article went on and says, Shalane has pioneered a new brand of team mom to raise up these young and up-and-comers. That's a hero maker. All right, so that was 2017. 2018. 2018. No female American has won the Boston Marathon in 33 years. Guess who won it every year? Africans, okay? Right. No female Americans won the Boston Marathon the next year in 33 years. What do you think happens in, in 2018? Talk to me. What do you think happens? Boom, right here. No, Shalane doesn't win it. Yes, yes, yes. She actually goes, honest to goodness, so she actually goes to Des Linden. Des Linden is this remarkable runner, great runner, but always came in second, or maybe third, always came up just short. Literally, Shalane goes to Des Linden, puts her arm around her and says, you know what, Des, this is your year in Boston. They run the marathon together. Shalane's trying. She wants to win. She wants that. She's that kind of a competitor. But they end up running. If you go back and Google this, 2018, the, the Boston Marathon, terrible conditions. It's freezing cold. It's raining. Everybody's miserable. They run almost the whole marathon together. In fact, so much so that actually, at one point, they both stopped to go to the bathroom together at the same time. <laughs> but at the very end, Shalane didn't have what it took that day, 
and it was Des Linden that won the 2018 Boston Marathon. Fast forward, 2021. It's the U.S. Olympic time trials for the marathon, to make the marathon in the Olympics. Typically, 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 somewhere around 100, maybe 125 women will make the qualifying time. But now it's been four years in the United States of young women being inspired by Shalane Flanagan. It comes time for this time trial for the U.S. Olympics to qualify for the marathon. It wasn't 100 that qualified that year. It wasn't 200 that qualified that year. It wasn't 300 that qualified that year. It was over 400 that qualified that year. And the only thing they could point to was the Shalane effect. And I'll tell you what, and, and it gets a little bit personal for me because like I had two boys that, were, that loved running and were very successful in high school and college and distance running. My daughter, she was more into the arts and other things, never, never had any interest in running. In 2019, that was the first time she came to me and she said, you know what, hey, Dad, how about we run the Chicago Marathon together? And it's a certain, and, and I'll tell you, I mean, it's probably hard for you to completely understand, but as a dad, that was one of the greatest joys in my life for me to get to run that race with my daughter. And part of it was the Shalane effect. Part of it was the Shalane effect. That's what hero makers do. You see, you see how she's up to great things, but she's going to take everybody with her. That's what, that's what a hero maker does. And hero makers in that way, they create movement. Now, now here's what I want to do. We took that list. Remember that list I told you about of 25 or 30 characteristics? We took that list of 25 or 30. We scratched a few off. We combined a few. But basically, we pared it down to the top five. Here's the top five characteristics of a hero maker. And here's what I, I'm going to give you something to help you remember these because I would love, love, love for you to begin to put these in practice. All right? Because you could, all of you, you could begin, I believe, to do what we heard from Apostle Moses, the ridiculous. Here we go. Here are the five. We'll put them on the screen. And I, I'm going to need you to help me out, though, okay? I'm going to need a little participation to keep you here. And so you remember these, okay? The first one is multiplication thinking. Point to your head. There has to be, if you're going to become a hero maker, here's what it's going to require. It's going to require a shift in how you think. And I'm going to tell you how you have, you're going to have a shift in how you think. You're going to start thinking differently. Here's number two, permission giving. Point to your eyes. Okay, point to your eyes. Come on, everybody. Way back. Are you guys with me? There we go. Good job. You, there's a shift in how you begin to see the world and you begin to see the people that sit in your chairs, your church, and, the, and in, your, in your pews if you have those. There's a shift in how you see the world. Thirdly is disciple multiplying. Put your hand on your heart. Put your hand. Disciple mean there's a shift, okay, in how you share Jesus with other people. There's a shift in how you share Jesus with other people. Here's one, and this one's a little trickier, okay? Put your hands up like this. This is number, number four, which we call gift activation. There's a change. Instead of actually always receiving the blessing, you give the blessing. Instead of just receiving the blessing, you give the blessing. That's number four. And the last is kingdom building. Do, do like this for me, okay? Do like this for me. This is a change in how you count. Okay, it's really a change in your scoreboard. It's a change in how you count what ultimately matters, all right? So here we go. Let's jump into these. Okay, I wanna, I'm going to spend a few minutes on each of these, and hopefully we'll give you some real solid takeaways. Number one, okay, this is really, really important. You've got you to gotta get this one first. Uh, the other ones probably won't fall into place. Okay, number one is, is, is the practice of multiplication thinking. Everybody point your head, okay? We're about to make a shift. You ready? You guys ready? Point your head. Come on. Come on. Here we go. There's a shift in how you think. We're going to make a shift in how you think. And the shift how you think is the practice of multiplication. You move from thinking that the best way to maximize my ministry is just through my own efforts to understand that it's through developing the leadership of others. I mean, was that so awesome to see all those young people up here earlier this morning? Am I right? So good. And I think when I look at Acts 1.8, in Acts 1.8, the pronoun you is used three different times. He's telling me, you're going to be the ones the Spirit's going to move on, okay? You are going to be my witnesses. You're going to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, into the earth. Jesus, was, I'm not doing it. You're going to do it. And I'm going to make sure. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure it happens. So what we realize is that it, the equipping happens through others 
who still equip others, who still equip others. That's how you're going to get to that four generations. But it starts with multiplication thinking. Now, hear this, and please don't miss this part. Multiplication thinking is often catalyzed, I don't want to say often, I'm going to say always, is always catalyzed by the vision of a compelling cause, a greater battle, or a bigger dream. It's, say it again, here we go. Multiplication thinking is always catalyzed by the vision of a compelling cause, a greater battle, or a bigger dream. It starts right here in your head. Here, here was, and, and Apostle Moses told part of my story, but I will, I'm going to tell it again just for, for, for effect. As a very young leader, my vision, listen to the way I'm talking about this too, my vision for my church is I wanted to have a church that grew to a thousand people. I wanted to have a church that grew to a thousand people, right? What level of thinking is that? What level of thinking is that? That's level three, isn't it? It's not, it's not decline. It's not grow. I mean, it's not uh, plateau. It's grow, isn't it? I want to grow my church to a thousand people. I wasn't even thinking about level four or level five. That was why I wanted, and, and, and here's the way my brain worked. I thought maybe, maybe, maybe I could teach well enough to hold the attention of a thousand people. Or maybe I, I could administrate well enough that I could actually assimilate a thousand people into like a hundred different missional communities or small groups, and that would hold them. I could do it. And then I heard this paradigm-shifting challenge from Neil Cole. And Neil said this, I was in a workshop, it was a, it was a conference kind of like this, and he, he just did. He said, hey, I want you to take your current dream. What's your current dream? And at that point, my dream was, hey, what if I had a church of a thousand people? And so I'm thinking a thousand people, and he said, no, multiply it by a million. So, all, I mean, it, it was, it was like it made my head explode. Because, right, because I mean, I knew, I had enough sense to know I couldn't teach well enough or even build a building big enough for a billion people. And I mean, I'm, I might be pretty good about developing leaders, but I knew I couldn't develop enough missional communities or small groups to house a billion people. I mean, there's not even a billion people in the United States. Right? And so I began to go, like, okay, I, have, I, gotta, I gotta rethink what I'm doing here. I, I began to realize this is not gonna happen through one leader. It is not gonna happen through just one church. I knew it was gonna require me to multiply my efforts, not just through one person, but through probably not just hundreds or even thousands or tens of thousands. It's gonna be at least that, those kind of leaders. And it, it was an important shift that began to happen in my head. I would challenge you with this. If you don't have a dream that makes you dependent on God, you need to get a bigger dream. If you don't have a dream that makes you dependent on God, you need to get a bigger dream. And so what Neil Cole caused me to do is start thinking about, okay, actually, instead of how do I build my castle, he forced me with that moment, how do I build God's kingdom? And in order to do that, Dave Ferguson doesn't get to be the hero. And honestly, even, even my church may not be the hero. I, I, needed, I needed to do it through lots of people. And it, it started with multiplication thinking. And, and, and Bingo was, was kind enough, you know, to say, like, yeah, that he heard about me or read about me or read some of the stuff that I wrote before he ever got on board and became a part of New Thing. Part of the reason, I think, that we even, I even have the opportunity to work with people like Bingo and then be here with you is because somewhere way back on the back of a napkin, I started, I, I began, thanks to Neil Cole and others, with multiplication thinking. And I began to go, what, what would I have to do to reach a billion people? What would I have to do? I love how a, a Bishop Oscar from Nairobi Chapel, uh, how he says it. He says, I want to dream so big it makes God sweat. <laughs> And I'm, let me just say it again, if you don't have a dream that makes you dependent on God, and you, some, you, you think somehow you can do it, you need to get a bigger dream. And I, lo I, I, I love Apostle Moses' dream. He's like, how, how do I have a, a thousand movements of a thousand churches? How do I make that happen? And, I, and, and while he is a tremendously gifted man, I think he knows, you know what, I can't do that on my own. 
I got to be dependent on God, and I'm going to have to work through a whole, bu- whole bunch of people. I'm going I'm to have to be a hero maker. All right, so here's the second one. All right, so the first one is the multiplication thinking. Here's the second one. Now I want you to point your eyes. Point your eyes. You got it? Point your eyes. This is a shift in how you see the world. It's called permission giving. You're going to take the focus off of your own leadership, and you begin to see the leadership potential in all the people that, that God has put around you. I, again, we see this in the life of Jesus. He, he, he comes across this group of ragtag working class follows. He says, hey, come follow me. And of course, they never, they never expected a rabbi. And again, I'm, I'm, Isaac, I'm telling you, I'm stuck with this teenage thing. These, this group of teenagers never expected that a rabbi would spend time with them. But Jesus saw something in that group they didn't see in themselves, and then he gave them permission to own the mission. Um, when, I, when, I was in, uh, when I was in junior high, I went to, I went to a summer camp. And it was, uh, it, was, it was a Christian camp I went to during the summertime. And at that camp was a guy by the name of Dennis Gamoff. All right? Now, Dennis Gamoff had been a high school basketball All-American. When, when I was a kid, um, I so wanted to be a professional basketball player. Somebody's laughing at me. Why are you laughing? I don't, I don't, look, like, I don't look like a basketball player. <laughs> For... <laughs> <laughs> what a shock. No. Way too short, way too white, way too slow, can't jump, all the things. Um, but I did love basketball. I mean, I love, 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 love it. I would sleep with the basketball at night because I was told if I slept with the basketball at night, it would like become an extension of my hand. I could dribble anywhere, you know. I, I loved, love, love basketball. So Dennis Gamoff is at my camp. And this guy had been a high school basketball All-American. He actually played in college at a school called Purdue in the Big Ten, which was a big deal in my part of the world. And, like, I, I, I was awestruck by it. I was just awestruck by Dennis Gamoff. We were, we were playing, uh, I think that's summer we were playing, we were, that day we were playing softball. We were playing softball together. Of course, he was awesome at everything. He was phenomenal at softball. I mean, it was just everything he did was unbelievable. And I remember after the softball game was over, I was walking across the field from one part of the camp to the other part of the camp, and all of a sudden I felt this big hand on my shoulder. And I turned around, and guess who was there? Dennis Gamoff. And I'll never forget this. I mean, Dennis looks at me, and he said, Hey, Dave, I've been watching you this week at camp, and I see in you somebody who I think could be a really good leader. It was. That was a wow. I mean, I, it's been a long time since I was 12 or 13. I still remember that. I still remember that. You know, in, in the book, one of the things we do in the Hero Maker book, we talk about these five practices I'm giving you, but with each of the practices, we also give you a tool to implement it. The tool to implement permission giving, we, this, here's the four most important letters of the, of the, of the leadership alphabet. And I would encourage you as best you can to try to use these when God gives you opportunities almost every day. And here they are. If you want to be a hero maker, here's the four letters. I see in you. I see in you. And that's what Dennis did. He found me and he said, hey, Dave, I see in you someone who could be a really good leader. And my hunch is that many of you are in this room because somebody saw something in you, right? Am I right about this? That you didn't see in yourself. Somebody spoke something to you and gave you an opportunity, probably when they shouldn't have. They gave you a chance to do something. They took a risk on you when maybe other people wouldn't. And because of that, okay, you are where you are now. And what we have to do, what we have to do, starting with our young people, is we have to give them permission. We have to give them permission. We got to give them the keys to the kind of the, the automo- automobile of the mission and say, you know what, it's a little risky, but we're going to let you drive the car for a while. We got to do it. So there's got to be a shift in your thinking, but there also be a shift in how you see the world. We got to begin to see the potential in all the people in our churches. You may not know this, and I'd lo- I don't have time for the story, but the person who actually leads all of New Thing, who, who, who's our global director that reports directly to me, 
about 10 years, a little over 10 years, probably about 15 years ago, was not even a Christ follower. Showed up for the very first time at the church I lead, Community Christian Church. Became a Christ follower, got baptized, went through the whole leadership path where he was in a small group, became an apprentice leader, then became a leader, then became a coach, went and planted a church in Kansas City. That church multiplied, then came back to Chicago. And he's the one who's now overseeing much of what we're doing in 69 countries and over 20,000 churches in the last five years that have been planted. And guess where he was sitting? He was sitting in my church. I'm telling you, those people are sitting in your church. <clears throat> They're just waiting for you to say, I see in you. Here's what I see in you. And give them permission. All right. So let's do it. So let's try it again. First of all, we've got to start thinking different. Multiplication thinking. Then we got to start seeing the world different, right? We see the potential in folks, and we have these I see and you conversation. We give them permission to be everything that God meant for them to be. Here's the third one. Put your hand on your heart. The third practice is disciple multiplying. Subtly different than what we have been talking about. Not just disciple making, but disciple multiplying. This is a shift in how you share. Because you don't just share what you know, but you're sharing your life and you do it with the intention of going, how do I think in terms of at least four generations of multiplication of disciples? That's what a hero maker does. How do I think in terms of at least four generations? And again, I go, I'm going to keep going back to the Gospels. We see this in the life of Jesus. Those three years, he, he spent most of the time with those 12 guys. That was it. Most of the time with those 12 guys. I want you to, I want you to think about this too. When you think about Jesus' ministry, do you picture him speaking to the crowds, speaking to the masses, speaking to the, the many like a Sermon on the Mount, feeding the 5,000? Or do you think of him sp spending his time training the 12, hanging out with the few, just with those disciples? When we wrote the book Hero Maker, Warren Bird, who wrote it with me, he's a brilliant researcher. He went back and had somebody do the, the homework on this. And here's what we found. Jesus in the Gospels, okay, in the Gospels, you have all the events in the Gospels. If you take all the events in the Gospels, 73% of the time, he was just with the 12. Three-fourths of his time almost. He spent 46 of those events in the Gospels with just the few and 17 with the masses. So his time with the few was like three to one worse than the masses. Now, I'll tell you what, now leaders start thinking of this. How much time do you spend getting ready for the masses for Sunday? And how much time do you spend with the few? What, what if, I know. We getting. <laughs> Seriously. What if you begin to arrange your schedule the way Jesus arranged his schedule? Yeah, you spend about 25% of your time getting ready for Sunday morning, but you spend 75, and more accurately, 73% of your time investing in the few. These, because I know long term, this is what's going to create movement. Investing in these disciples who are going to go plant churches, who plant churches, who plant churches, who plant churches for four generations. It's fascinating. In John chapter 3, verse 22, there's this little verse that we just kind of run right past, probably done it a thousand times, and it says this, Jesus spent some time with them. Jesus spent some time with them. And, and actually, the Greek word, the Greek word is diatribo. Say it after me, diatribo. Diatribo, right? That's the Greek word. And it actually is a composite word. It, it means to rub, or like to rub. It's like two words, to rub and to rub against. All right. It literally, it literally means to rub off. And what a, if, you, if you take a literal translation there, it's like Jesus spent time just rubbing off on his disciples. <clears throat> I told my friend from, from South Africa, after he got up and preached yesterday, I was like, man, what fire, what fire. And I, I literally, come here, I literally said, hey, can you just like, can some of that just rub off on me? <laughs> right? And, but that's what Jesus did. He just, he just kind of, he'd hang out and some of Jesus would just rub off on these folks. I'll tell you what, do me a favor. Lean over next to somebody just kind of rub off on them a little bit. There you go. That's right. Just, that's diatribo. That's diatribo. I love it. <laughs> All right, you guys. 
It's so funny. I get a chance to kind of do talk about Hero Maker in different places around the world. And, and I had a hunch you guys would not have a problem with that. It, like when I did it in Spain, same kind of thing. What do you with the Spanish people? They're like, oh yeah, Diet Trebo, and they're rubbing off on each other. I did this once in London. I was like, Diet Trebo. You know, lean over and rub off on the person next to you. And they just stared at me. They weren't having anything to do with it. No, they weren't interested. All right, here we go. Shift, okay, practice number one is multiplication thing. You gotta, you gotta, we got big dreams. We gotta have a dream so big it makes us dependent on God. There's a shift in how we think. It's a dream that I cannot accomplish on my own. Number two is C, right? Permission giving. We start seeing the potential in everybody out there that we thought were just attenders to our church, you know, the way we count to figure out if we're growing or not. No, 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 these are real people that can create movement. And we gotta give them permission. And then there's, di then there's diatribo, right? This one right here. We've got to share our life. We're going to rub off on people. We're going to spend three-fourths of our time investing in just a few. One-fourth of our time getting ready for the masses. And then the last one, okay? The la oh, fourth one. Sorry, we've got two more. Put your hands up like this. This is the practice of gift activating. Okay, gift activating. And here's what happens. The shift is this. Instead of asking God to always bless you, you begin to bless others and send them out. Let's do it again. Let's just like this. Instead of God asking God to bless you, you bless others and you send them out. I mean, that's what, the, that's what the Great Commission was. Yes, it's a challenge to us, but in Matthew 28, Jesus turns the leaders, he literally turns the leadership of this movement over to these teenagers. He's like, I'm out of here. Oh, and by the way, all authority I'm giving to you. You go and you use it. You go and you use it. And I want you to notice too how, how <clears throat> each of these practices, they're, to use a big kind of term, they're epigenetic. They build on each other. Because it starts by having a big dream. Once you have that big dream, you know you can't do it by yourself. So I have to start seeing the potential in other people so I can mobilize those people to get to movement. And you give them permission. And part of the way you give them permission is you have an I see and you conversation with different people. And then you bring them alongside you and you disciple them, right, by rubbing off on them, by hanging out with them. And then eventually, here's the thing, they don't, they are not kind of just a perpetual kind of in the same role forever. You, you have to continue to give them opportunity, to continue to let them grow. And as they have opportunity, they prove their faithfulness. You commission them and say, okay, you go and you do even more. I want to see you do even greater things. The first, the first time I got, a, uh, I was at Nairobi Chapel. Uh, I witnessed something there I'd never seen before. Uh, Pastor Oscar, that was, that was before, he, now he's Bishop Oscar, but at the time, Pastor Oscar, we, we'd become friends, and at his request, I was speaking at Nairobi Chapel. And um, when I got, after I got to speak, and I, after I got done speaking, uh, Bishop Oscar came to the stage and invited people to come onto the stage. I remember, because I counted them, there were 31 people that came on the stage. I thought it was the choir. Right? That's a lot of people. I thought it was the choir. Bishop Oscar began to explain that these are people who'd been through their uh, Canera. Is that right? Did I got the right term there? The Canera Leadership Training Program. And that they were going to commission 31 people on that Sunday to go plant brand new churches. And like a father, I mean, he affirmed how they'd all gone through their training. And then he began to place his hand on each of them. And then he actually had, work with me, pretend like you're, you're at Nairobi Chapel that Sunday. They reached out their hand, all of them, all of them. That's exactly right, go ahead and do that. Reached out their hand, and they prayed for him. And on that Sunday, they sent out 31 brand new church planters. That's what it looks like. Here's, here's a... I'm still, I'm still processing this one, but, but work with this and see what you think. I still find myself, like before I get up to speak, um, like praying, hey, God, use me, God, use me, God, use me. And I think that's a good prayer. And, it, and it's kind of like there's a lot of things that are good about being a hero, but it's, there's things that are great about being a hero maker. And I wonder if my prayer shouldn't be focused not on me, God, use me, God, use me, but instead, God, 
mobilize these folks. God mobilized, you know what I'm talking about? And I think, it does, I think maybe it takes a little bit of maturation, maturing of a leader to kind of get your focus off yourself and really on to your people, because that's how you get to movement. That's how you get to movement. And that's what I saw through Bishop Oscar. All right, practice number five. We start thinking differently, we start seeing differently, okay? We start multiplying, sharing our lives differently. We, instead of just asking for the blessing, we give the blessing, commission people. All right, the last practice. Hold your fingers up like this, all right? This is the practice of kingdom building, because the last fifth year making practice is a shift in how you count, a shift in how you count. You're not only concerned with who's showing up at my thing, you're not just concerned about attendance. No, what you're concerned about is how many people am I sending out to do God's thing? Not how many people are coming to my thing, but how many people am I sending out to do God's thing? That's a really important shift. I, I vividly remember the day I was at, um, we call it the Yellow Box location at Community. It's our largest location. And I looked at my schedule, and it said I had an appointment with a guy named Sam. And I, I didn't know who Sam Stevens, I didn't know who he was. And so I remember I asked my assistant, I said, hey, um, who, who, I got an appointment with Sam. Who's Sam? And she's like, I thought you knew who he was. And she, I was like, no, I don't know who he is. And, 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 I, and I was kind of aggravated. I said, my assistant at the time, Pat, I said, Pat, how come I have an appointment with someone I don't even know? She's a pretty tough lady, and she's like, I don't know, but you better go talk to him because he's downstairs. <laughs> so I went downstairs to our cafe, and, uh, you know, I kind of put on my happy pastor face. You know, yeah, you do. You, like, smile. You know, I don't even know who you are, and you're like, hey, right? I, hey, sir, right. And I, and I, I kind of led with whatever, what I you normally, tell me your story. And so Sam starts telling me his story. And his story started out with... Um, he, uh, he said, well, um, back in the 60s, so we go way back, my father started a mission to plant churches in India. And uh, from the 1960s to about 1992, my father, through this mission, had planted 200 churches. Right. And so now I'm going, thank you, Pat. I'm glad, glad I get a chance to have this meeting. This is, this is wow, this is awesome. So super humble guy couldn't be more humble I'm gonna have to drag the details out of him at this point he goes on to explain well in 1992 um, actually it was over at my mom and dad's house we had a great time together um, dinner together actually stayed my mom went to bed I stayed up late in the night talking to my dad I left um, the last thing my dad said because we were talking about the mission the ministry he said whatever you do son I told Sam whatever you do uh, don't lose the vision. Don't lose the vision. And as he told me, he said, actually, his dad got very sick that night. In fact, so sick, they had to rush him to the hospital. Uh, they rushed him to the hospital, and um, he actually went into a coma. Sam got to go to the hospital, but um, his dad was already in a coma, and, in, and his father passed away. And the last thing his dad said to him, he says, hey, son, whatever you do, don't lose the vision. And the, uh, so he said, well, at that point, then I took over the ministry. He said, but I, I, I kind of, I tweaked a few things. I changed a few things. He said, and one of the things I did is I made sure that every year all of our church planters always had an apprentice church planter. So they would not only lead their church, but they would make sure that they had an apprentice church planner along with them. And they would go through that 12 months together, and they would learn everything from them. And at the end of that 12 months, then they would commission them, and they'd send them out. And then that next year, you'd take a different apprentice, and you'd have them alongside, you'd lead with them, and then at the end of that 12 months, you'd send them out. And he said, that's the way we began to do things. And so, of course, now I'm really curious. And I'm like, well, well, because it's been a while since the 1992. I said, how's it going? And he just kind of casually replies and says, well, we've now planted about 70,000 churches. I'm not making this up. I'm not. I, w I was glad I was sitting down. Otherwise, I might have passed out. 
And I, th I think, I think my, my jaw must have dropped, and I think somehow he must have thought I wasn't impressed. Because then he goes on and says, oh, but, but our dream is we want to plant 100,000 churches. 100,000 churches. All right, here, I want you to think about all the things we've been talking about. How did that happen? From 200 to 70, and actually since then, since then, he's now planted more than 100,000 churches. Planted more than 100,000 churches, Sam Stevens. Look at up, president of the India Gospel League, brilliantly humble man who's doing unbelievable stuff. How did that happen? And I think part of the way it happened is that Sam was a hero maker. Because guess what? Think about it. Multiplication thinking. His dream was what? To plant how many churches? A hundred thousand. I mean, that's a dream that almost made God sweat, right? That's a dream that's so big it makes you dependent on God. Multiplication thinking. Permission giving. Every year, each of his church planters had to find somebody they could have an I see and you conversation with because, hey, I see in you someone I could apprentice and you could eventually plant a church. I will help you. They would spend that 12 months to go together, and then that 12 months of them, right, having their, they are actually being apprenticed. It's disciple multiplying, right? They're diatribo, sharing life. At the end of that 12 months, what would happen? They would actually, come on, what happened? He'd give them the blessing, and they'd send them out, commissioning, gift activating, fully activating their gifts. And then when I asked him, I said, oh, how's it going? He doesn't tell me how many people are sitting in his auditorium. I mean, that's small potatoes compared to what he's up to. He's like, no, so far we've planted 70,000 churches. It's being a hero maker. And I'll, I, let me leave you with this. Church, you were designed for movement. You were designed for movement. And it has been remarkably good for me to be here because it also has reminded me, and thank you, Apostle Moses and others, you have everything you need. You have everything you need to make it happen. But I think one of the things along the way, as leaders who God's put in great, inf great places of influence and authority, we got to figure out what does it look like for me not to be the hero, but for me to look around like, okay, how do I make heroes of all these people, and in particular this next generation? All right, love you guys. Hallelujah. Can we clap our hands one more time for such an incredible word? Oh yes, and a louder hand clap for Jesus. Oh yes, who has put you in the ministry. I'd like to invite you just to turn to one of your neighbors and tell them, I see in you. Tell them, I see in you a disciple maker. Tell them, I see in you a hero maker. I see in you a multiplication thinker. A permission giver. A disciple multiplier. A gift activator. And of course, a kingdom builder. All right, now can you begin to pray and give thanks to God for what he is doing in you? Come on, let me hear you lift up those hands to Jesus and begin to pray. Father, we thank you because you're doing a new work. I want to hear you pray right now. Pray in the spirit because God is doing something in you. He's turning you into a hero maker. He says in that scripture, John 14, 12, that greater works than these shall you do because he goes to the Father. And he's drawing you, he's teaching you, he's working in you a desire to build big churches, to start movements, to lead multiplication, to spend 73% of your time with your disciples, to turn them into men and women of God. He's calling you to do the work of ministry. He's calling you to plant movements across the world. Come on, let me hear you pray right now in the spirit. Don't be quiet right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, because you are doing it in me. Father, I thank you because you give me the will to do according to your good pleasure, oh God. Father, I thank you, Jesus, for all the things that you're doing in my heart. Thank you because you're giving me a big vision, oh God, a vision to plant 
multiple churches a vision to lead many people to Jesus thank you because I do not do it in my own strength oh God but you are the strength that I need to do the work that you've called me to do Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit who is at work in me. Come on, friends, lift up those hands to Jesus and begin to speak to him right now. Because he is doing it in you. Father, thank you because I don't do it in my own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, King of glory, for what you're doing in my heart. Thank you, Jesus, because... I'm not a small person, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, because you are working in me, King of glory, something new, something new in the name of Jesus. Thank you because I'm not a timid person. Thank you because you're giving me the courage I need to do this work in the name of Jesus. Thank you, King of glory, for the clarity that you're bringing to me in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, friends, let me ask you right now, just clap those hands to Jesus. If you know that he is doing it in you, Give the Lord a mighty shout of praise in this place in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you for all the hero makers in this room. Thank you for the work that you are doing in them. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let's clap our hands to God one more time. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. All right. You may have your seat. Over to you, media team. Hello, Proclaim 2024. Welcome to the rooftop at Worship Harvest Nalia. My name is Sam Chisa. I pastor Worship Harvest in Tebe and I have the privilege of leading the Real Estate Development Directorate at Worship Harvest. Now, come with me. Let's go downstairs and I tell you about the building and the purchase of land and the maintenance of buildings that we do at Worship Harvest Ministry. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Proclaim 2024. Welcome to one of these amazing buildings. Wow. Thank you, thank you. So this here is our real estate development team at Worship Harvest. You're going to meet some of them. They're going to tell you what we do. Really, we're about purchasing land for the mission, building buildings for the, for the movement, and maintaining the buildings. So those are the three things we're going to cover. Purchasing real estate, building, and maintenance of the buildings. So the whole process begins with what Apostle has taught us, that building and purchase of property is critical to the mission. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 10, is our anchor verse, and it says that, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and shall plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. A church without property is not, it's not a matter of if it will close, but when it will close. So then we become passionate about property. So as a pastor, you have to be persuaded about this. And then you do everything in your power possible to make sure that your church acquires some property so that they can be established. So. That story usually begins in worship harvest with the location pastor of a given location anywhere in where they're based. The location pastor has to take the responsibility to search for land. Nobody's going to do it for you. And once you find viable options of land, then the process begins. So over here is Pastor Emmanuel. He's going to introduce himself. He serves on this team, but he also happens to be a location pastor. So he's recently acquired property for his location. Tell us about that process. Thank you very much. My name is Emmanuel Kisembo. Um, uh, <coughs> together with my wife, we lead at Worship Harvest Kasanje. I'm also a graduate architect. I serve on the architecture design team. We recently got an opportunity to acquire land to 
purchase land as a location. And like Pastor Sam said, it starts with us or myself as a location pastor. So I quickly informed the church members to start looking for land. I also informed brokers to help in the search for the land. We have uh, some requirements that we look for when we are searching for land. Uh, location, it must be within the area where the church is located. Access, does it have an access road? Is it within our budget? Does it have access to electricity and uh, water? So I told that to the brokers because, you know, if you don't tell them what you want, they'll give you all the other wrong options. Yeah, so we started looking for the land and I also created a WhatsApp group where I added the surveyor and the lawyer who are experts in land acquisition. So every other option that I would get I, or identify that I feel ticks all the, the boxes, I would post it on the WhatsApp group for them to go ahead with due diligence. Uh, most options did not pass the due diligence because of uh, their way of doing things. Even if I thought that it was really good, it had good access to uh, the town, it's near the town, it has access to power, it has access to water, but because of the due diligence, it did not pass the test. So we had to go back to the field and search and search and search for land until we got an option that, that fit uh, the description, that ticked all the boxes, and the, that passed the due diligence, and uh, we went ahead and, and purchased the land. Yeah. Thank you very much. Introducing. By the way, in the construction directorate, we are used to standing. We stand on construction sites. We stand, walk while we're looking for land. So that's why you see all these gentlemen and ladies are standing. So please bear with us. Oh, thank you. For claim 2024, I didn't apply for this job. I am here because I have good parents. So, Apostle, thank you for giving me an opportunity to serve. I don't do this as a job. I do it because I'm a daughter in the house. I just want to thank Pastor B3 who introduced me to Apostle. So, I thank you for being here, makers. That said, my name is Bridget Musumba. So, I want to thank my husband, Mr. Musumba, for allowing me to serve. I'm a, law I'm a lawyer by training. Together with my husband, we lead Worship Harvest in Deje. And we also lead the Prosperity MC. So what do I do? I do three things on this team. I coordinate the team. I also manage expectations. <laughs> so technically, technically, I do the due diligence. And that involves me going to the land registry, not just doing a quick search, because the search can tell you this is the owner. It may not tell you how they became the owner. So quickly you may realize that a year before there was a caveat that was vacated. So you will go into the detail of why ETC, ETC, ETC. Uh, we also go to the ground and we check, ask neighbors, we put on jeans, because you can't suspect I'm a lawyer. I just take off the jacket. So we go down there, ask the oldest person in the neighborhood, ETC, ETC. But then I am not enough to tell you that plot this belongs to this. I'm not enough to tell you that this is the size of the land. I can't tell you this is where the access is. So I do this work together with my brother, Pastor Talent, who's going to tell us what happens in detail on the ground in the surveys department. The lamb has won. Um, so, I mean, Apostle is a very highly spiritual man. He appointed me to be on the team so that I can sing and shout and the walls, the boundary walls come down. <laughs> That's why we are here at Nalia. Um, but my role, I'm, first of all, I, I lead with my wife, Pastor McLean. We lead Worship Harvest Chanja. Oh, yes. Um, and I am a land surveyor by training and registration. And so my role on the team is uh, if property is identified um, and then all the registration due diligence has been done 
a land surveyor has to go on ground. So I go on ground, take measurements, and the measurements consider many things. One, I need to check the acreage of the land and compare it with what, with what is registered or what the person is presenting to be sold. Two, I check physical planning, uh, physical, physical planning details, such as access, does the land have any structures, uh, does it have any encroachments by the neighbors, and then I also check if the dimensions uh, are the same as what is registered or what is presented on the title. And then on top of that, you have to confirm that the land that's being shown to you and the one registered on the title is uh, the real location because the same square that you see here can also be placed there. So you've got to confirm that the land that you're saying that is here is the one that represents the title that has been given to you. And then on top of that, measure in order to advise the, the architectural and construction um, uh, people to, oh, um, in terms of, for example, the terrain is a terrain one which you can develop. Uh, are there features on the ground that need to be maintained? That's what you'd call a topographic survey. So that's mainly my role. Thank you. So, so after, after the checks are done, so that's the legal and the physical check, we then have to go into negotiations for the price. But before we go in, we already have a budget, tentative budget. So then we start the negotiations. Apostle has told us that if someone gives you a price, negotiate by halving it or put 50%. Yes? So if it's 100 million, you start with 50. Yes. So you negotiate as though it is your personal property. Um, thereafter, negotiations, you get into contraction, a contracting level. Under contracting, remember value is leaving you, so you have to get value back. So the non-negotiables, as you, you must get the title and you must get possession. Those are non-negotiable. Um, so sometimes you may possession, may, but no, possession you must, because you must take, more like you get a tipper and put some material, see if someone is coming to disturb you before that you pay the full consideration. So after that negotiation, so one of the non-negotiables, the team now knows, if someone is not willing to give you possession and the land title, there is really no deal unless God speaks. So um, after, after the contracting, he hasn't spoken yet in my experience. So after that, we then do the contracting. I also manage the post-contracting process, which is you have paid some money. I keep the title. I give an undertaking to the other parties that we shall not transfer until we have paid the full consideration. The other consideration is that we never pay 100%. Uh, we pay and leave some, we, there has to be some balance to cater for some things in case of anything, God forbid. So thereafter, you've paid, full money has been paid, you have to remember to transfer the title. So that's also my responsibility. And you have to pay the stamp duty yourself. Don't trust a third party. So get the assessment, I make the assessment, send them to the finance team, they pay the stamp duty, give me the receipts, and then we proceed with the transfer. It's critical because sometimes people don't pay the stamp duty or pay half of it, and you can lose the entire land because stamp duty, someone played with it. Someone was trying to get a quick buck there. So the last thing then I ensure the team does, which uh, Pastor Sam and the team do, you have to take physical possession. And I understand that sometimes you may not be able to construct Yes, at the bare minimum, make a signpost. This land belongs to X ministry, not for sale. Contact, leave someone's the location pastor's number. So in case someone is trying to say that that is my land, because also we have noticed that if you just put not for sale, I can tell you, no, 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 no. It is me who put that signpost. Yeah, so you have to put your, your ministry. This land belongs to worship, harvest, ministries. It is not for sale call zero etc so that is how we ensure that you have taken possession so part of the process of taking possession is actually meeting the neighbors meeting the local council chairman or chairperson and using the place because sometimes you will buy land far from where you're currently meeting 
and you go there once every six months or something like that, you may find that someone has built in that land. So go do something on the land. Go pray on the Saturdays. Go play a football tournament. On the, basically be present. That way you keep eyes on the place. So once we finish, that covers the land acquisition. Now we've bought the land. The next stage is to construct something on the property. Usually we do generally two kinds of buildings. We do what we call the 360 structure, which is a prefabricated temporary structure, which we can put on the smaller plots. Like Pastor Emma's location is getting a 360 structure. Pastor Bridget is a landlady of a 360 structure. And you'll be there. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Receive it in the name of Jesus. So, some pictures are, are being screened there for you to see. So, it's all a, a steel prefab structure that we assemble off-site, bring on the site, and just bolt onto place. Much of it, even the floor, is made up of precast concrete slabs. So, if we decide to move it, we move it. And we've actually moved one before from one location to another location. So, you can start off with that. And then later on, as you, as you get more resources, you can remove it and build a more permanent building. So at that stage, then the architects um, come full force into the picture and begin designing the buildings. Pastor Emma and Pastor Stewart and myself. Currently, we do all the architecture work in-house, and we're still building capacity for the engineering side of things, which is the structural engineering and then electrical mechanical engineering. Yeah. So, so I'm going to invite Pastor Emma to tell us briefly about the architectural work. Thank you. So as an architect, once the land has been cleared, we have a topography map. I now go ahead to design the building. I design if it's a cathedral. I design the cathedral, the tower, the church building, and then I also develop a 3D model. I model that into a 3D that you can see that can be projected. Yeah. So I, after making that model, I go ahead to pro pro prepare architectural drawings. These are drawings that we take to the local authority for approval. So once the drawings are ready, once the engineering drawings are ready, those are some of the 3D images that we prepare to show how the building is going to look like. So once that is approved, that's when I go ahead to prepare the drawings, the ones that are printed on paper, that we take to the local authority for approval. Once we take the drawings for approval, it's also uh, part of our work to follow up, to follow up and see that the plan is actually approved. Because when you just drop the drawings at uh, the city council or the town council, it will take forever to get approved. So we make the calls, we follow up, we go to the, to the council, check what's happening. Sometimes they come back to us with comments, we need you to address this, we want you to address this. So I go back to the drawing board, make whatever they want me to adjust, and then send it back to them until we have the approval done. Yeah. Thank you. Now, this stage is important. In case in your church you don't have an architect, you can still have, find someone who can understand drawings and advise because this is the most critical stage because you want to build the building in a way that's most efficient so that less, you can expand it over time you can, or you can develop it over time. A building like this here, we've built it over so many phases. We have approved plans, three sets, because when we did the first phase, when the auditorium was stopping here, we had to get approval. Then we did the second phase with this wing, then the final phase. So as you expand, you still need proper guidance so that then you can get the, the designs working well as you expand over time. Now, lead now to the third stage, which is maintenance. But before we get there, how do we fund all of this? All of this is funded primarily through the giving of the people. 
So at the beginning of every year, we have what we call Arise and Build, where the church comes together and we collect money for buildings that year, for buying land and for buildings. So Arise and Build, everybody decides what they want to give, and then you give it over the course of the year. Um, in addition to that, we do fast fruits giving. I'm sure that will be explained at, uh, tomorrow when someone is talking, the finance team talking about that. Uh, we give fast fruit giving, which is all my January income, I give towards building in that year. And all these wonderful team members and all the members of the church do that. The other thing is that then 20% of whatever is collected is given to projects. Which leads us into Pastor Stewart here, who handles the weekly disbursements of these, the requisitions we prepare every week. So we build every week. We have a weekly cycle. So if that week the giving for building was 9 million shillings, that 9 million shillings has to find something to do. If the next week it's 40 million, then some of that has to find something to do. So we, we don't stop and say, let's wait until all the money is available for the building. So we sit down every week with Pastor Stewart and work through what gets done that week. What, what we propose to do, and then we, we submit those proposals, um, and then we get approval for that from Apostle, and then we go ahead. So, Pastor Stewart, tell us a little bit about that and maintenance of buildings. Thank you, Pastor Sam. The number's one. Yes, my name is Stuart Sebombo, and together with, <laughs> and together with Pastor Elizabeth Sebombo, we, who is my wife, yes. We lead, we're honored to lead Worship Harvest Chira. Yes, one of the things that we have been taught explicitly as Worship Harvest pastors is the culture of continuous improvement. Yes, you have prayed and the land has come and it has been bought and the building has been built. What happens thereafter? It's a responsibility of the pastor of the location to improve the property. If a building has been built and then we come back two years later, and nothing has changed in that building, then you don't blame Apostle and say, ah, you built it, this is what you left. No, you must be dreaming of what it would look like each and every day, a way in which to make it better. And so if you're the kind of person who doesn't, you know, who doesn't dream about your location, you may find that everyone else is developing, but then you're still stuck with the very thing that you were given in the first place. That's why although everyone has a 360 structure, for those who have 360 structures, they will look slightly different based on what the pastor themselves has done with the structure that they received. And the same happens with the land. For some of the land, you'll find that people have planted grass. We, we are told in worship harvest that soil represents a certain thing. <laughs> soil represents the spirit of poverty. Yes, and so that's one of the things that you have to fight. Pave the place, plant grass, plant trees. So that you don't, you know, associate yourself with poverty. Yes. You know, and so you'll find locations where the land has been there. And it looks amazingly beautiful. Like Worship Harvest Kayunga, Pastor Chris. And then you'll find other places. Well, I'll move on to the next thing. <laughs> it may have the signpost, but you may wonder whether it's a Worship Harvest piece. And then what Pastor Sam has talked about is that every week there is construction happening. And so we sit together and with the funds that are available, depending on what the pastors themselves to have proposed as a concern, we suggest what some of the works are supposed to be done. It might be that maybe the accessories, appliance is being done for washrooms or a stage uplift that is happening. I'm sure that the last pictures you saw probably did look like this and so many other things. And so it's something to create ownership with the pastor to know that as much as you receive the building, it is for you to steward excellently. You have to own the property as though it were your own. If we came to your church and it looks a certain way compared to your home, then of course it indicates a lack of ownership. And that's one of the things that we are told consistently with the equipment, with every space, and ultimately with the properties that we receive. So. Thank you so much, Apostle, for that. Amen. So as you can see, the journey usually begins with a location pastor. 
and ends up with a location pastor as the ultimate steward of that property. Our role here, <laughs> steward, <laughs> our role is to provide support, technical support, to make sure that the decisions that are being made by the location pastor are supported and are legal and are effective in terms of the money that's spent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we pray that as you go, you will go and set up a team. There are people in your churches, there are engineers, there are architects, there are pastors that you can bring on board and they can serve in helping you acquire property and establish the church. God bless you. Please give it up for the buildings, Tim. I say give it up for the buildings, Tim. Tell your neighbor, one day, I'll build. One day, I'll have a mega cathedral. One day, I'll have mega cathedrals. Are you ready to shake a little bit? Are you sure? Tell your neighbor, neighbor, give me some space. No, I didn't say space. I said space. Neighbor, give me some space. <laughs> yeah, uh, Reverend Steve. Oh, I, I, okay, DJV, are you going to drop something? Call security. Somebody call Dina security. DJ Ruby. <laughs> Enjoy your blessings. Come on. Save. 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 Monkey see, monkey do. What I, what I do is what you do, right? Are you ready to switch it to the other leg? Switch it. Switch it. Switch it. Switch Got my money, keep the balance. We are kicking off with the easy step, right? Listen, them follow me. My God, my it's a land in Odina Zijeko, a team where Jeku. If you're not bending down, you're doing the wrong thing. Sakame Zana Zijeko, Sina Bimanja. We go to your blessings. Get low. Get down. Get down. Get down. Now. Drop on it. Enjoy my blessings. Okay. I hope you have your dance face on. Bring up. Collection. I hope a promo yen in Abu Huntia, or you were town for Jano Manivia, Yam Wamu Amusina Mumpia, Savo Pemu and your men in ID Nana Yamini Awakano, never said a woman who saw a big boy in a tutu. So my party don't lose that. Can't walk for my boy. Everybody sing it, hallelujah. What's going on with the men of God right now? Somebody pray for somebody right now. We go. One, one, two times. One, one, two times. One, one, two times. One, one, two times. You guys are doing good. Let's find out what these guys are doing inside. But we are going to switch it for you. Are you ready? Switch it. Here go. Set the whole world to sink in Osana. And the people are lifting me high. Set the whole world to sink in Osana. And the people are lifting me Okay, okay. Just go on. Go on. I 
that was supposed to be moving. Is it? Why you're in the mix? Let's go. DJ Ruby. In the mix. DJ Ruby. We all pressing this side. Pressing this side. Put some magic into it. Some minutes, right? Let's go. Let's go. Don't kick your neighbor now. Pastor Macharia, what's going on? I thought you were for me. Ah, okay. Let's go. You're standing straight, please. Let's go. You guys are doing good. I don't know about the guys that... This is your time for breathing. We're about to switch it up. Are you ready? Could you make some noise if you're ready? Would you make some noise? Problem 2024. Are you ready? Like a tornado, I got your count with the can you got no, but I don't really care. And I see fire, <laughs> all the blessings soon coming. Going back with them, call it homecoming. What you see is what you get. No Photoshop, and I don't ever stress. Keep on going. I'm watching you. I'm watching you. Okay, you're doing great. 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 Now, this is what we call style yake, which is your style. You do whatever you want. Are you ready to give it? One, two, three, your style. Your styles are confusing me. What is this now? <laughs> Mama Kilo. Mama Kilo, what's going on? I'm watching you. Even the King of Kings is watching you right now. Uh huh. Okay, you're doing great. You're doing great. Okay. Switch it. Pastor Jimmy. Switch your leg, switch your leg, switch your leg. Oh. 
Okay. Now we're going to take it at this. Ah, you guys. Are we together or not? Are you for me or are you against me? Are you for me? So should we go? Should we go? You guys are ready. One, two, three. We go. One, a two, a three, a four. Uh-huh. One more time. We go. A two, a three, a four. Oh, one more time. We go. You see in me. <laughs> One, a two, a three. Hey. What? Where? Where has this? Okay, not this. You guys, you guys are doing great. You guys are doing great. Make some noise, come on, people. Ah. Pastor Jumi, you're killing it. Come on, make some noise for yourself, guys. You are beautiful. Hey, hey, hey. Wow. <laughs> Proclaim 2024. Wow. Seven and a half years ago, I was uh, commissioned by the Nairobi Chapel to come and plant Trinity Chapel Kampala. I came with a team of four, myself, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. No wonder I lead Trinity. <laughs> uh, and uh, a friend of mine who was uh, Pastor Njoro from Mavuno, who had uh, recently relocated back to Nairobi, told me there is a pastor in Kampala that you must meet and have a conversation with because he needs to be your friend. And so I landed and uh, I, I, I contacted Apostle Mose, uh, who gave me an appointment without reservation. And I remember we met at uh, Cafe Pub in Tinder, and we had a convers short conversation, and he welcomed me into a bigger family of, uh, of pastors. Back then, it was called the Pastors Roundtable. Uh, for those seven and a half years, Apostle and Rev Ma have become our personal friend personal friends and we really, really appreciate what uh, God is doing uh, through Worship Harvest Ministries. They have also opened up their space and opened up their resources to uh, many other pastors. We are part of a bigger uh, family called the Pastors Mentorship uh, that, that, that welcomes lead pastors and lead ministers from other ministries to come and learn and currently we are being trained and coached under Apostles leadership together with other coaches hallelujah and so ladies and gentlemen it is my Herculean task this afternoon to welcome in such a big way it gives me uh, 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 with a lot of behoovement uh -huh. and with a lot of bewilderment uh, and with a lot of chaos and rampage ladies and gentlemen with the joy of the Lord Give it up for Apostle Moses! Wow. I don't know who allowed Pastor Isaac to do that. What a shock. Are there any people who are loved by Jesus in this place? Are there any people that Jesus died for? Anyone that Jesus has loved, cherished, and sent, if you're there, make a loud shout of praise to the Lord, to the King of Kings, to the mighty God. Hey! Woo! Amen. God has been so kind, so faithful to me. You know, I wonder, I would be dead by now. But God loved me, saved me, called me into the ministry, gave me an out-of-this-world wife, yeah. friends, and all that we see, everything you encounter here is really the grace of God. It's nothing we deserve. It's nothing that because we have thought, articulated. No. 
We are those people God keeps saving in the nick of time. I says, these idiots. Now, let me save them here. Let, let, let me bring this other person because they don't know what they are doing. We are like sheep. No defense mechanism. And when we are in danger, we don't even know we are in danger. We are just happy to be there. But God has been good. Amen. So I want you to really clap your hands unto God, all you people. Oh, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Amen. Please have your seats. Wow. I can tell you that at, on the front row, Pastor Jumoki won the dance. Yeah. Ah, Pastor Victor, you need to explain something. Reverend Victor. Well, oh, ah. Dave was number two. Okay. Upon, Apostle Mangalis was number three. Wow. Wow. Eesh. These guys are anointed to dance. Now, the challenge with going through such a hectic dance at one o'clock uh, in, in the, in the, inside the building is that you're going to sweat, perspire, so you can use your, your lanyard as a, a fan. That's exactly why we gave it to you. Now you know why. Not everything should be electronic because at some point you need a physical something. What a blessing. Was, what was that by Pastor Quaker? I mean, what was that? I'm still wondering what it was. Hey! It was an earthquake. My God. Wow, we are blessed. Can you imagine you can go through your whole ministry life without hearing that? Imagine you show up before Jesus and he's like, you were equipping all the wrong people. What were you doing in my name? And he'll be like, nobody ever told me. <clears throat> Some monitor sound. But now you can't say no one ever told you. Now you know that those young people in your church, they are not there to be entertained and given games and what. They are there to be discipled and sent. And I thought that was amazing. Pastor Quaker, we are so proud of you. We just count ourselves to be blessed to, to, to you know, eat food that is grown in the same country. Wow. And then we had the panel. Ah. Uh, the other seat. Because sometimes we think that to lead, you must always be the one in front. It says apostles and prophets. I mean, there's always the other person. There's always the other seat. Martin Luther King had people that he, if they were not there, they would not have done it. Billy Graham had his guys. They, they all served together all their lives and I think the last one died at around 106 years old or something like that. I don't know whether there's one who's still alive. They just were together. And so the whole idea that you must always run away from someone to become something is flawed. Sometimes God calls God gives a vision to a person but he calls many people. That's why it says many are called. Yeah. So you find that the vision will be given to a person, but the calling will be to a family, to a team. I don't know if I'm making sense. And so the whole solo act does not work in ministry. And of course, the hero maker came and told us about hero making and yeah, every time you listen to Dave Ferguson or read one of his books, you think, what are you talking about? Like, why are you getting into my heart and 
convicting me of sin, <laughs> righteousness, and judgment. <laughs> because, you know, we all love to do it. We would love to do it. We all love to say it. We all like to say, oh, we are hero makers. But, you know, when you check your heart, like one of my leaders here says, when you check your heart, you realize that there is a part of you that wants to keep things to yourself. Yeah, there is a part of you that wants to be the one that stands out. There is a part of you that wants your books to be the ones that are bought. Only. There is a part of you that wants... Let me go to Namibia and tell them these things. Because I think the people here, they are just... No, no, no. Am I telling the truth? Yeah, we are human beings. We are selfish. It's God wired us with that system for self-preservation. So that when you hear a blast, you figure out how to protect yourself so you don't die. Yeah, but then we take it to levels where it doesn't help us. Yeah, where you hang on to the thing until you die with the thing and you kill it in the process. And so I think we need to be repenting. At least for me, I don't know about you. But for me, I find that many times I find I want it for myself. Yeah. And I have to remind myself that, look, one day you will not be here. Now imagine yourself not here for, at Proclaim. You're buried somewhere and Proclaim is going on. Uh-huh. So now start thinking about it. <clears throat> oh, there's someone who's saying it will never... I, are you God? With long life, God will satisfy you and me and show us his salvation. But also teach us number of days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Amen. So this, this is, proclaim is an exciting time of connection, learning, but it's also a time of conviction. It's like at least once a year, when you have because all of us, you know, Dave talked about drifting. And of course, he said, no, me, I never drifted. No, we all drift. Yeah, and once a year, you come to a place where they recalibrate the, the tires. You know those cars where you're driving, if you let go of the steering wheel, it just starts moving towards left by itself. And you have to drive to the garage, and then they do wheel alignment. Yeah. So hopefully, this proclaim is also some sort of wheel alignment for you and I. Amen. Oh, yes. Now, I want us, the theme is multiply, and I want us to talk about blessed to multiply. Blessed to multiply. Ask your neighbor, neighbor, are you blessed? And if they say yes, tell them where's the evidence. Now, just in case you go for lunch early, Let me make the main point now. Okay. And by the way, one of the things that will help you is that when I'm teaching, if you walk around, you'll not hear what I'm saying. So it's good to sit down and hear it live, and then you can walk around after. That's why we have t seasons of walking around, like lunchtime. You can buy the kind of lunch that you can eat while walking around. Now, blessed to multiply. Just in case you miss it, let me put it as su succinctly as possible. So that one. And here it is. Everyone look at me. If you do not have disciples who are multiplying you are not blessed mm. yeah let me repeat if you do not have disciples if you don't have people disciples that you can say 
these are the disciples that the Lord has given me. And those disciples are multiplying, as in each of them have disciples. Who have disciples? Who have disciples? You, in practical terms, you are not blessed. You are only blessed by faith. You know, like First Peter 2.24, it says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness, and by whose stripes we were healed. You know, at a faith level, we were all healed, but not everyone is practically healed. Not everyone has the experience of health. So yes, you are blessed according to Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. But for you, it ends in the Bible. When it comes to real walking around and they say, there is the blessed man. You actually, according to this teaching of today, we can have theological arguments later we say, no, actually, according to this part of the Bible, I'm blessed. According to this part of the Bible, I'm blessed. And according to the other part outside the Bible, I'm blessed. But right now, in the next one hour, you are not blessed. You are not blessed. You think you're blessed. You talk like you're blessed. You may even have a position like senior pastor. In which case, people expect you to be blessed, but a global, global senior pastor. But according to the scriptures, you are not blessed. Now, let me show you. Genesis 1, 21 to 22. Genesis 1, 21 to 22. 1, 2, 3, we read. So, God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which... The waters abounded, and I had you reading it, according to their kind, and every wing bird according to its kind, and God, so that it was good. And God blessed them. Bless the what? Bless those creatures. He blessed the creatures, saying, what did he say? Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. In other words, what was the blessing? The blessing was to be fruitful and multiply. How would you tell that the crocodiles have been blessed when they are fruitful and are multiplying? What would happen if you find a crocodile that's by itself that has not multiplied? It is not blessed because the blessing was to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters. Oh, that's a blessing to the birds, to the cows, to the cockroaches. To the mosquitoes, the bed bugs. Some bed bugs are more blessed than others, depending on where they live. <laughs> ah. Are you seeing it? The blessing to the creatures was for them to be fruitful, that's addition multiply, that's multiply, and feel, feel, that's exponential, ridiculous. Because there is a level of multiplication that's not ridiculous. That's why it's very clear. Be fruitful, that's level one, you're adding growing churches. Multiply, you're multiplying, multiplying churches. And, but there is a something called feel. You can multiply without feeling. Your church can multiply in your city without filling the city. You see, we are all multiplying churches. Yeah. So yours may have 30 churches. Great multiplication. But then there is RCCG. 50,000. That's a different level. Yeah, that's when they say, these people who have whatever, they have come here also. These who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Are they saying that about your church? That you have come there also? Or you are just tied up in one little municipality and adding titles to yourself? Hmm. 
Bishop General Apostle Prophet Reverend Doctor. <laughs> Am I talking? So you see that God blessed the creatures. I said, You crocodiles, you sharks, I command you to. Now, I'm going to show you something very little but very important. You know, hinges are little things that swing big doors. There is a hinge in there somewhere. And if you miss it, you'll always read the scripture badly. Okay, so, God blessed them saying, you see that? So, let's say, I, I can't face any direction. Let's say these are the creatures. <laughs> not the band, not the band, the creature. He says, God, ble the blessing is words. By the way, if you do a, B a Bible study of what is the blessing, the blessing is just words. Someone says something and then you're either blessed or you're not. That's why you should be careful with people who have capacity to bless. So he just, he blessed them saying, saying, now, I'm going to show you another scripture in the same chapter. Genesis 1, 27, 28. So, God created man in his own image. Now, he has finished the other stuff. He has blessed them. Now, imagine, think sequentially. Now, the birds are multiplying, the fish is multiplying, the cows are multiplying, but man hasn't yet started to multiply. So, in other words, the creatures are blessed, but not the, not the person. So, he created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female created them. Next verse. Then God blessed them. And what did he say? And say to them, same thing he told the birds, the what? What did he say to them? Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. You see, those, those are three levels. Level one is fruitfulness. Level two is multiplication. Level three is fill the earth and subdue it. What will, what will be like uh, dominion? Are you understanding? Even in business, there are brands that are fruitful. Then there are brands that multiply. Then there are brands that subdue the earth. Brands are subdued, yes. Coca-Cola. Those are brands. No, there's no homo in... Uh, uh, wait, wait. KFC. Those are brands that subdue. You'll find them in every nation. Are you following? Now, let me show you the hinge. I'm going to show you a hinge and a window. A hinge... To swing something big and a window to see something that doesn't strike you the first time you read it. The hinge is this. For the creatures, he blessed them saying, saying, he just came and spoke. For man... He blessed them and said to them. The creatures don't have capacity to understand what God is saying. They don't have a choice in, in how to respond to God's word. They just do, they just, yeah, leave out whatever God said. The cheetah will run as fast as cheetahs run. They don't need to go to running school. The whales will grow as big as whales grow. They don't need to go to fattening school. The dogs will smell as, as, as exact 
as dogs can smell. They don't need to go to smelling school. And now they are training the dog to smell. No. Because God already said. Man, on the other hand, God said to them. It's a specific thing to you. I'm telling you this. That's why you see that as opposed to all the creatures, man requires some sort of convincing to start living out his full capacity. Yeah. The animals, they just do what they were created to do. Human beings, they are going to be there until you kick them and say to them and say, get up, this is not, you're at the wrong level. That's what he said to them. He didn't just say in others, they had to receive it and act on it. It's one thing to say, for me to come and say, someone has a billion dollars. I'm just saying. It's another thing when I come and say, you have a billion dollars. You see, now, you, that's specific to the person. Okay. You'll get it by and by. Don't miss the big point. The big point is that the blessing was to multiply. Now, here is another big point. Here is the window. Here is the window. The birds, the other things. What do they really represent, if you think about it? They represent the resources. All those things are being created for man. Right? That's why he said in verse 28, if you can show me. Verse 28, thank you. He says, uh, so he gives a blessing before my pride fill the earth and subdue. Then he says, have dominion over the things in verse 22 that have already blessed to multiply. Rule over Here is a window. So let's say he blesses the cows and they start to multiply. And there's now 500,000 cattle, but there is still only one man and one woman. Can they subdue them? No, rather, can they have dominion over them? No. In other words, while these things have... have oh. I've multiplied the resources. Now I'm requiring you to multiply in order to be able to harness the resources. Because if the resources start to multiply and you, Adam, and if stay here, one only, the two of you, we are going to have the problem. You will never have dominion over the resources until you start to multiply. Can I tell you why your church has little money? Oh, I don't have to tell you. Oh, no, your church has a lot of money. But can I tell you why it hasn't yet come into your coffers? Why would God bring a billion dollars to a church of 100 people? Why? To do what? Why would they do that? According to the scriptures, God starts by multiplying the resources. And then he comes to start multiplying the man to, to have dominion over the resources. I can tell you that all the people who are not into making disciples don't have resources. This is a pastor's conference. Do I have to like couch it in, in uh, whatever? I think I can just tell it to you as it is. Yeah. Some people can build. Look. When we were 21 in a restaurant, we could not pay the equivalent of $15 every Sunday 
several Sundays. We will have to pay one week at a time. Yeah, we had to pay one week at a time. Why? We were few. Now we build several projects at a time. Why? We are many. It's a no-brainer. The resources are waiting for you to multiply. The resources have already been released. They were the first ones to be released. They're just waiting for you to multiply. Verse 28 comes after verse 22. God didn't multiply Adam and Eve. And then I was like, oh my God. These guys are starving. They need meat. Cows start multiplying. No. <laughs> he started by multiplying all the things they would need before multiplying the people. Everything your church and movement needs, God already released it from heaven and it is in multiplication mode. And the only reason you haven't yet run into it is you're not multiplying at the right rate. Okay. Uh, in some ways, I feel like I've made my point, but... So the blessing is words. So he, he blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Genesis 9, 1, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In Genesis 24, they blessed Rebecca and said to her, our sister, may you become mother of thousands of tens of thousands. That's how they blessed her. In Genesis 28, we see Isaac blessing Jacob. Do you want to see how he blessed Jacob? The guys the other side don't want to see how they bless Jacob. This is very interesting the way he blessed Jacob. Look at what I ah should I just like go through my notes or should I teach you? Okay. So keep the reef says this is a guy says, May God Almighty bless you. Words. But he knows where the blessing comes from, but he has the power to release it. And make you, what? Fruitful. And do what? Multiply you. That you may become a what? Assembly of peoples. That's the blessing. Everyone is like, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to be blessed. I'm blessed. Am I blessed? Am I cast? Am I blessed? Blessed. Bless. You can tell the blessed man by the assembly of peoples that have come out of them. I'm about to blow your mind. Are you ready? <clears throat> your father. So he's blessing him and says, my son, this is how you're going to be blessed. By God. Not me. Me, mine is to, re, to speak the words and then God does the thing. And this is what's going to happen. He is going to make you fruitful. He's going to multiply you. And then you will become an assembly of peoples. Peoples there is nations. An assembly of nations. When Rebecca had a problem in her tummy and she went to the Lord and said, what's going on? The Lord told her, two nations are in your womb. The, the gynecologist saw two zygotes. God saw two nations. This is what we've been, David has been trying to tell us. You're there, you don't know that every Sunday when you get up to preach and there's 1,000 people, you're looking at a 1,000 nations, potentially. A 1,000 gospel nations are seated there. You're boring them to death. It is the 18th year since they started sitting there to listen to you. Bishop Oscar used to say that after four years, you, everything you need to teach, people have learned it. Yeah, you're just going to start recycling the sermons. Right? Yeah, four years, all the sermons are finished. That's why Jesus, three and a half, and he was out of here. 
He insists on repeat it so that they leave. Now, of course, in, with Adam, Noah, it is, they are talking about a natural system that can, have, can even have issues, fertility issues. I don't know what issues. But for us, we are now in another system, the one of Jesus, which does not have those limitations. It just works. Yeah. And you don't have to wait nine months. <laughs> it moves very fast. Look. If we understood discipleship, it will, I think uh, it would be very hard to go to heaven and try and explain to Jesus why the majority of the people on earth are not yet followers of Jesus. Yeah. It's impossible that a system that requires 20 years to create a sinner that can reproduce hmm? nine months in the womb and maybe about 18 months of of, of 18 years of legal requirement plus about another one year of dating. <laughs> a system that requires 20 years to create a reproducing sinner can outpace a system that can recreate a reproducing disciple in just three months. It's impossible to explain how there are more sinners than disciples on planet earth today. For a system that requires 20 years to produce one and one that requires just weeks or months. As in the person gets saved, you learn on them, you start praying together, teach them the basics and they go out to, to make another disciple. And it doesn't take that long. How can a system that requires 20 years be outpacing a system that requires weeks? I don't get it. So he says, an assembly of peoples. Now, can I show you something else? Verse, next verse. And give you, and is a conjunction. It means if this happens, the other one will happen. If this happens, the other one will happen. What will happen? And give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land in which you're a stranger. Inheriting the land is a matter of time if you are becoming an assembly of peoples. TGL didn't buy land by remaining 13 people. Even if they are students who don't have a lot of money, the fact that they have 600 shepherds means that buying land is a possibility. I can tell you why your church hasn't bought land yet. It's not too complicated. If you want, I can tell you. If you don't want, I can keep quiet. It's the numbers. It's the numbers. The church is quiet. If you multiply your numbers, you buy the land. You don't have to go to America to beg for money. Just multiply the numbers. Okay. <laughs> It has always been in the scriptures. Oh yeah, by the way, every promise that God made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, it is involved land. So if you don't have land, you are the only one. You can't call yourself a child of Abraham and you don't have land. In our church, we have a campaign to make sure every family owns their own land in worship harvest. And we are well on our way. If you are in Watch Pavest and you're here and you own some land, some property, stand up. That's not common. And you may want to know that they don't have it because they have loans from the bank. No. They, have not, they don't have mortgages. They, they bought. You can sit down. If you're in worship harvest and you're here and you have flown on an aeroplane, stand up. You go 
to any other church and do this survey and you see what will happen. People who have boarded an airplane legally. I'm not talking about you went to a, a show somewhere and you, these airplanes on the ground. It took off. Ah, little Beach. Sit down. I'm talking about my plan. My plan, you reproduce who you are, right? If you're in worship office and you have authored a book, stand up. Sit down. You can't be here if you haven't authored the book. Uh, this one is still young, it's coming. But all these ones, yeah. It's very personal. I know. No, look, I was telling, hey, look, when you saw the worship team in the morning, about 30% of all those people lead churches. What we do in our churches, worship team, there are the people we bed. You have to pay some price for to come and play. What? Today they come, tomorrow they switch off their phone. All these people have disciples. All of them, without exception. Two of them are location pastors. You saw the building team. All the people on the building team are all pastors of churches. You see, there are some things you can plead ignorance when you appear before Jesus, but not after today. Not after today. Not after you've come to proclaim. <laughs> yeah. It's getting personal. <laughs> If you multiply, the resources will be waiting for you. Because God multiplied the resources before he multiplied the people. Whew. <laughs> Let me show you something very interesting. Then I'll show you something else very interesting. And then something else very interesting. And then I'll finish. The first very interesting thing I'm going to show you is in the book of Job. Job chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, and I want you to mind the numbers. Please mind the numbers. There was a man, 1 to 3, read. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was? And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil like the pastors there. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Now, you may be wondering, why is this man mixing up discipleship with family? Discipleship in Genesis, those are not, they are not talking about Abraham's disciples. Rather, Adam's disciples. <clears throat> you see, all that is in the natural old covenant, but in the new covenant, everything is at a much faster, higher level. Jesus didn't have physical children, but we are here. Paul didn't have physical children, but we are here. And you'll find that if you read the book of Acts, you'll see that they use the language of discipleship. The book of Acts is really about two ministries, the ministry of Peter and the ministry of Paul. And they use the word discipleship or disciples when they are still talking about Peter. And Peter phases out in chapter 11. Chapter 11, when he has to explain why he went to Cornelius' house. And in chapter 12, the ministry of, uh, is it 13? 13, yeah. So Peter, Peter's thing ends in chapter 12. From chapter 13 to the end of the book of Acts, it's the ministry of Paul. And the language changes from disciples to sons and daughters. The moment you, you go from the Jewish side to the Greek side, it becomes sons and daughters. You're so kind. <clears throat> so, allow me. So, Job. 
All these are things in the Bible. Sons, so, take note. How many sons? How many daughters? How many children all together? Next. Also his possessions were, now this part you need to take note. 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. Very large household means so many servants. So that was the greatest of the people of the east. Now, take note of 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels. So 7K, 3K, 500, 500, okay? 7,000, 3,500, 500. You take a note of that. Now, because this is a minister's conference, I don't need to explain to you what happened to Job. He lost everything. Children died. All the property was destroyed. And he had bad friends. <clears throat> but let's go to the end of the story. How does the story end? Job 42. Verse 12. Are you still alive? Now the Lord blessed. What's the word? The latter days of Job more than for he had what? 14,000 sheep. How many did he have in the beginning? In other words, when he says this was more blessed, it's because there was more multiplication of sheep. 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels instead of the 3,000 he had at the beginning. 1,000 yoke of oxen instead of 500. Everything now. And 1,000 female donkeys. Now, yeah, now, exactly. Here is what's interesting in the whole story. No, let's go to the next part. He also had... Remember all Job's sons and daughters had died. Now, apostle... Imagine with me that God comes and gives Job twice the number of oxen, twice the number of sheep, twice the number of camels, everything twice the wealth, but he has no children. It's just him and his wife. It, we, would you call that a blessing? Those of you who have given up the ministry to look, run after money, You threw away the calling because you are looking for money, resources that will find. That's why he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things shall follow you. You are following the things. I can tell you on very good authority that's a very poor choice. Someone in this room needs to stop looking for money. If you make disciples, money will look for you. I like to tell people that I have no needs. I actually don't. Yeah. If you come into my life, you realize I don't need anything. Yeah, I never wake up any day and make financial best decisions. Of all oh, this can't happen because of money. What I don't need anything. Thank you. Now, tomorrow, by the way, if you come, I'll tell you a little bit about how, how to multiply resources. <laughs> if you if you come. Yeah, I'll tell you. Because there is, there is, it's, these things are possible. Let's stop being beggars. There is so much resource. There's a lot of money. A lot. There is more money than you can use to build all your churches. You see, God showed me the other day. You see all these billionaires we talk about in Forbes, what, 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 and you put together the whole economy of the world, which is mostly built on debts, by the way, so there is little in there. You know what God showed me? It is not possible that the economy of heaven to which I'm plugged is smaller than the economy of the world. 
It's not possible. It's not possible. It's not possible. The heavenly economy is definitely several times richer than the earthly economy. That's why Solomon could sit there in Jerusalem and make money like stones. <laughs> Let me go back to my main point because... I'm starting to scratch things I shouldn't scratch at this point. So can you imagine Job ending up with twice the money and no children? You're there with, with Job's wife. What was her name? Did they give us a name? Yeah. Mrs. Job. So Mr. Job and Mrs. Job. They're there thinking, okay, what do we do with all these camels? Okay, today let's eat more meat. Let's it, it's insane. It's insane to think that people can decide that they are going to have resources and not disciples to use the resources. The whole point of God making you wealthy is your spiritual children. And by the way, if God knows that you're going to have spiritual children who will need resources, he will bring you the resources. If God needs that, knows that you, you just want, I don't know. Uh, I'm starting to preach badly. And even my time. Ah. So, you see, after all the money is doubled, what happens to Job? God, by his grace, restores his children. Look, next verse. I like the next verse. He called the name of the first. Je These are the daughters. The sons, they don't talk about them. They talk about the daughters. Jemima, the name of the second. Keziah, the name of the third. Karen Harpuch. In all the land, we have found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. Those only give inheritance to sons. I give you. What? This is how... Okay, I need to start winding up. One small disclaimer. The wife was the same. <clears throat> it was the same wife. Everything was restored... Through the same partnership. What a blessing. You see, the Bible is very clear. You cannot say the blessing is also now uh, making you transfer the wife to uh, increase the wifery. No. Same wife, twice the wealth, restored children. Let me go to the verse Pastor Isaac taught us. Genesis 18, 19. I want to show you something. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice and that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has. He says, I have... He says, so he says, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Considering he'll become a great nation. So that's the vision. That's the promise. You'll become... In fact, he didn't say you'll become a great nation. He says, nations, nations shall come out of you. Okay. And then he says, this is what, how it will go about. I have known him that he may command his children. That's your immediate disciples. And his household. That's your whole church. Okay. Now, give me NLT. Can I have some network leaders join me up here quickly? NLT. New Living Translation. I have singled him out so that he would direct his sons and their families. Their families. His sons and their families. 
don't stand so far as if there, there is a problem. Because there is not. These children and their families. The people you disciple, the people you call your children, do they have their families? You see, it's, it's, two, it's two levels. So, <laughs> was someone dozing and then their neighbor talked to them? Children, families, nation. Those are them. Yeah, children, families. Ah, what? I have permission to ask. This is no, 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 Pastor Bunny. Children, <laughs> families. Nations. You may not use the language of children in your church. Some people are, are very uncomfortable about that. Whatever you want to say. Say disciples or whatever it is. The thing is there must be multiplication. You are blessed to multiply. If you are not multiplying, you are not blessed. Hmm. The other day, God showed me a verse. Ah, can I show you the verse? The guys that side at the corner, they don't want to hear my verse. Look at the verse. No, no. Let me first show you another one, then I'll show you the other one. Is that okay? Look at Psalm 127. What does it say? Unless the Lord builds the house. In this case, when you see house, think about your ministry, church. Unless the Lord builds worship harvest, harvest family, Mavuno. Who builds? The Lord. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman says, I work in vain. The house is in the city for purposes of preservation. You are the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth. The only reason some of your places still function as civilized places is because of the presence of the church. Without the church, the, the government would not have enough manpower to, to maintain law and order. Yeah, governments like to sideline churches, but they know that without the institutions that convict people in their hearts, you cannot have enough people with guns to make people behave correctly. They don't have the budget. Yeah, civilization would collapse in an instant if you remove the Holy Spirit today. Yeah, they like to make it look like we are the ones who need them, but they are the ones who need us. Yeah. If we remove the Holy Spirit from earth right now, everything would collapse instantly. Yeah, because everyone would start trying to take their neighbor's things by force. And you would not have enough manpower to maintain law and order. So the city is preserved by the house. And the house is built by the Lord so that the house may preserve the city. You understand me? It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Pastor, the bread of sorrows that you think came with, together with the ministry is unnecessary. The only reason you're eating bread of sorrows is you don't have sons and daughters. So you're doing everything. You're building the house by yourself. You're trying to guard the city by yourself. I don't have enough time to give you the, uh, uh, the hermeneutical, exegetical, homiletical, The context, what I'm telling you, it's the, the, you know the Bible explains itself. Look at the context, because immediately it says in verse 3, Behold, children, I inherit from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is this word. What does that have anything to do with building a house and guarding the city? Apart from the fact that it's showing you that this is how the Lord builds the house, and this is how he guards the city through children that he gives you. 
And then it says in the next verse, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are children of one's youth. Those who started early are better off than those who are planning to start late. If you start making disciples in your youth, by the time you're a little bit older, you will have many sons and daughters arrows that you can send. That's why it says, through him we've received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Apostleship is the root word is the, 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 the what's the Greek word? Apostolos. And the Latin word is missio, from which you get mission, missionary and missile. It's the same thing. An arrow is a rudimentary missile. So you're seated next to a missile. When they arrive, there is impact. Also, missiles are only useful when they are sent. If they sit, they can explode inside and kill a lot of people. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them, not a few. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Do you know how God speaks to Satan? He says, I have my son there. Yeah, he's about to show you. Yeah, and then I have another one in this other city. And he expects us who are also his children to do the same. To say, I, I also have disciples. Do you know, can I tell you something? You only, in terms of operations on earth, you only have authority where you have disciples. Yeah, where you have no disciples, you have no authority. You only have authority where you have disciples. I can send out an instruction today and there's evangelism in many cities tomorrow because there are disciples there. Anywhere where we don't have disciples, there will be no evangelism. You can be sure about that. Now, let me show you the verse. The verse is Ephesians 1.18 in New Living Translation. And then maybe this people may say something. New Living Translation, please. Are you ready for this? Watch this. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called. His holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Who is this person they are talking about? Jesus. What is Jesus' inheritance? Uh, uh, I thought this conference is in English. What is Jesus' inheritance? His holy people. You are his inheritance. Who are his rich and glorious inheritance? Now, you, you are a joint heir with Christ. Yes, sir. Now, do you think that also the ones in China are also your glorious inheritance? body of Christ is Christ's inheritance. Yes, sir. Your joint inheritance with him is only the part that you have raised. But I've raised Vika, sir. Yes, Vika, you have some in the... And Muranga. Uh -huh. And Embu. And Daiso. Ah, Kampala. I, I don't know if you're tracking. You're joint heir with Christ. You're sure. What do you have? You don't air with Christ only to the... You see, we like to come up with these concepts and we use them in a way that doesn't work. So, okay, you are joint air with Christ. Okay, of what? What have you inherited? The, the planets. The stars. Uh, how are you ut utilizing them? You see, the, the point 
it is, where are your disciples? When you say, I'm a joint heir with Christ, where are your disciples? That's the only inheritance you really have. Otherwise, we are playing games. So these are Worship Harvest Network leaders. There are some of the people we disciple in couples. They all lead thousands of people. All of them. Now, let's do something. I just wanted to show you off. But let me just borrow a few of you. Now, let's say, if this is a network leader, okay. hmm? they have clusters. So this is a cluster leader. Step forward, cluster leader. This is a location pastor. This is a zonal pastor. This is a mission or community shepherd. This is a mission or community member. You want hard to lead also? They are, they are inside the MC. <laughs> Let's say this was the leaders of the ministry. Okay? I'm going to give you a hypothetical picture. What would happen if, because Pastor and I will lead together, what would happen if we had 12 network leaders? Are you seeing that? Who each had 12 clusters. Those would be how many clusters? 144. Who have 12 locations? How many locations would those be? 1,728. Who had each 12 zones? How many zones would those be? 20,000 and? 20,736 zones, eh? And each zone had 12 MCs. How many MCs would those be? 248,000. If each MC had 12 people, how many people would those be? 2.9 million. That means without adjusting our structure in worship harvest, right now we are at like 27,000, but we have potential for 2.9 million if each one only discipled 12. And what would happen if each one, if we stepped out of the way, can I borrow an extra person? And these ones who have been network leaders all become movement leaders. What would happen? 35 million. But let's say we went with a 2.9 million. You can always convert these into movement leaders. They are that close. Let's say they each started befriending people and they didn't think that they are Jesus. And we managed to help a thousand movement leaders each have 2.9 million. How many people would those be? 2.9 billion. And this room does not have only us. It has a thousand people that cannot start movements. So I think Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, scratches his head, scratches his beard, and wonders, what are these guys doing? They are so busy. They are running around. They are all over the place, but they are not making progress. What are you busy with? Where are your 12 disciples? Who can multiply? Stop being busy and start being fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. May God bless you. You can go and sit down. Have you understood? What I've just told you is not a reserve 
a pre is it reserved? Preserve. It's not a preserve for a few anointed people. Anyone can invest in 12 people. You don't have to be able to speak to thousands like this. Anyone can invest in 12 people. Anyone. Who cares about the mission of Jesus can invest in 12 people. And can ask those 12 people, where are your 12 people? And the other ones should be asking, where are your 12 people? And the other ones should be asking, where are your 12 people? Hmm. By the way, since Kev the Reverend Pasajina Kami, you come anyway. L let me show you something else. Remember, I told you I'm going to take an offering, so don't be in a hurry. Come. Come, that will be. And let me have two more people come. Two quick footed people. As you're standing, if you, ca you can stand, it's good for you. Sitting is not good for your health. Even when you are at work, always take standing breaks and walking breaks. If you sit the whole time, your, your body will start malfunctioning and you spend a lot of money on medical bills, which I don't want you to do. Let's say you were a pastor of one church. Huh? You've done everything. You've put loudspeakers in your window. The neighbors are just annoyed. They are not coming. You've done I don't know what campaign. Where, where nothing is working. Your name is bigger than your church. There are some men of God whose names are bigger than their churches. You hear the, the name and the title and you're like, I must go there. And then you reach, you're looking for the church. You're like, where is this church? Like, no, 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 no. You, there, there was a little tent you passed there. there that's... Let me save you from, in Texas, they say big heart, no cattle. Big heart, no cut. Let me save you from the pseudo ministry of you have activity, lots of programs, incredibly busy people, no people. If you just disciple 12 zono pastors, and those 12 disciples, zono pastors, each just disciple 12 mission or community leaders. Who each just disciple 12 people in their MCs. By the way, an MC should have at least 20 people. But we are going for average here. There are those which started recently, they have three and a half, and then there are those with 30. Just these people would be 1,728. These would be 144. If you add them to this, is what number? 1,801. Whatever. Never mind this little. You see that just your one church. Let's say you are so big-headed, we have talked our heads off. You still don't want to plant churches. You want to be a big man. Okay. I just go and be a big man. By multiplying only four generations, like Second Timothy 2.2. Two. The things you've heard from me, among many witnesses, commit those to faithful people who will be able to teach others. At least have 1,800 people in your church. At least. Do us a favor that when you're failing, at least fail at, the, at that level. Because I think it's a failure to have one church. But at least be a respectable failure. Bring some dignity to failure by having <laughs> by having 1,800 people in your church. There, on Sunday, you, you come one eight. Yeah, two services, 900, 900. Yeah, by having only three generations. You don't want to plant in other places. You, all, you want to see them every Sunday. You want to see eyeballs. Okay, have 1,800 by discipling some people who should disciple some people who should disciple some people and you can still see them. Then one day in future, maybe you'll repent and start planting churches. So you go into the tens of thousands. But at least for now, do me a favor. Stop speaking to a crowd and go make disciples. Who make disciples? Who make disciples? Have you understood? Hardly the right message to preach when you are going to take an offering because now some people are annoyed. 
But please, we are going to give you an opportunity. Can you put up our giving details? How are we checking the offering? Do you have bags, baskets? Are people? We have bags. Okay, there are ushers with bags. Let's just pray. Thank you, Father, for whatever we are giving to, to be a blessing. Thank you that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And you have blessed us immensely through proclaim. May whatever is being spoken here become a reality in our ministries, in our lives. May we go and become hero makers and multiply so many disciples, groups, churches, networks, and movements to the degree that your name will be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. Over to our hosts. Wow, I know you're busy giving, but can we just appreciate up more for that uh, sweet teaching? And maybe you can have your seats even as you respond. I think the numbers are going to remain up. It's been an amazing teaching throughout the entire day. I believe even in the morning when you said that it's gonna, it was going to be amazing, even I didn't have an idea of how it was going to be. It's true, been taught so well by Pastor Isaac. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Uh, we've had different interviews. We've had different teachings. What has been your takeout for today? Uh, I know it's like it's, it's, a lo- it's enough. But I what's one it's... thing you picked up and said, this one, I I'm dying with this one. I must go and make disciples. Come on. Come that is on. it. I must make disciples. Mm. That's it, by the way. I don't. I can't add because I'm a little overwhelmed by Apple's message. I just know what to do. Wow. That's exactly what I'm going to do. If you're failing, fail with 1,800. Yeah. Fail <laughs> with dignity. <laughs> fail. Make failing wow. look dignified. Oh yes. Wow. Wow. Yeah. How about you? What was your biggest takeout? I think uh, the, that message on that message on making disciples ties very well with hero maker yes because if each generation chooses to be a hero maker yeah then you know each generation is getting uh, uh bolder each generation is getting more multiplied we are feeling the earth literally and so i really love that one i uh, thank you so much but there is content for us and all this content is going to be online so don't you know at some point you can leave it at the level of inspiration mm-hmm. you can leave it at the level of wow so what you do now go and watch with your disciples and say Absolutely. as for me I'm, be, I'm multiplying us to 12 yep. and then now continue with that with that figure start there watch with, the, with your disciples discuss with your disciples choose to do something otherwise it will be inspiration then next year will come and guess what we'll still be wowed oh, but you yes. don't want wow effect we want to be able to move forward we want to be able to do something remember the vision is a thousand movements each with a thousand churches each with at least a thousand disciples Yep. In fact, why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, I see in you a hero maker. Oh, yes. I see in In you you a hero hero maker. maker. Look at the other disciple and say, I see you need lunch. (laughs) (laughs) That is so true. (laughs) That's so true. Kev, the Rev, it's been an amazing day. We're now ready to go for lunch. But before we do that, we just want to appreciate our sponsors one more time. Come on. In fact, now you're all sponsors having given oh, yes. during the offertory moment. So we appreciate all of you. Thank you so much for giving. One particular sponsor stands out because they have now sent gifts mm. to our speakers. That is UAP. They have sent individual gifts to our speakers. We must appreciate them. Sandra Suvi is leading us in doing the right thing. Oh, yes. There's a picture there for the gifts that they've sent the speakers. Thank you so much. Uh, UAP is a platinum sponsor to this proclaimed gathering. Wow, UAP, if your representative is here, I just want you to know that I personally love you. <laughs> I personally think you're such a big organization. And I mean, you know, I personally one day speak, you know, regularly to my disciples as well. So You've I'm a been speaker speaking there. The gathering, I'm just, right? oh. <laughs> you need yours. <laughs> Anyway, thank you so much to all our sponsors. Yes. And at the end of this, uh, you know, space over here, kindly let's go to the back, interact with different people who've been able to sponsor this. Get to connect with them, get to buy from them, get to pick up a card with the intent of being able to do something. And when we step out kindly, pick up your belongings from your seats. Don't leave yes. something uh, on your seat. Don't leave your property on the seats. We are all at different levels of sanctification. And so, you know, <laughs> he who has ears, let him hear. Uh, uh, so that you know, don't leave stuff uh, on your seat that you're not willing to lose. So, 
Um, yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Kev the Rev. <laughs> Different levels of sanctification. Anyway, after the lunch break, now we're going to give you what time the lunch break will end, but we need to call your attention to the breakout sessions. Come on. They are a core part of this gathering, that conversations that you've been hearing here on the stage extend into those breakout sessions. So we're going to just project us. The, uh, the picture of where the breakout sessions are, who the speakers are, and um, the different breakout sessions on the screen. That screen will remain through the break, but I'm quickly going to read them out so that there's no confusion about this. I might have to use the screen. So Pastor Chris Kawesa is going to be in Tower 2. Now, Tower 2 is the old tower, the school, and he'll be on the...